Can you hear me, Rhonda? I can hear you and see you. Good morning, Rob. Would you like to do a mic check? I wonder why mine's on. Rhonda, can you give me a mic check? I can hear you loud and clear, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Great. Good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me? It's Rob Coelho. I sure can hear you. It appears your camera is on, but likely your laptop is closed. Because I have a face made for radio. Hey, we like seeing your smiling face. Good morning, Christine. Would you like to do a mic check? Hello. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Nice to see you this morning, Rob. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning. Good morning, Monero. Would you like to do a mic check? Good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me all right? I sure can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Sherry. Would you like to do a mic check? Good morning. I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. So much.
Good morning, Bob and Daniel. Would you guys like to do a mic check? Good morning, Rhonda. I can hear you loud and clear, Bob. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, Daniel. I also hear you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Cindy. I wanted to just give us a little bit of a time check. Our meeting begins in a couple of minutes, and I wanted to remind those that were listening, if they wanted to speak under public comment, this would be the time to start raising their hands. We'll begin with the roll call, the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll do an invocation, and then we'll go to public comment. Um, and then our consent calendar, and then actually um, our adjournments. I may, I'm gonna do our adjournments right after our invocation and before public comment. I think that's normally the way we do it, am I right? Yes, ma'am, you're right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're gonna do that. Um, we'll do item, we're gonna do one, two, three, six, yep. then four and seven. Thanks for that catch, Mike. Yep, you get five in there somewhere. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, one, two, three, six, four, five. Perfect. Yes. I guess six and seven actually go together. Yeah. I don't think, I'll ask my colleagues. Um, If there are any comments on that, but you're right, we'll keep seven in order. So again, we're gonna begin our meeting uh, now. If you would like to speak on public comment, this would be the time to uh, raise your hands. And I'd like to call our meeting to order. And um, we're gonna begin with a roll call. I'm gonna just see if uh, we, have, we have Joe and do we have Dave? Supervisor Ellenberg. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Present. Supervisor Cortezi. Vice President Wasserman. Here. President Chavez. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we're now gonna ask Mike to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you're able. And that's the wind, President Chavez. Thank you. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for the effects there, Mike. Um, we're now gonna go to our invocation. And um, for that, I was Um, we're going to begin with inviting Alex Garcia, and I don't know if I see Alex there yet. If I could ask staff to find Alex. Uh, I'm here. Great. Oh, wonderful, Alex. So um, providing our invocation today is Alex Garcia. He is a scholar athlete from downtown college prep, Alum Rock High School. In the fall, Alex will be going to UC Berkeley to study mechanical engineering. He's been involved in many extracurricular activities, the basketball team, captain, 
STEM club president, baseball and golf. He also earned the Eagle Scout rank, which is the highest rank in Boy Scouts. Alex notes that this achievement taught him the meaning of hard work and leadership, and he hopes to exemplify those values throughout his life. After Berkeley, Alex hopes to work as an engineer in the electrical automotive industry to further, help further advances in technology and reduce carbon emissions. He also plans to pursue a graduate degree in engineering management so he can combine the skills he's learned in his extracurricular activities with his love for STEM and put those to work um, in an engineering firm. We're excited about all the amazing things you've already accomplished, Alex. It's an honor to have you. Uh, thank you for having me, Supervisor Chavez and the rest of the Board of Supervisors. Um, let me begin just to preface my speech a bit. My school usually brings over the eighth graders from the middle school, and uh, we would have this all school ceremony where the seniors declare what they're going to do after high school. And this year, that ceremony uh, unfortunately had to be on Zoom, but the school asked me to give a speech, and I thought that I truly had to write something that would be uplifting. So uh, here's the speech that I gave. Good morning. In less than six weeks, we will be graduating and moving on to the next stepping stone in our lives. This assembly represents launching our lives past this series of unfortunate events and into the future. Assembly, that word should have new meaning for all of us today. We can't really take anything for granted anymore because you never know when things will be gone. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We, can, we have to be united in our common interests. And in whatever we go on to do, be it a four-year, a two-year, or a vocational school, we must always stand together. We have built a community here at DCP, and we continue to fight through the tough times. We are fighting for our right to go to college and to get educated. Today will no longer be known as the 8th of May, but the day when the class of 2020 when he declared what they are going to do with the rest of their lives. And in the words of Bill Pullman, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We are going to live on. We are going to thrive because today we celebrate our decision day. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Alex. <laughs> You're getting a, a, a round of applause and we wish you all good things and we're really proud of your accomplishments. Thank you for joining us. Well, that Thank is a good much. way to start. <laughs> That's a great way to start our day. Um, we're now going to move on to adjournments. And um, I, th I see that um, I'm going to ask Supervisor Simidian has an adjournment. I'll do mine, um, mine first, but I uh, wanted to let him know we'll be coming to him next. So we've moved to item six. Um, so I would like to ask my colleagues to adjourn today in honor of Carmen uh, Ceron, who we lost on April 9th, 2020. As a young teen, over 60 years ago, Carmen moved from her hometown of Soledad, California to San Jose. She was the beloved aunt of one of our own county team, Carla Collins. She, along with Carmen's daughter, Karen, Carmen's grandsons and great nephews and nieces, extended family and friends are listening in. And I wanna tell them how sorry we am, are for their loss and how we're honored to get to celebrate her memory. Carmen built a beautiful life in the heart of District 2. She was many things, a proud Willow Glen Ram, a beautician for decades, a union steward at Safeway before she retired. In addition, she was a devoted mother, sister, grandmother, aunt, and a friend to all. According to her family, Carmen was glittery, sparkly, and magical in an, in an often drab world. She loved to laugh, to cook, and to celebrate her, her family's members' milestones, children's performances, graduations, achievements, like it was always Christmas. She was a master gardener. She was an expert seamstress who made her own prom dress. She would spend hours sewing patches on her great niece's Girl Scout vests and embroidering intricate and unique de designs onto any material, mostly dish towels that became prized holiday and birthday gifts. There was truly nothing she saw that she could not make better by bedazzling it. When her sister and brother-in-law became ill, Carmen helped care for them. She spent the last 18 months caring for her nieces and nephew, picking them up from school, making them dinner, reading to them in Spanish, 
and learning from them how to Snapchat. Carmen became ill in the first weeks of the sheltering in place order. And on April 9th, she was the county's 47th COVID-19 related death. Her family is truly heartbroken to have lost such a force of life. The family asked that I convey this note to the Board of Supervisors. We thank the Board of Supervisors for remembering our Tia Carmen. She was so much more than a pandemic statistic and we hope with all of our amazing memories of her will bring relief to all of our grief. In closing, I wanted to thank you, Carla, and your family for allowing us to recognize Carmen, your Thea. With that, I'll turn to Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, um, Madam President. Thank you, all board members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to ask our board to adjourn today's meeting as well in memory of Susan Chow Kwok. Um, Susan, for those of you who did not know her, was a, a longtime nurse, a community volunteer, um, a faith-filled person, and a loving family member uh, to a, uh, a big and uh, loving family. Uh, Susan passed away April 28th at the age of 76, but uh, after a life that was truly um, <clears throat> uh, just as full as full can be. Uh, she, uh, she was born in Macau, 1943, um, and uh, married her husband, Patrick Kwok, uh, back in 1965 when she was in nursing school. Uh, if I told you that she had spent 40 years in uh, nursing, by the time she retired in 2014, you would know that she uh, had lived a uh, full and giving life but she also uh, volunteered uh, seemingly 24-7 uh, with uh, self-help for the elderly, ACI, uh, Friends at Asian Americans for Community Involvement, uh, Kaiser Permanente, the Cupertino Health and Wellness Center. Um, she made countless friends in her volunteer work, wrote letters for uh, folks who were patients who uh, had families who couldn't visit. Uh, as I mentioned, she was uh, devout in her faith uh, and um, uh, active with the St. Joseph of Cupertino Parish for uh, also close to 40 years. She'd bring uh, communion to patients in uh, retirement homes and at Kaiser. Um, and, and just a remarkably giving person, but more than that, just someone who uh, thought her life should be filled with what she considered self-improvement. So. Uh, with all that going on, she uh, wanted to challenge herself by learning to play golf, uh, learning to play the piano, learning to swim. Uh, she spoke English, Cantonese, and Mandarin and thought, you know what, I should learn to speak Spanish. So she, she went ahead and did that too. Uh, managed to travel all over the world, uh, China, Japan, South Africa, Egypt, Italy, Turkey, Russia. Um, and... Uh, Proud of the fact that she had climbed China's Yellow and Jade Mountains, the Great Wall, Machu Picchu, just um, someone who savored every moment of her life and made good use of it uh, to our lasting benefit. Uh, her family uh, tells us that she will uh, have her final bucket list destinations uh, fulfilled, uh, Scotland and Ireland, uh, by a family visit in her memory and honor. Uh, we send our sympathies and our condolences, but mostly we say thank you uh, for all that she gave to so many over such a long period of time. Uh, Susan Kwok was truly goodness personified, and I am honored that we can adjourn in her memory today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Joe. That was beautiful. And to um, the family of both Carmen and Susan, our thoughts and our hearts go out to you. And thank you for letting us share their memories today. We're now gonna move on to public comment. And this um, item, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna ask everybody who would like to speak on public comment to raise their hands uh, now. And um, what I'm gonna do is just give it a minute more. Mike, did you have a comment? I, I did, Madam President. Did you wish to do commendations after public comment or did we not have any? Uh, we do have commendations. They're okay. all on our consent calendar. I was going to mention some of them as 
uh, right after we did consent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for catching that. I'm gonna just give a couple more minutes as people um, sign up for public comment. And um, I'm going to close public comment in just a minute. So I wanna give folks another few seconds to join us. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the clerk to give each person one minute. And the reason is I, I'm going to cap the number of speakers at 15. I, I see that we're toggling back and forth right now. Um, so if we could go ahead and I'll ask the clerk to begin um, public comment. And I'll remind our speakers that this is to speak to an item that is not on the agenda today, but within the purview of our committee. I know the meetings can be rather long, so we're being flexible about that as well as um, the time. So I'm gonna ask, um, everybody will get one minute and we'll begin now. Our first speaker on public comment is Justin Mates. Uh, one moment, please. Um, sorry, Madam President, we're having a technical issue. Give me just one moment, please. No problem. Uh, Victor, on this one, if you sorry, Madam President, one moment, we're almost there. We're fixing a Zoom issue, Madam President. Just one moment, please. My apologies. No problem. I mean, one, one thing I could do while you're doing that is go to our commendations and proclamations. Yes, if you could, I apologize for that. No problem. Um, for my colleagues, what I, what I wanted to do is that this is item seven. And um, normally this is a time where we give out commendations. Um, and we since we're not doing that right now, what I thought I would do is just read into the record the main commendations that we had before us. Um, and so let me just go ahead and begin with that. Um, first of all, the um, it's emergency medical week between May 17th and May uh, 23rd. The members of our emergency medical services team are ready to provide life-saving care to those who need it 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And this year on the occasion of the 46th Annual Emergency Medical Services Week, I would like to recognize these heroes on behalf of my colleagues who are putting their li lives on the line every day to maintain our safety. May is also CalFresh Awareness Month and the CalFresh program, which has become so critical to so many in our communities, this program reduces hunger and food insecurity. Almost 80,000 families and individuals in Santa Clara County receive CalFresh food benefits, 80,000. And as a result of the COVID-19 pa pandemic, CalFresh applications have increased significantly in a very short period of time. The number of applicants has more than doubled from 900 applications per week in the first week of the shelter in place order to almost 2000 applications per week by mid April. We want to thank the staff that's really investing the time to process these um, applications so that members of our community have access to fresh, healthy food. 
Older Americans Month is also in May. Since 1963, Older Americans Month has been a time to celebrate older Americans, their stories and their contributions to our community. During the COVID-19 pandemic, older adults have stepped up to help the community with healthcare professionals coming out of retirement to care for others and many volunteering their time serving food, working in essential industries and virtually connecting with family, friends and neighbors. In addition, we have a special announcement. The Santa Clara County Seniors Agenda and American Association of Retired Peoples would like to announce the county joining the National Livable Communities Network during the month of May for Older Americans Month. Would any of my colleagues like to make comments on any of these proclamations? Uh, seeing none, I will go back to the clerk and see how we're doing. We are ready. Thank you, Madam President. My apologies for that. No problem. Okay, All our right. first speaker for public comment is Justin Mates. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning, President Chavez, honorable board members, Mr. Smith and Mr. Williams. My name is Justin Mates and I'm a deputy county manager with the County of San Mateo. I'm speaking today on item 39 regarding your consideration of recreation projects in San Mateo County for potential funding from the Stanford Recreation Mitigation Fund. Our county manager, Michael Calgi, sends his regrets for not being able to be here himself today as our board of supervisors is also meeting right now. But on behalf of Mr. Calgi, San Mateo County and our local public agencies, I would like to thank you for your consideration of these projects. Our region is more interconnected than ever, and we know that large development projects can have substantial regional impacts that do not respect jurisdictional lines. Recent experience, however, has demonstrated that through cooperation, the County of Santa Clara and the County of San Mateo can ensure that project proponents on either side of the county line consider and account for all the significant impacts they have in our re region and respective communities. Your board's consideration of our projects for Stanford Recreation Mitigation Funding underscores your commitment to this cooperation. And we would particularly like to thank Supervisor Simidian, whose leadership has been instrumental in facilitating this new standard of partnership among our jurisdictions. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Scott Largen, still still getting used to this uh, these uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, keeping my fingers crossed today um, that comment on any items that the public wants to chime in on, depending upon how many people are on the uh, slab, um, we'll get the appropriate time to talk. I, I don't think it's fair now to talk of items together, three or four agenda items, allowing the public a minimal amount of time is just unacceptable. Um, we have a lot of other committees right now that could also be running off of the uh, Zoom platform right now. Why is that not being done? We're in Silicon Valley. Um, you, you guys need to get up to speed like fast. It's not just the supervisor meeting. It's not just the Justice and Public Committee. You know, we have the reentry network. Um, we also have health and hospitals meetings that need to be more out to the public. I, I'm just very concerned that this is just backdoor politics now and people just don't really know what's going on. And uh, we finally got tables out in, in front of the supervisor chambers right now. That was a battle of law enforcement. Sad. Our next speaker is Charlotte Quinn. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm asking the uh, County Board of Supervisors to enact a rent moratorium. It's otherwise referred to as canceling rent, which is different from the eviction moratorium. It's that people don't have to be paying rent or back rent during this pandemic when so many people are unable to work or make money. Rent relief is just landlord relief and there's not enough to go around to keep, keep people housed. Many businesses are taking financial hits right now and why are landlords allowed to pass their businesses risk onto people and put them in the street? The county can't guarantee that a business is profitable. It can guarantee more people living in the streets and in vehicles. Cancellation through rent through a rent moratorium is not put in place. Through the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, COVID-19 rent suspension can be enacted under emergency and police powers. It's a valid and legal emergency price control. This County Board of Supervisors has a moral obligation to protect its citizens. With a rent moratorium, the county can also have an opportunity to be a shining example of how to properly fight this 
crisis and emerge strong. And Santa Clara County needs to cancel rent right now. Our next speaker is Sandy Perry. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Sandy Perry from Affordable Housing Network and Cham Deliverance Ministry. Thank you for your uh, moratorium that you enacted in March, but we all knew it was a temporary fix, which kicked the can down the road until landlords demanded back rent. We're already in a state of a homelessness emergency before COVID-19. We can't afford to add tens of thousands more people um, uh, to the homelessness count. Um, during the uh, pandemic, uh, we already took great efforts to add shelter beds and hotel rooms. Uh, we, uh, are, we haven't even been able to fill them halfway yet. Uh, we're leaving thousands of homeless people outside. 2,500 of them have already been identified as at risk if they contract COVID-19. It's a humanitarian and public health disaster, especially if a second wave of the pandemic emerges in October, November. I urge the board to take action to cancel rents. One thing you can do immediately is to take a position on HR 6515, Congresswoman Elon Omar's bill to cancel rents and mortgages. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Catherine Hedges, and um, I basically came here to say everything Sandy Perry just did. Uh, we already have a homelessness crisis. There were around 10,000 unhoused people. The county has been declaring victory against homelessness by putting less than 5% of them in shelter and in the hotel rooms paid for under operation room key. And we need to get everyone else off the streets. There, you know, any place you go that they're uh, providing food to the homeless, they're unhoused people asking how do they get inside, how do they keep from getting the virus. They're scared, they're worried, they can't get help. And we must cancel rent or we'll be having millions, well, there's only millions in the county, thousands, tens of thousands of people unhoused when the rent comes due and they had no way to save up. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a phone call in from a number ending in 4111. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Patrick Chafee. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Clara. The current protections for renters in the county are not adequate to the demands of this crisis. Many across the county are unable to work because of the ongoing public health crisis and the necessary shelter in place order, particularly service workers across the county. With the drastically reduced income, uh, these people are having to choose between putting rent, uh, putting food on the table and paying rent or other bills. The current rent and moratorium is just accruing debt. They're gonna have to pay all of this back rent whenever this crisis ends. And without any income, how are they gonna be able to do that? How is it fair that you expect this to happen? I urge you to cancel all the rent for this crisis period. Uh, you have the power as Board of Supervisors to do that. Please cancel the rent. Our next speaker is Shelly McCurdy. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Shelly McCurdy. I am a labor and delivery nurse over at Regional Medical Center of San Jose. I am here to voice my concerns regarding the closure of women's services at Regional Medical Center, the only hospital on the east side of San Jose. No communication with the community from the hospital has been done regarding the closure of this women's services. We're going to have families, moms with their unborn babies showing up to the ER expecting to get obstetric care. I'm concerned for the safety of these mothers and their unborn babies arriving to the hospital and expecting to get competent medical care that they will not receive. 
Time is essential. Time and delivery of care is so essential for the well being of these moms and babies. Regional saying that they're going to transfer stable moms. They're not going to have the time to transfer. They're not going to stable. They won't have the competent care to stabilize these patients. I'm asking you to please use your authority to reverse the closure of women's services at Regional Medical Center. Our next speaker is Annie Koruga. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. <clears throat> and support a rent moratorium. Many workers cannot earn an income from home. It is not fair to expect them to pay rent in the middle of a shelter in place. Where do they get the money to pay the rent? Doesn't make sense. Pandemic or not though, we're in the middle of a housing crisis. It's a crisis of housing affordability and many are already severely rent burdened. Housing is a human right. This crisis also makes it obvious that it is a public health necessity. If anyone becomes homeless during this crisis, it will hurt all of us. You, if you support the community members as you claim to and as you honor at these meetings, you will protect community members. You represent us. You do not represent investment properties. Again, I urge you to protect us, protect the community, protect this community that you were elected to represent and that you claim to represent and support a rent moratorium. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerome Shaw. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, hello. Um, I'm really having a, a hard time understanding um, this COVID hotline um, that's set up by Santa Clara County um, because it's an emergency hotline. But um, last week I, I encountered, you know, um, some trouble with the hotline when I tried to find um, a shelter for my friend who had was no longer allowed in the Sunnyvale shelter. Um, I called this COVID hotline um, maybe at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. Um, didn't get a real response back until three o'clock that afternoon saying that there were no shelter beds available. Um, and I couldn't understand why. Um, my friend finally got into a shelter yesterday because I went out, you know, continuously looking for him to find a place for them instead of, you know, um, representatives from the county going out and searching for people that need shelter. It's like my friend had no no phone, no way to be contacted, and I had to go out and physically search for him, which what the county workers should actually be doing themselves, going out and physically searching for people that need shelter. Our next speaker is Daniel. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, hi, my name is Daniel, and I am a painter, and I, I don't have work right now. Uh, I don't have insurance because I can pay my insurance. Uh, I have a lot of bills to pay. Uh, I don't have a money for paying my rent next month. I'm looking for, for work, but the company say they are not hiring now because for the pandemic. Uh, and you know, it's a lot of, it's no any help for undocumented people. Uh, and and I'm, I wanna work, but it's no, it's no work because they are not hiding now and I don't wanna get infected. So uh, I hope you can sell the rent or, and the montage payment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peggy Durantz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Peggy DeRunce. I work at Regional Medical Center and have been a labor and delivery nurse for 35 years. Regional Medical Center is the only hospital for the entire east side of San Jose, but HCA Health Care Organization wants to shut down all women's services. I am concerned that when regional closes the labor and delivery and NICU units, women will not be triaged appropriately or in a timely manner. Of the 700 to 900 maternal deaths in America each year, the CDC estimates 60% are preventable. While our ED nurses are excellent in their roles, they do not have the specialized training to monitor pregnant patients. And a majority of women and families who live in this community are working class and lower income 
they can't get to some of the other hospitals. The patients will still come here, especially if there's concerns such as the baby is not moving, their bag of water is broken, there could be a cord prolapse, bleeding, symptoms of preeclampsia, just for some examples. This community deserves to have optimal care with nurses and staff who have these skills and training. Please help us maintain this facility. Our next speaker is Alexander Brown. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. I'd like to echo the sentiments of my friends, neighbors, and fellow speakers in urging you to embrace your responsibility and employ your police powers to cancel rent. There are thousands struggling with the burden of rent right now, and you have not only the power, but the moral responsibility to protect tenants and prevent dislocation by enacting rent cancellation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Gonzalez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I am calling to urge uh, the county to explore rent cancellation. Um, I think you all know very well that there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of unemployed uh, people in, at this moment, millions nationwide who are unable to earn income, um, who are not protected. Uh, after the you know the eviction moratoriums are lifted, uh, what we're looking at is a lot of people who are taking on work to sustain themselves when they should be sheltering in place uh, to avoid spreading COVID-19. We're putting people at risk of infection, and we're uh, you know we're setting ourselves up for a eviction crisis after the pandemic if we don't do something. So please cancel rent do what you need to do uh, to, to look after our most vulnerable people. Our final speaker on public comment is Elias Madrid. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Elias Madrid. Can you hear me? Hi, this is Elias Madrid. Uh, the reason I'm talking, it seems like uh, a lot of people are really concerned about rent. Um, the Board of Supervisors does have the power to control the rent, but as I believe, when you get an eviction on it, that's a civil matter now. Civil matter courts are not even, they're, they're closed until maybe until August. I think that would uh, that relieve a lot of people to know. By the time they go to court on that matter, we should be back working. We're keeping our fingers closed. Thank you for hearing me out. That's all I have to say in this matter. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our, our public speakers for joining us. We're now gonna move to our consent calendar. And what I'm gonna ask is if the clerk could begin um, reading the consent calendar, then I'm gonna turn to Dr. Smith to see if he has any changes. And then I'm gonna start with uh, Dave and see if there are any comments or changes. I recognize this is a clunkiest part of our meeting today. So we'll, we're gonna just take our time and make sure we get through it very very uh, clearly as best we can. We have a request from administration to continue item number eight to June 2, 2020. Item number eight is a hearing to consider resolution approving the proposed issuance by the Santa Clara County Financing Authority of not to exceed $34 million aggregate principal amount of lease revenue bonds, fire district facilities, 2020 Series A. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 9 and 10 to June 2, 2020. Item number 9 is to adopt a resolution of the governing board of the Santa Clara County Financing Authority authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $34 million aggregate principal amount of Santa Clara County Financing Authority lease revenue bonds. Item number 10 is to adopt a resolution of the Board of Directors of Santa Clara County, Santa Clara Central Fire Protection District, authorizing the issuance and sale of a Santa Clara County Financing Authority lease revenue bonds. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to consider item numbers 14 and 15 concurrently. Item number 14 is to approve a request for appropriation modification number 202 $55,250,000 increasing revenue and expenditures in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospitals and Clinics budget relating to emergency response funding for COVID-19. 
Item number 15 is to approve a request for appropriation modification number 218, $175,999,960, increasing revenue and expenditures in the controller treasurer department budget for COVID-19 relating to COVID-19 reimbursable costs and intergovernmental revenue. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to add item numbers 20, 21, and 22 to the consent calendar. Item number 20 is to receive a report relating to the status of the June 23, 2019 notice of violation issued to Lehigh Permanente Quarry. Item number 21 is to consider recommendations relating to skilled nursing facilities, institutions for mental disease, and mental health rehabilitation centers contract providers. Item number 22 is to approve a contract change order number two, emergency job order contract for COVID-19, JOC COVID-19, contractor S Bay Construction Inc. with no change in contract costs and no change in contract time. We have a request from administration to hold item number 40 to June 2, 2020. Item number 40 is to receive a report relating to completion of an assessment on the transportation needs of clients in accessing county services. We have a request from Supervisor Submitian to remove item numbers 41 and 48 from the consent calendar. Item number 41 is to consider recommendations relating to Assembly Bill 3005 regarding the Anderson Leroy Dam and Reservoir. Item number 48 is to consider recommendations relating to an agreement with NetSmart Technologies, Inc. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you very much. I'll begin with Supervisor Cortese. Um, yes, um, President Chavez, I need to recuse on item 37 on consent, which is uh, uh, the item that relates to amendments and agreements for health, dental, and vision insurance plans. And that is because of a financial um, uh, agreement that I have with Delta Dental regarding a real estate lease. So I'm recusing to avoid um, financial conflict of interest. Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg. I have no additional changes or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to ask that uh, item 20 which had been identified as a possibility for our consent calendar remain in its regular place on the agenda. This is the Lehigh Permanente Quarry item. I do think it would be helpful to have some additional discussion there before we take action. Uh, and on item 36, uh, which deals with the issue of smart pass transit passes, uh, I will be an I vote on this item as it remains on the consent calendar. But I want to mention yet again uh, after seven plus years of conversation, the inability to make progress on um, working with the folks on, at Caltrain to see if we can't put together some kind of similar uh, cooperative arrangement. And, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, how to deal with these uh, transportation, transit, and environmental issues. We've talked about how to be an employer of choice. And if we are not making these transportation options available for people who might come to uh, the center of the county, either from South Santa Clara County or from North Santa Clara County or even South San Mateo County, we are missing an opportunity to attract and retain top flight talent uh, by virtue of this. So um, uh, I, I will be an I vote, but uh, I did not want to let anyone think for a moment that the issue of Caltrain had uh, somehow slipped off our radar. Okay, thank you so much. Those were my only two items. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, agree with the consent calendar and the amendment on number 20 from Supervisor Submitian and uh, happy to make a motion when that's appropriate. Thank you. Um, Dr. Smith, did you have any additional changes? I have a few, but I wanted to see if you had any before I spoke. No, we, we do not have any additional changes. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear item 71, and this is uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's referral on contact tracing. I'd like to hear it after item 13. 
um, I fully expect to support it, but I wanted to make sure that we had put some, um, that we understood from the staff, the process they were actually gonna be using for contact tracing. So it would be heard 13 to, and then 71. And then item 35, this is a contract with Alibaba. I'd like to um, pull that off consent for a couple of questions. And item 29, this is the IHSS BHP insurance um, uh, item. And my concern here is that we may be disallow or kicking people off of their BHP insurance not because they can't meet the hours and they're not meeting the hours because of COVID-19. So I um, would like to just let staff know I'm going to pull that off. But the answer to the question I'm looking for is whether or not we are uh, maintaining the current mechanism for determining benefits or whether or not we've restructured it in order to not uh, penalize people who have been impacted by COVID-19. So we'll pull all um, three of the uh, 29 and 35 will come at the end of our agenda. 71 would come after 13. The other thing I'd like to add is on item 60, this is the Agricultural Resilience Incentive Grant Program. And I'd like staff to provide feedback to the full board with the results of the pilot, including the amount of carbon sequestration achieved, an analysis of the effectiveness of this type of program and any recommendations the staff has for next steps. Item 22, this is um, the South Bay construction change order. I too would like to leave it on consent, but I'm asking staff to determine whether or not this location um, would make sense for us to add um, cellular towers or cellular functions. And this is relative to another issue that's on the agenda, but more just a report back as to on new construction sites or sites where we're doing significant construction, whether or not we would also be looking at more cellular um, uh, facilities, particularly because some of these areas are in places that are dead zones for current cellular um, activity. And I'm interested in understanding whether or not there's a way we can in embed this in our current construction programming so that we're at least doing an assessment as to whether or not there would be value for such towers. So with that, may I get a motion for consent? Madam so, President, we have speakers on this item. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our public speakers and then to um, action. Thank you, Brett, for catching that. Madam Speak President, we have two speakers on this item. Our first speaker is uh, pardon me, it's three speakers. Our first speaker is LGK40. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, they're not responding. We'll move on to our next speaker. The next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, the item that uh, that I'm speaking about on the uh, consent calendar, um, item number 46, in regards to the Office of Supportive Housing. Um, Time-wise of being able to speak about these items, I mean, I probably shouldn't just jump back and forth on this whole gig. Um, we got to start allowing people the proper amount of time. Um, a minute doesn't cut it. And if there's two or three people on here right now, there's no reason why we cannot have two minutes to properly explain something, talk about problems and issues we're having on the consent calendar. Um, it should be the same way with the, uh, the uh, county executive and the county council's report. Both of those items should not be tacoed together on the consent calendar, allowing the public even less time to criticize people. Uh, this goes, for instance, right, right to Jeff Smith, right to James the Devil Williams. Those are big agencies through our county that we should be able to chime in, criticize, and um, you know, be able to speak up, which we are not. We're going to try LGK40 one more time. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. seems that person is uh, away. We'll go to our next speaker. Our final speaker on this item is Catherine Hedges. I am unmuting you. 
Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Um, I am extremely concerned that the Office of Supportive Housing is not doing an effective job. Um, as previous speakers mentioned, um, they're not, their, their outreach or the outreach provided by the contractors is not locating unhoused people. It would be very simple to go out to the programs that distribute food and sign people up there. They're not doing that. I don't know what they're doing. They need to provide a report on exactly how they believe they have found all of the at-risk or COVID-infected people and why they say everyone has shelter who's asked for it. I think they basically just turn the phones off and then anybody who tries to contact them after that, well, we don't have any customers. Thank you. Thank you for the public comment. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. I'll be happy to make a motion as amended by uh, each of you. And I just wanted clarification, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, you wanted to, did you end up pulling 35, the Alibaba one off of consent? You had yeah. a question? You did. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second from uh, Supervisor Cortez. May I get the roll call, please? Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian, aye. Supervisor Cortez. Aye, with an abstention on 37. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. President Chavez. Yes. Thank you very much. May I go then to our next item would be item 11. We took adjournments. We did our commendations and proclamations. We're moving over eight, nine, and 10, which have been moved to a time, uh, a date uh, certain. Item 11 is the Valley Healthcare Homeless Program, and we will begin there. Thank you, President Chavez. Uh Board members, this is Paul Lorenz, CEO of Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and director of the Valley Homeless Program. Uh, there are a couple items I wanted to bring to your board's attention. The first is the authorization and acceptance of approximately $680,000 in COVID-19 related supplemental funding. Uh, those funds would be used, as you well know, to support our activities in the expansion of the homeless backpack team, um, as well as uh, working with the Office of Supportive Housing. Uh, the other item that I wanted to bring to your board's attention is the off-agenda report requested by Supervisor Cortese uh, to provide additional information on the homeless activities uh, in the encampments and in the community. Uh, I hope that um, off agenda report is responsive to the request. That uh, will be provided to your board on a weekly basis as part of the county's emergency operations center report from the joint operations team. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm going to. Um... As, I'm going to just go down the road. May I start with you, Supervisor Cortez, and then I'll go to you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, thank you, President Chavez. Paul, could you just um, reiterate or repeat what the frequency of those dashboard reports will be on homeless outreach? I'm sorry, I, I heard you. I thought I heard you, but it, the timing of that escapes me. I'm sorry, Supervisor. I'm, I just want to make sure I understood your question. You're asking about the the dashboards for which you requested. Uh, the dashboard that's included in the off agenda report includes information on the locations of the homeless encampment uh, visits uh, for which we have done screening. 
yes. uh, as well as the number of individuals that we've screened at those locations. And I'm just asking about the, freq the intended frequency of those reports going forward. I'm sorry. So that, uh, that report would be provided weekly as part of the joint operations uh, departmental report uh, through the EOC. Um, great, great. Thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you and good morning, Paul. Uh, first, I want to extend my thanks uh, to you and your team for your really hard work during this crisis. Uh, it's noticed and much appreciated. I have one question that I'm hoping you can answer now uh, and one through an off agenda report. Uh, the first question is how will the county expand community-based testing and outreach to homeless encampments, specifically through the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program? Thank you, Supervisor. So um, as we expand our capacity to do testing um, internally as a healthcare system, our intention is to go beyond just a, excuse me, symptomatic testing of homeless individuals, but to screen all individuals um, that would be interested in having uh, the COVID-19 test. Um, and so that will be part of our public health surveillance activities um, to ensure that we are able to, to manage and contain the further spread of COVID-19 in both large encampments or congregate settings. Do we have a plan for what that will look like? How we'll achieve the goal? I, I agree that that's where we should be going. So um, I, I would say that uh, in the coming week in working with the county EOC, we'll have a much more detailed plan in terms of how we will reach out and make sure that uh, we're, uh, targeting and identifying the correct individuals in those encampments um, and encourage uh, this type of activity and support. Thanks. And my request then for an off agenda report, which um, should be included with the EOC report that you're already talking about, uh, is to let us know what additional resources, whether it's staff, equipment, uh, supplies, housing, uh, are needed to, to successfully support expanded systematic testing, tracing and isolation of high risk populations uh, to prevent, of course, introduction of the virus into uh, our high risk congregate settings, into and out of. Great. Thank you, Supervisor. So we will uh, be sure to include uh, responses to all those elements uh, in our next report. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Are there any other questions? I'm going to move to Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. No, Madam Chair, this is Supervisor Simidian. No comments or questions at this time. Thank you. Supervisor Wasserman. No, ma'am. No questions. Thank you. I, I just had one, um, and that is to follow up on uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's uh, question. And that is, Paul, as it relates to the um, the connecting the Valley Health Plan and the leadership role that the doctors are playing there to connecting people to housing. How do you how do you think that's working right now? And I recognize that you have your VHP leadership or your doctors are also operating under the EOC. But could you talk just a, for a minute about how you think that connection to housing is working from the perspective of the the, the health perspective? the hospital perspective, I'm sorry. Sure, thank you, Supervisor. So I, I would say it's actually working really well in, in the sense that, uh, as you noted, our staff are embedded as part of the EOC, um, specifically as part of the Joint Department Operations Center. Um, and as we identify individuals from a healthcare perspective that either need shelter or additional support, um, those uh, individuals are really, um, provided wraparound services by all the departments and agencies involved. So they are prioritized. Um, and given where we stand today in terms of the number of individuals that we're identifying that are considered to be at that high risk level, um, we're able to manage the situation uh, to a large degree. Um, and as you note in the report, we've also targeted um, and focused on the elders in, in the homeless encampments um, that may be at, at further risk or greater risk uh, than the general homeless population. Uh, so I think the team is, is strategically looking 
um, at the, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable population, if you will, to ensure that they're receiving the care and support that they need. Um, and the Office of Supportive Housing is, is right there with us in providing that support. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I do not believe, we have a couple speakers on this item. Let me go to those public speakers and then we will come back to the board for action. May I ask the clerk to call upon the speakers? Thank you, Madam President. We have three speakers on this item. Our first speaker is Jerome Shaw. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, hi, it sounds like I'm breaking up right now. Um, but um, my comment is, I think the, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable is like an oxymoron. I don't see how Sorry, I don't see how um, VMC is identifying vulnerable people. Vulnerable people should be identified by their doctors. Their doctors should be the ones who say, hey, this person has like an underlying condition and un un vulnerable, vulnerable people aren't only those over the age of 65 or over the age of 60. Vulnerable people are people that have underlying conditions that have been identified by the, um, I guess the CDC that if they contract the, the COVID virus, it could lead to a fatality. I'm the intellectually dishonest letter writing cancer. Our next speaker is Gail Osmer. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Gail doesn't appear to be near her speaker. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. We'll come back to her. Our next speaker is Robert Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, Robert Aguirre here. Um, I would like to point out that uh, although we don't have enough tests to go out and test all the unhoused people, we do have an opportunity to be able to put thermometers, uh, IR thermometers in the hands of people that are going out to the encampments. So at least we can pre-screen people and find people that are uh, maybe not showing all the symptoms, but uh, might be at risk. We can also identify the people that um, might be compromised either by age or health conditions. And then we can report that back to the city. There's enough people out uh, going out to the encampments that can help the county get this done. They're unpaid and they should be uh, able to uh, go out and reach out to these, these populations since they're going out there anyway. And I certainly suggest that um, we provide some sort of stipend or some sort of uh, materials for them to be able to distribute. Um, I'm part of the, uh, the uh, search program that's going out and handing out backpacks and we need to do more of that. Our next speaker is Jerome Shaw. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, hello. Um, so um, yeah, my comment is, you know, identifying the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable doesn't really make any sense. Um, it's like an oxymoron there. Um, you know, I think the most vulnerable people um, out on the streets are everyone <laughs> that's out on the street. Um, you know, and the most vulnerable people aren't just those that are over a certain age. It seems like that's what people are picking and choosing to do is like place all everyone who's elderly, like in a hotel or something like that. But people that have underlying health conditions identified by their personal care physician should be placed into hotels, especially if one of those conditions were listed on the CDC list um, saying like if they contract COVID, then it could lead to a fatality. Um, I'm not I'm still not understanding how people are identifying individuals that are at high risk you know you hear it you hear you hear it but i see no information and i hear no clear answers to how those things are being done you just hear they're identifying they're identifying but they're not telling you how they are doing it and since they're not telling you how they're doing it they're actually are not doing it. our next speaker is gail osmer i am unmuting you 
Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. This is Gail. I just want to um, give my um, thumbs up to the back. Gail, it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. I just want to say congratulations to the backpack team and give them the thumbs up. They have been very helpful to many requests that I have asked and have housed at least, I think, that the most accountable 10 to 12 people in the hotel. I am out there five days a week to four or five, six different encampments. And a lot of those encampments that they don't know about and they need to be tested. These are encampments that nobody goes to. I go and give them the hygiene kit and food, but the, the county doesn't know about these unhoused folks. So these are the folks that need to be tested. Um, but the backpack team has been wonderful. We need more testing. And the county needs to connect with folks like myself and to bring. Our final speaker on this item is Elias Madrid. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Out here, uh, this volume keeps on going on and off. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My concern is in regards to this item is that there are trained people that these advocates that can help Valley Med. Oh, Elias, we just lost you. Cases. Sorry, Madam President, I believe we we have lost him. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. That uh, that concludes our speakers on this item. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask for a motion on the Valley Healthcare um, Access Program. There are four items. I'm, I'm asking for a motion for item 11 A, B, C, and D. And um, okay. and we have a motion from Supervisor Allenberg. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Second. A second from Supervisor Cortezzi. And um, I'm going to ask for the roll call vote, please. Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Supervisor Cortezzi? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Aye. President Chavez? Yes. Chavez. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and that passes unanimously. We're now going to move on to, um, I'm just looking at my time, we're going to come back to item 12. And I will just alert my colleagues that I am going to try to give us a break between 1230 and one and it really helps the clerk um, be able to manage their, their staffing. So I want to alert you to that. We're going to come back to item 12 because we can't start that until 11, 13, 71, 14 and 15 are all going to be heard at one o'clock. We're now going to move to item 16, and this is equipment and data coverage for underserved. This is a board referral from Supervisor Cortezzi. Well, thank you, President Chavez. Um, the referral, I think, is, is pretty self-explanatory as written. It's a request um, uh, for the administration to, to come back with uh, options for partnering with the County Office of Education um, and potentially the city of San Jose, which, um, well, first of all, on the issue of, of closing uh, the digital divide, more specifically um, purchasing equipment for underserved community members, um, starting first and foremost with the 15,000 families that have already been identified by the Santa Clara County Office of Education with the highest need of assistance to, to get connected. Um, you know, with a special emphasis on families who are receiving government help uh, through us, primarily Medi-Cal, CalFresh, CalWorks, WIC, and other low-income community members uh, in need based on um, county database. Um, and um, basically, it's, um, it's a push to get uh, devices, uh, uh, including a commu um, computer um, variety of computer devices um, and even cell phones 
but most importantly, internet coverage into uh, the areas where uh, we just don't have access right now. Um, that is the item. Um, the pitch for it, um, I think the board members are, are all familiar with um, in this particular moment in time where we have um, education, especially uh, struggling to, to try to do distance learning um, in underserved communities. When I say underserved communities, not just in terms of um, our usual indicators, but communities that are not served um, by you know, basic um, hotspots or Wi-Fi service. I think um, parenthetical to that is that you know the the emphasis on this um, to best serve everybody is on ubiquitous um, service, not not necessarily trying to piecemeal together with hotspots. But there are already some efforts, including. Eastside Union High School District, which has um, been partnering with the city on a gradual rollout of um, hotspot availability and tablets uh, for the students. But as we go, as we speak today on this Tuesday, on this board meeting day, there's young people out there who are not um, who are not able to, to connect. They're just out of luck in terms of, uh, of, of trying to do, do their distance learning or online education. Um, in this COVID environment. Um, lastly, I think, um, you know, we've talked so many times and there's been so much support on the board over the years for school link services. Uh, not long ago um, at the CSFC committee, we were informed that, um, and I don't recall if this came up to the board, full board or not, but informed that, you know, um, schooling services made a, a pivot, um, you know, a sharp uh, pivot to, to also, um, uh, close the uh, the distance gap, uh, given the fact that those coordinators and associated counselors with social service folks would typically be meeting with families in person or students in person, um, just based on rudimentary referrals from from teachers in a classroom. Obviously, that's not happening now. Uh, so they made a pivot to online as well, and. I'm, I'm very proud of the county staff and administration for working really aggressively to try to get the word out and try to make sure that families that are out there that are experiencing problems, whatever they might be, uh, or students that might be in an abusive situation, for example, understand that they have that access point still, uh, you know, to a schooling services county-based coordinator. Obviously, as we've talked about before, that would cover mental health issues and uh, behavioral health issues justice issues and, and a lot of other things. None of that can happen online in these, um, in, in these dead areas. So uh, again, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to go on because um, I think all the board members, my colleagues are as familiar with this issue as, as I am. Um, there's no appropriation attached to this item. It's um, a referral to, ask the administration to come ask the county executive's office particularly to come back with with options um, and um, preferably to the extent that appropriations are um, are in order once options come back um, that there would be either cares act dollars um, um, you know fema backfill per se or um, something that we've used a lot with this kind of education related outreach, which is um, MHSA dollars. I don't know in this budget, because we haven't seen it yet, um, what the intended uh, sources and uses will be for, for that. But those are just some examples of ways to, to deal with this issue aggressively, as opposed to over a 10 year time frame. We don't have 10 years right now, uh, but to deal with it aggressively, um, without necessarily uh, taxing the general fund in a year where uh, that's going to be, where general fund dollars are just going to be scarce. Again, I don't need to remind my colleagues about that. Um, so, the, so the motion is to send this back, uh, send this out. So I've certainly had a chance to you know, talk to Dr. Smith about whether or not, you know, he thinks this is uh, something that's uh, plausible, um, you know, in terms of, of, of bringing options back that, you know, that are real, real and are, are feasible. And um, he's optimistic about that. So um, with that, um, President Chavez, uh, that's an introduction to the item. I, I would assume we might have public speakers and 
you know, at the appropriate time, I would make a motion to move the item. Thank you. Um, if we have um, public speakers, if for my colleagues, we could um, go to the public speakers first and then have a discussion. Would that be all right with everyone? That's fine. Great. So then um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call on the public speakers. Thank you, Madam President. We currently have eight speakers on this item. Our first speaker is uh, Rev Ray. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, greetings and blessings, supervisors. Thank you for your leadership during this COVID crisis. Uh, this is Reverend Ray. I'm the executive director for PAC, People Acting in Community Together. Uh, in solidarity with Working Partnership USA and other Reverend Ray, we lost you. We'll move on to our next speaker and we'll try coming back to him at the end. Thank you. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Gabriel Manrique. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel Manrique. I'm a community organizer for Latinos United for a New America. And I do support uh, Cortez's refer to partner with the Santa Clara County Office of Education to provide devices and internet access to families who are facing the dual divide. As part of an organization that works primarily in the east side of San Jose, uh, Luna knows how valuable it is for people in this community to have access to internet, especially during this pandemic, the hardest folks how big that gap is when it comes to access to technology. Uh, many families do not have access to the internet to help their children to do schoolwork or even to look for resources so needed during these hard times. Another issue that has arisen in people is people cannot fill out the 2020 census questionnaire because they do not have access to the internet or a device at home. And that's very problematic, especially, you know, Silicon Valley being the mecca of high tech. Uh, so thank you, Supervisor Cortese, for your leadership on this issue so important to our Latino community. And we appreciate your work so uh, to close the dear cap in our communities. Our next speaker, let's go back to Rev Ray. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I didn't know how to unmute myself, but I wanna thank you uh, County Supervisors for your leadership during this COVID crisis. And I offer my prayers and support for all the work that you do. I'm here and um, Solidarity with Working Partnership USA and all of the other organizations alike to support uh, Supervisors Cortez's referral to partner with Santa Clara County's Office of Education to close the digital divide. Uh, here at PAC, we're not in the business of speaking for our community leaders, but here, uh, because of the crisis, we see the, again, exposure of that digital divide. Uh, having taught in both charter schools and public schools in East Side San Jose, I see the impact of the social economical distancing that this allows parents and children alike to equally participate uh, in, during this crisis because of the lack of technology. So we support uh, Supervisor Cortese and all of you in this work. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Scott Largent. I, I do fully support uh, item number 16 uh, for the underserved community uh, to especially have services like internet access that's very important during tough times um we we face that here um at a lot of our county government centers a lot of our courthouses um the poor the homeless the mentally ill that don't have data plans um the obama phones are pretty maxed out with uh the services those are able to provide for free um so you play that kind of rat race to try to find the internet and that's what a lot of people are going through right now um, our county government center, internet doesn't work past the wall. Um, we don't have it over at our sheriff's department. We don't have it at our civil courthouses. It's spotty over at the Hall of Justice. Um, it's just good luck getting the equipment to work. And especially when rec centers were closed down, it's like somebody just yanked the cable out of the wall and decided, hey, just let these people fry throughout this crisis. So I'm going to say it how I see it. And uh, we need to help people uh, charge phones, get online and, and function. Our next speaker is Adam Escoto. I am unmuting you. 
Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to uh, address uh, the board on uh, item 16. Um, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of, of this item uh, as a um, uh, trustee of uh, the Morgan Hill Unified School District, but I'm speaking on behalf today of the Digital Equity Coalition, uh, a coalition of a number of trustees throughout the county who are extremely concerned about this issue. In, uh, in South County uh, and in Morgan Hill in particular, we have approximately 411 students that do not have access to the internet. Um, there is a great need for hotspots uh, so students can begin uh, to participate on the online instruction that began in the middle of March. And so since that time, despite uh, the fact that our uh, superintendent leadership team uh, uh, has done, I think, a very, very uh, good job. Our next speaker is Devin Conley. I am unmuting you. Oh, I'm sorry, they're using an older version of Zoom. We will not be able to unmute them. My apologies. Uh, our next speaker is Grace Ma. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. I want to um, give appreciation to all the Board of Supervisors for all of your work during this uh, crazy time. This is Grace Ma. I'm on the Santa Clara County School Board. And I'm also a member um, of the Digital um, Divide Coalition. I would like to express, as everyone else has, uh, support for this referral. We do need to make um, internet access really like a utility, just like water, just like electricity, and make it available to all um, underserved and the population ahead of, uh, for the whole county. Um, it's so important, and the County Office of Ed, of which I'm not speaking on behalf of, but certainly um, going to say that uh, partnering together to reach all of the kids that need it um, is going to make a difference for all the generations of children who are not going to have as much of a summer slide and um, achievement gap issues for the rest of their lives, really, based on this pandemic. Our next speaker is Betsy Hammer Carr. I am unmuting you. Please accept, please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. This is actually Priscilla Acuñamena. I am speaking on behalf of Working Partnerships USA. First off, just wanted to um, reiterate the thanks to Supervisor Cortezzi for his leadership on this. During this time, we all know internet is needed to meet so many um, pressing things like distance learning, telemedicine, filling out applications for social services. This issue is more important now than ever. And um, we're aware of um, all the ways that um, our community partners have already stepped up, played a really important role in bringing this issue to light, um, particularly our um, school board leaders. To them we say thank you and um, we'd really love to encourage the um, county to um, look into all the different forms of um, all the different types of resources that could bring to bear on this issue. Um, the Economic Development Administration has a program, the CARES Act Public Works Funding, that may be appropriate as well as um, the federal. Um... Our next speaker is Jennifer Zhao. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hello, thank you so much for your hard work during the pandemic. Uh, I'm a high school student in Cupertino and I would like to express my support for this referral as well. Um, the recent shift to online learning has really exposed the extent of the digital divide and our increased reliance on technology could exacerbate existing inequalities if they aren't addressed. For families and students, access to the internet is uh, really imperative, especially to stay connected, informed, and to maintain an education. So less affluent students really should not be neglected. And speaking as a student, education really needs to be accessible to all, especially right now. And although many school districts have worked hard to provide resources, the uh, support from the county is still essential to provide 
uh, internet access to like some of the 15,000 families that aren't able to uh, education for their children. So once again, thank you so much for your work on this issue. Our next speaker is LGK40. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. It appears that individual may not be able to access their device. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Robert Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. One moment, please, while we get that set up. Okay. Hello, yeah, this is Robert Aguirre. Um, I would also like to uh, support uh, this item 16 and um, Dave Cortese's uh, recommendation for this. There are a large number of people that are underserved and, and we need to do as much as we can to try to support them. And um, I believe that it's not just children that are in school, but there's adults also that need to have access. And there, we need to provide more services to people out in the public so that um, if they don't have the service at home or they don't have a home, they would still be able to get onto the internet. And uh, it's, it's essential to take part in what's going on in the government. And that's one way that they can do it. And uh, many of them don't even have phones. So that's another problem. Uh, besides just having the, the online uh, services, they also don't have the phone services themselves. So I think this is something we need to do and put a lot of attention to it. So thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Arasmith. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, thank you for your leadership. Thank you to Supervisor Cortezzi for putting this referral forward. I know many of you have been working on this for a long time in this critical issue, particularly I know um, Supervisor Ellenberg's office has been working here. Um, my name is Christina Arismith. I'm a teacher in San Jose Unified and a trustee at Campbell Union High School District. Um, speaking as part of the Digital Equity Coalition, this is a human right and goes beyond distance learning. COVID-19 has brought to light just how much our schools are burdened with and it's clear that schools and school districts alone cannot provide all that is necessary for our students and families. Um, this goes beyond distance learning. It's about telemedicine. It's about being able to access county resources. Um, so many are unemployed and looking for job applications. That's all online right now. We need this action now. It's urgent. Our families cannot wait. I support this referral and I ask for your support as well so that our families and students can have what they need, not only to learn, but to survive and thrive in the community that we deserve. Thank you. Our next speaker is Devin Conley. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jose Magana. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, County Supervisors. This is Trustee Jose Magana from the San Jose Unified School District. Um, as well as a tr current trustee, I'm a former teacher uh, and work in a nonprofit that serves the 14 schools in the east side uh, of San Jose. I'm just calling uh, to give a couple of comments. First, to say thank you to, uh, trust to excuse me, Supervisor Cortese for bringing up uh, the short-term solution and as well as uh, Supervisor Ellenberg for her uh, work and focus on a long-term project. Um, you know, our, our community is in need and um, many folks are calling the digital divide an, an education related issue. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this, this is an economic issue as um, the Digital Equity Coalition is trying to push is to make sure that all our families have access, not just now, but for the future. Um, so we do support this initiative, but we hope that we can continue to build the, the long-term infrastructure and coalitions that are needed in place to ensure that all our families are connected today and in the future. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. I support any effort to increase public access to broadband because it is just appalling that in Silicon Valley, 
every person does not have access to the internet. Um, and, you know, besides the family, besides the children who need it for school, um, you can't sign up for unemployment without access to a computer. You can't sign up for the self-employed insurance. You can't sign up for any kind of benefits. Um, you can't get emergency information. It's just a modern lifeline. People need to have access to internet just the way they do to water and sewage and power. So thank you for any effort to promote broadband. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maimona Afzalberta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, uh, honorable supervisors. This is Maimona Afzalberta, vice president of the Franklin McKinley School Board and special education teacher in the Alamark School District. I am also a member of the Digital Equity Coalition, a group of school board trustees and community members focused on closing the digital divide. Today, you have the opportunity to take the first step to close the digital divide for 15,000 families across all school districts of Santa Clara County. We urge you to vote yes. At this moment, the letter submitted yesterday by the Digital Equity Coalition in support of this item has been signed by 53 school board members representing 29 school districts from across Santa Clara County, as well as both community college districts and the county, and the county school board. We thank each of you for your work you have done in the past to bridge the digital divide and for the imperative decision that you can make today. We look forward to continuing to support your efforts to close the digital divide by partnering with cities on long-term infrastructure development. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elias Madrid. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, I don't have nothing to say on this item. I accidentally left my uh, hand up. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Myra Palagio. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Myra Pelagio. I'm an organizer with Luna Latinos United for a New America in the east of San Jose. And I just want to speak in support of Supervisor Cortez's referral to partner with Santa Clara County Office of Education to provide devices and internet access to families who are facing the digital divide. Uh, as an organizer, I see my families who have children um, not in school and the struggle that they face when they cannot get their children to join online and um, as a sister as well, I have two siblings in elementary school and I see the meetings that they have, not all of the kids are present. And I know it's because we need these resources in our community and it will, I would really appreciate all of y'all's efforts to provide this, um, these resources and close the gap in the digital divide. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hava Bustamante. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, uh, President Chavez, uh, Chava Bustamante with uh, Latinos United for New America. And um, I'm here to speak in favor of um, uh, Supervisor Dave Cortese's referral uh, to uh, uh, partner with the um, Office of Education. Um, Luna represents uh, hundreds of um, Latino families in Eastside San Jose, and these people don't have, uh, a lot of them don't have access to computers. Uh, so um, it is um, very important that uh, uh, we do something to make sure that these people get connected so they can have access to resources and so their children can also have access to a proper education. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Jorge Pacheco Jr. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, good, uh, good morning, honorable supervisors. This is Jorge Pacheco Jr. 
um, Oak Grove School District trustee and also fourth grade teacher in the Mountain View Wisma School District and member of the Digital Equity Coalition. I just want to extend my thanks and my gratitude to, uh, to for uh, Cortezi for putting this referral forward and also for President Chavez for her leadership, um, Samidian and also Wasserman for their involvement and support of this issue. We are all incredibly grateful for this. And what I wanna emphasize is that this issue is not just an issue along economic lines, that it's also along racial lines. And this is very much just in the same way as it is an economic issue, as it is a racial issue, as it is an educational issue. There is not the, there's no greater imperative right now than to bridge this divide. This can be the first step and we can take a huge leadership um, move for the entire state. So please, your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you to the clerk for calling out all of those names. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to um, Supervisor Cortezi to see if you wanted to uh, do a motion and then uh, and then open it up for discussion, your call on how you'd like to handle it. Um, I'm happy to move the item as it's currently uh, written and submitted, thank you. Great, do we have a second on that? I will say oh, okay, Susan. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to second it. I do have some uh, some comments and requests. Great. So we have a motion and we have a second. And um, I'm going to move Dave to then to Susan and we'll go along the, the route we usually use. Uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Uh, I really am delighted, Supervisor Cortesi, that you brought this issue before our board. Uh, it's something that I've been working on behind the scenes for a couple of months, uh, as the partners involved uh, mentioned to you. I will add that information to the record here and would like to offer some friendly amendments to your referral. Uh, first, in setting context, the, the technology to connect all of Silicon Valley, essentially all of Santa Clara County, has existed for quite some time. Uh, Supervisor, you noted in your, your press conference yesterday uh, that you knew about this inequity as far back as the 1990s when you sat on the on the school board. We just haven't seen the urgency uh, as a community from city governments uh, or, or the county or school boards who are best equipped to facilitate this access or among carriers who provide the services to connect the numerous deserts that exist in pockets throughout the county in areas that are deemed to be, you know, quote, non not profitable. And as the pandemic has made abundantly clear, profitable can't be the baseline for a service that is essentially to virtually all sectors of life. Um, it is a little bit disappointing that it's taken the COVID crisis to lift up what has been known and tolerated for more than a decade. Without connectivity, we've, we see students fall further behind as distance learning becomes the norm. Without connectivity, we won't be able to expand telehealth appointments and we won't be able to fully realize the possibilities suggested by Supervisor Chavez last week of equitable access to the opportunity to telecommute. Without connectivity, we'll be hampered in our contact tracing efforts as that work will require a strong technology component. As most of the speakers mentioned and in short, while in internet connectivity may seem at first blush uh, non-essential or well beyond the purview of county government, this pandemic has shown us that people are being left further and further behind. And as the safety net for our vulnerable populations, I believe the county does bear some responsibility to play a role in moving toward more equitable access for all of our residents. I've been working on a plan with Joint Venture Silicon Valley to meet the needs of families in connectivity deserts. And the County Office of Education has been uh, in the conversation uh, on this topic as well. Where I would like to see the county step in, in a supporting role, is in our unincorporated areas and perhaps some of the smaller cities that may need assistance in meeting this need. The city of San Jose has a $25 million digital inclusion fund of which they have spent just $1 million to date. Mm. It seems to me that they are sufficiently resourced to meet the needs of their city in the short term to provide devices and mobile hotspots to families, and in the long term to build out a complete 5G network if, if that's the desired model. I don't believe the county should prioritize the city of San Jose when we have significant connectivity deserts in unincorporated areas 
predominantly in South County, but also in a number of urban pockets, and I'm happy to provide that data. That should be our first priority. And second, the smaller cities that lack the resources that San Jose has. Um, I think this is what equity would look like. To understand the scope of the challenge outside of San Jose, of the 15,000 currently identified families, about 8,000 reside in, the San, in San Jose, or just over half. That means that nearly half of those families would be entirely left behind by a San Jose plan. Another option for consideration might be to advance the funding to school districts or to the County Office of Education, as those entities have been named as eligible recipients for emergency funds to help them purchase devices and hotspots. Uh, and it's unclear to me, perhaps this is something that can come back in the report, whether the county would be able to be reimbursed for these expenditures. Again, where I see a place for the county to play a meaningful role would be to empower our county office of education through a resource allocation to address the connectivity and infrastructure challenge through a coordinated countywide effort, looking at need and available resources, including funding, existence of fiber, suitability of 5G, uh, et cetera. We need to be talking about long-term strategies for infrastructure outside the city of San Jose in those areas that will be left behind by that city's digital inclusion effort. So having said all of this, uh, the, here is my uh, friendly amendment for your consideration, Supervisor Cortesi. I would like for the report back to include options for consideration around prioritizing actual connectivity, not just device um, and or hotspot procurement for unincorporated Santa Clara County, smaller cities, uh, and then at a third tier, possibly the city of San Jose. And additionally, I would like the report back to include information around work uh, that Joint Venture Silicon Valley has already engaged in with the city of San Jose, the County Office of Education, and my various colleagues on the board. Thank you so much again for bringing this forward. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. I would like to uh, wait until we hear from Supervisor Bertese about whether or not he is inclined to incorporate Ms. Ellenberg's uh, suggested amendment. And Susan, could you very briefly say your amendment again, just so I I, I, there was a lot there and I'm not sure I caught it. Sure. Um, I would like for the report back to include options for consideration around prioritizing connectivity uh, as well as device and hotspot procurement. First for unincorporated Santa Clara County, then for smaller cities that show demonstrated pockets of need and at a third tier, possibly the city of San Jose. And additionally, I would like the report back to include information around work that Joint Venture Silicon Valley has already engaged in with the city of San Jose, the County Office of Education, and various colleagues on the board. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Cortese. Yeah, I don't have any problem with the amendment. I'm not sure it's it's truly an amendment because that's what the, uh, that's what the referral has written calls for all 15,000 uh, households that the County Office of Education identified, and then it, it's a both and. It says also, much like the Friendly Amendment is requesting, also look at any potential partnership with the City of San Jose. Um, and uh, so that, that's the intention all along. Certainly connectivity is mentioned several times. You need infrastructure for connectivity. I think the plan is to, um, there's, there's some people thinking that you could somehow micromanage um, hot spots all over the county without doing any kind of permanent infrastructure, but the referral certainly wants the administration, my referral, to come back with uh, options for investing in permanent infrastructure too, so we, we don't get bogged down in, in that kind of micromanagement or the cost. The cost has been proven to be double uh, to do this all by hot spots versus, um, in terms of ongoing programmatic annual costs versus, um, just straight up Wi-Fi costs from permanent infrastructure. So that's some of the thought that's been given, given to it thus far. Um, I would say that um, I have no problem to the extent that the Friendly Amendment is asking for, um, you know, anything over and above to come back that, that and what I've just 
outlined and re-outlined and written, um, that's fine. I'm we're looking for op that, for options to come back. So yeah, I think that what's um, what is not included that um, is a report out to the board relative to the work that Jeff joint venture has been doing that that actually was not included at least as I re-reviewed it and um, and That's I think awesome. and I, I think the only other thing that um, that uh, supervisor Ellenberg is asking them to come up with a a set of priorities that that are not I mean I, I think that would be the outcome but but I think that it, just stating clearly that she's looking at a very specific set of priorities. I, I, I think, is that right, Susan? That is right. Of okay. the 15,000 uh, demonstrated need, what I would like to do is prioritize the 7,000 or so that are outside of the city of San Jose. If we can get to everybody, I mean, all of this will depend but on Susan, recommendations that come back from the, right. let me just finish, please. Okay. Let me finish from the board, uh, from the administration. Um, but a prioritization system that looks first at the need in unincorporated county, then the need in the smaller cities, and we and we can show um, at a moment's notice where the connectivity deserts are, um, and then focus on needs within the San city of San Jose, specifically because we know that San Jose is very specifically resourced in a way that the county isn't and uh, to my knowledge, the smaller uh, cities are not. So, but the thing I was trying to clarify is that you're asking the staff to come back with that as an informational item, not as direction that that would be how the how the board would pursue the investments. You're asking them to research that. Or are you saying- uh, this My recommendation would be that that is the priority system oh, okay. that they look at. All right. I have a problem with that. That I, I just thought it was research you were looking for. Okay. I don't mind, I don't mind having an option for prioritization, you know, yeah. in, case, in case funding is a problem. I and mean, this is estimated to be about a million dollars to do the actual physical infrastructure one time um, for, you know, for the 15,000 households. I, I My problem with it is not that I don't like prioritizing. My problem is who do you leave behind? I, I had a hard time later casting a vote that says, okay, you know, 7,000 households are, get, are suddenly going to have their children, their families have access to uh, distance learning and, and telecare and behavioral health services. But the other 8,000, we're not going to do because we think San Jose should do that solely by themselves or the school districts or somebody else. I mean, yeah. I, I think those are decisions that are way premature right now. This is a referral asking the administration to come back with options. And if you want options for a tiered approach that you know, delays some of the infrastructure and prioritizes other parts of the infrastructure. I'm happy to have them come back and put that before us, but I think it's going to probably be a serious debate at the time. Great. Probably Certainly. Oh, I apologize. People, a lot of people coming in from a lot of geographic areas looking for equity um, mm -hmm. that are fearful if they're in tier three, that they're going to be waiting an awful long time for their children, maybe post graduation to ever get access to a system as you said earlier, um, uh, sure. Supervisor Ellenberg has already taken uh, decades. We were we didn't have Wi-Fi when I was on the school board. We had the option to wire schools with fiber optic cable, and so we went out and entered into a partnership with the county and Mayor the late Mayor Susan Hammer to to bring fiber optic cable into all of our East Side mm -hmm. schools. That doesn't work today because we can't get the kids into the classrooms to. To plug into the fiber optic. Right, I'm aware. I know you're aware. We're all aware. So I, we're. This is hurry up offense. This is. Can we hurry up and get access to 15,000 folks in the county, not just the city of San Jose? Um, as what I would like to see is San Jose partner. So could you hold on just one second. Let me just let Dave finish, and then I'm going to come right back to you because what I need Dave to um, clarify is on the friendly amendment or on the yeah friendly amendment, are you comfortable with um, the consideration of the priorities? And if so, could you say that? And if not, could you say that so that if we need to restructure the 
motion, you can do that. And then I'll come to you, Susan. And then okay. I'm going to go back to my colleagues, my other right. colleagues who are waiting. I, I don't, I don't want to limit the referral to that prioritization system at this time. I would want the administration to come back with whatever options there are for, for what I would call wall to wall coverage of all 15,000 all in one tier. Um, and if Supervisor Ellenberg would like to see that in juxtaposition to a tiered approach, I'm fine having that come in as, you know, uh, as, as one of the options for the board to consider. But I don't want to send the referral out and say the only thing we're going to consider is a tiered approach because I think it's, again, it's way premature for that. Thank um, you. And Susan, how are you feeling about that? As um, I think coming back with the options is fine, but what I would note is that it would be terrible to see those other 8,000 families left out, uh, which is why I would hope that the city of San Jose will move just as quickly as, as you're, like, you're wanting to see us move. And perhaps on those 15,000 families, um, an appropriate partnership would be a 60-40 you know, or however the numbers work out um, agreement with the, the city of San Jose um, so that they are you know providing coverage with the funding that they already have but again as you said a little bit premature happy for those um, those options to come back but again we should leave no one out we are just not necessarily equally responsible for every single um, family when other resources may exist that we can pull in and partner with I, I don't, so I don't you're leaving the so I'm just I'm sorry I'm just going to focus on the motion for a minute so the motion is supervisor Cortez's um, uh, referral with the addition of joint a joint venture report out with the priorities being considered as one of the options that the staff should consider one of the options yes, I'm yes. That will work for me as well. Yes, thank you. I want to make sure. Thank you. I'm not, President Chavez, I just want to, I'm not going to debate anything. I just want to provide information, which will take me 30 seconds, um, uh, regarding potential sources of, of funding and the county's eligibility. Um, the biggest, you know, fund available would be um, the, the coronavirus relief fund that the, the Treasury set up. And their, their own guidelines say, as to... Uh, both money that the city of San Jose and the county have received, in our case, over $150 million or, or are scheduled to receive, um, included in that um, is language that says the funds could be used for um, expenses, quote, expenses to facilitate distance learning, including technological improvements in connection with school closings to enable compliance with COVID-19 precautions, expenses for establishing and operating public telemedicine capabilities for COVID-19 related treatment. Um, so it's pretty clear, obviously, it's pretty clear that there's eligibility there. Obviously, we have to defer to our good county executive, Dr. Smith, to come back and let us know <clears throat> if he's already accounted for all that money or spent, spent it, <laughs> or whether or not there's um, uh, enough in there to do this as well. And that's the kind of information I'm hoping to hear back on. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, move then to Supervisor Simidian, then Wasserman, then myself. Super Joe, Supervisor Joe. I'll wait until after Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you for the courtesy. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Madam President. A um, Couple of things. One, I like the comment that Grace Ma made about make internet access available to all um, in Santa Clara County. I think that certainly makes sense. Um, one suggestion I would have when this is brought back to us is that staff has reached out to Comcast and Apple and Microsoft and Google about chipping in to increase internet service throughout Santa Clara County so that people can use Comcast and Apple and Microsoft and Google and Facebook services. It just makes sense for them to do that. That's number one as far as the private sector they should be right up front trying to help us out getting internet access available to everyone, which then turns around and, and becomes their customers. So that would be number one. Um, number two, the point about the funding that Susan Ellenberg, Supervisor Ellenberg brought up, um, that schools are receiving funding from the federal government to pay for COVID related, to reimburse for COVID related expenses 
certainly if the students that are being forced because schools are closed to study at home and they cannot access their teachers, their classes, their, their education, if the school districts were to use money they receive to go towards funding that, that would make sense. And talking about money received towards COVID expenses, the city of San Jose, I believe, just received about $182 million. I think and this is in addition to the 25 million Supervisor Ellenberg brought up that I didn't know about. But the city of San Jose received 182 million. Somebody can correct me. I believe the county got about 150 million. And I would certainly be able to argue that so far to date, the county has many more COVID related expenses, such as our hospitals. So that $150 million, I know in talking from James and Jeff, will not cover our expenses. I also know that two thirds to three fourths of the reimbursement requests that we submitted to the federal, to the state to go to the federal government were turned down for COVID related expenses. So I would hope the city of San Jose can use their money that's allowed for COVID reimbursements. The school districts can use their money that's allowed for COVID reimbursements. And the private sector that by connecting all of these people will get 15,000 more households that will become customers of them. And last but not least, this is a referral, friends. So I think we've, we've given administration a lot of input. This is a referral simply saying, please look into options that can be considered and further discussed by the Board of Supervisors to increase digital connectivity to everyone within Santa Clara County. Thank you, Mike. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I wonder if I might just ask a question or two of the maker of the motion. The first of which is it was not entirely clear to me whether or not the motion as it was finally made was um, specific about not using general fund dollars or whether or not there is still the possibility as the motion is made that we would uh, dip into the general fund for these expenses. The referral is not specifying that again, just dealing with the issue of funding um, as premature at this time, it's not a, uh, there's no appropriation in the referral. And certainly asking the administration to come back with uh, options. I suspect based on what we know so far about the budget that uh, general fund use is going to be um, would be difficult uh, for the administration to recommend at this time um, or for us as a board to support but I don't know that for a fact again it's a little bit premature as we all know we'll, we'll be getting into um, serious uh, budget discussions um, shortly so at this point it's just um, come back with options obviously if the administration comes back and uh, recommends uh, against any general fund use um, you know we'll, we'll look at what the other options are um, but I, I'm not taking anything off the table or putting anything specifically on the table in terms of appropriations at this point uh, given that some of some of what Supervisor Wasserman uh, just said and Supervisor Allenberg uh, has obviously uh, studied uh, some of the cost implications as well. Um, and based on what I know, in addition to the little section I read about um, possible uh, treasury support on this uh, on the federal side, um, is that we have, as I mentioned at the outset, potentially other, not only other options, um, but I think we got to get our arms around uh, whether or not the city of San Jose is going to um, accelerate what is now, I think the second or second year of a two year, uh, 10 year plan. Um, and they're supposed to decide that later this month. Um, we also have pretty significant information from Eastside Union that um, they also, um, again, consistent with Supervisor Wasserman's comments, might be able to accelerate um, existing funding that they have uh, already earmarked for this purpose. So you know, we, we don't know. I think there's too much that we don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to take what could end up being a, a relatively nominal um, gap closing, you know, uh, general fund augmentation off the table at this point. But 
I certainly might <laughs> might change my mind about that later when I see what kind of cuts we're we're looking at. So that that's my attitude about it. Uh, Super SME, and I hope that's helpful in answering your question as to what my intention is here. Thank you very much. I think that's the only question I had uh, for the author, uh, Supervisor Chavez. I do, however, want to share with board colleagues and specifically with the administration before we go to vote on the referral that um, I find myself in agreement with uh, pretty, uh, pretty much with the observations offered by Supervisor Ellenberg. So as the administration is trying to assess what kind of package they might want to bring back to us uh, by way of options. Um, I, I would just uh, communicate uh, at this point that um, my thinking uh, significantly mirrors that that Supervisor uh, Ellenberg shared with us a little earlier. The other point for the administration as you're thinking about what to craft is uh, I know that different board members have different notions about how fully fleshed out referrals should be when they come to our board. Uh, I think that's understandable with five uh, very different people in these roles, and I don't think we're going to sort that out today. Uh, but I, I would just say I, I get anxious when um, a referral comes forward uh, and people are optimistic about partners and optimistic about the lack of um, need to hit the general fund only to discover that those partners may or may not materialize and that uh, intrusion in the general fund may or may not be required. So I just want to express those two concerns uh, as highlighted areas as the administration is considering what to bring back. That being said, uh, I'm going to support the motion. I thank um, Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Cortese and Supervisor Wasserman have all uh, spoken uh, to good effect on the importance of this issue and uh, why it is uh, so essential to uh, provide uh, equal opportunity to the greatest degree we possibly can. Um, I won't, uh, well, I, I was going to say I won't belabor the point, but maybe I will. Uh, I, I'm going to look to Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, and uh, who is most recently from uh, a school board setting. And I remember all those years ago when I ran for the Board of Education, people asked, why, why are you running for the Board of Education? And I said, because I think that public education is the single most important vehicle we have in this country to create a society of equal opportunity. And if we're serious about creating a society of equal opportunity, we can do that through our schools or not. And I think all three of my colleagues have spoken well today about the importance of making sure that that equal opportunity is, if not absolutely equal, at least a little bit closer than it is today. And for that reason, I'll be an eye vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very thoughtful discussion. I just wanted to add a couple of my own um, thoughts to this. One is that the concern I have relative to how we consider partners is that these partnerships have been in existence for some time and um, have not moved forward uh, very quickly. And so I, I want to make sure that um, we don't leave families um, literally disconnected while we're trying to work out our partnership. So from my perspective, why I appreciate the referral so much is I think we have to move relatively quickly. Um, the other two things that I wanna add is I think where cities can be particularly helpful is with um, citing the cell towers that will need to be long-term um, cited and to do that relatively quickly and um, on our end, what I'm really interested in also better understanding from our staff is whether or not the hot spots that we're looking for, the, I'm sorry, the dead zones that we're looking for, particularly in South County, can be addressed with um, buildings and facilities that the county already has. Um, I know that the Valley Transportation Authority has done a remarkably good job of using land and cell towers to get rent back. Um, I think, Mike, the point you raised about what our partnerships look like with the private sector um, is really critical, including that we could be renting um, cell towers in our own buildings that we own and or operate today that won't require us to wait years and years and years. And the last thing I'll just say is the reason we have 15,000 families that are disconnected from the schools and thousands more potentially disconnected from CalWorks, being able to look for a job online, um, CalFresh, 
any number of services, telemedicine, any number of services we provide is that we have been talking about this as a community for years and years and years and not doing the implementation. So I'm, I'm for partners, but I'm also for speed. For every month a child doesn't have access or every day they don't have access, that learning gap is getting bigger. And for every day that goes on longer, we have families that don't have access to benefits that they fully are entitled to and or jobs that they really wanna get. So I want us to wear our hat both as a county and um, in support of education. That being said to the maker and the seconder of the motion, I am very interested in making sure that um, Supervisor Wasserman's request relative to private sector partners, which actually joint venture I'm sure has been doing a ton of work on, so that probably comes back as part of the report back automatically, but that the staff is also considering um, the overlay of the dead zones with properties that the county owns so we can expedite and support cities in building out that infrastructure and that as we're talking to cities what we're asking them for is um, a commitment to speed up the uh, the permitting process so that we're not waiting in perpetuity for the infrastructure are you comfortable with that supervisor cortesi yes supervisor allenberg thank you all right with that i'm going to ask uh, with no more comments i'm going to ask for a roll roll call vote Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian, aye. Supervisor Cortez. Aye. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. And President Chavez. <laughs> thank you, Peggy. Yes. Well, All right. Your, that, thank you for your input and support, colleagues. Thank you. That was a very, very important discussion. All right. So that passes unanimously. We're going to now move on to item 17, and this is the eviction moratorium. And I, I Supervisor um, Samidian, I wanted to start with um, you and also just to get a little bit of input from um, from James. And I don't know how, how you'd like to proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Actually, I agree, uh, Supervisor Chavez, I think having our county council um, sort of set the stage by sharing with us the status of state action uh, that affects uh, perhaps the judgments we make today and also remind us what uh, is and isn't required in the way of state action. Uh, all of that would be to the good before I introduce the item. Sure. Good morning. Um, the county's current um, Eviction moratorium ordinance is keyed off of and uh, derives authority from the governor's executive order on the same subject. The governor's executive order uh, currently runs through May 31st. Uh, and so that was the basis for that May 31st date in the county's uh, current action. Um, I think folks are hopeful and, um, and there's probably a not unreasonable expectation that the governor will take action to extend that date given the continuing uh, nature of the COVID emergency. Uh, but he has not done so yet. In fact, I just checked uh, just a couple hours ago this morning to confirm that nothing happened late yesterday or early this morning and, uh, and nothing has. And so at this point in time, uh, my recommendation would be to proceed with recommended action B which would have us then come forward uh, at the May 26th meeting um, and be able to then account for any, any action that the governor has taken between now and then, um, or to otherwise uh, tee the item up in a way that would allow us to move forward, um, if the, assuming the governor takes action you know, before May 31st. So, Supervisor Simidian, what, um, it, if you would like, we can take public comment, then go to board uh, discussion, if that's okay? Sure. I'm happy to put a motion on the floor if you would like, and I'm happy to wait if you would like. Either no, way, whatever, whatever's your preference. Well, I think I would just go ahead and uh, move uh, the recommended action B uh, that is contained in the joint referral. Uh, thank you to you, Supervisor Chavez, for being the second signer on the memo. Um, and that will uh, give the speakers some uh, basic 
understanding what it is that's been proposed so they know what they're speaking to, which I find is sometimes helpful. I'm happy to speak to the item after public comment, however. That would be great. So we have a motion and a, and uh, do we have a second? I think Supervisor Wasserman, you just, you said second, but you're, you're no, second. What I, what I was trying to say, Madam Chair, is I thought that you would want to second it with both your names on it. I'll be happy to second if not. Oh, that's fine, Mike. Go ahead. Thank you for that offer. So I, on the second Supervisor Smithian's motion for item B is the maker. So we have a motion and we have a second. I'm going to go to the public speakers and I'll come back to the board. Um, we have six public speakers. Each speaker will have a minute and we will begin, uh, ask our staff to begin that now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Our first speaker is Michael Trujillo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. My name is Michael Trujillo, and I'm a staff attorney at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. We'd like to thank Santa Clara County for its tremendous leadership in passing a strong eviction moratorium to keep tenants housed during the COVID-19 public health crisis. This critical protection is the only thing keeping many families in their homes, as many tenants have no way to earn an income and pay rent during this unprecedented pandemic. Even renters who can access unemployment benefits and financial relief through the Federal CARES Act will not be able to pay rent due to the high housing costs in Santa Clara County. A recent analysis by the Turner Center at UC Berkeley found that renters in Santa Clara County will face bigger rent shortfalls than renters in any other region of the state, with typical rents ranging from 54% to 93% of unemployment benefits. Of course, the many thousands of undocumented workers in our county cannot access these resources. This shortfall makes it critically important that the county extend its eviction moratorium to give tenants a chance to get back, up, back to work and start earning an income again to be able to pay rent. Thank you again for your tremendous leadership on this important issue. Our next speaker is Cece. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you for having me uh, in the meeting, um, everyone. So I wanna talk about a little bit about my experience and the families that I work with. I, I'm an organizer at Silicon Valley Debug, but I speak to you today as a tenant more than just an organizer. Um, it's been really hard to keep up with bills when my husband lost his work due to COVID. And we've tried to negotiate with our landlord to see if we were able to pay half of it or get some of it, um, a payment plan or, or something like that, even offered us, if, even offered myself and resources to help him look for resources as, a, as our landlord. And that didn't really go anywhere. And as an organizer, I'm speaking to the family that is renting a room in a house and hasn't been able to afford rent, was laid off. And now she's a single she's a single mom of two with nowhere to go. And the eviction doesn't do anything. We need more than just an eviction moratorium. We need to cancel rent. Our next speaker is Marcy Kirsten. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, this is Marcy Gersten. I'm a, a leader at PACT, People Acting in Community Together and a resident of District 5. I also wanna thank you for your efforts during this COVID-19 crisis. You did the right thing to enact a county-wide eviction moratorium in March. As articulated in earlier comments and in the memo authored by Supervisors Chavez and Simidian, there is a continuing need for an eviction moratorium as people still cannot return to work and because keeping people housed helps prevent the spread of the coronavirus. I wholly support the proposal made by Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Simidian to extend the eviction moratorium to August 31st to the extent possible for you to do that under the executive order. And I urge you to take that action uh, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning. I strongly support the motion to extend the eviction moratorium, but I also agree with the speakers from DBUG because there's no way people are gonna be able to save up money to pay back rent when they've been unemployed. We need to have a rent cancellation and landlords can work with their lenders. Many landlords are giant corporations. Those who are not, they can work with their lenders. 
Um, the CARES Act provides for that. And I wonder how many lenders are actually getting uh, mortgage benefits or some kind of, you know, some kind of coverage, but they're still collecting rent from their tenants anyway. And um, we're going to have a huge wave of people being evicted and being homeless after the moratorium and payment period end. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Valle. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, how you doing? This is Jose Valle with Silicon Valley Debug. I'm also a community organizer, uh, but I'm also a tenant. Uh, I have a wife and uh, three kids and we live in a, a, a one bedroom. Uh, unfortunately, my wife uh, was affected by the shelter in place, so she's not working. So I'm the only one really paying the bills and uh, the unemployment has been on delay. I, I wanna uh, say this is, uh, um, I, want, I absolutely support an extension of the moratorium. I thank the Board of Supervisors for the extension, uh, but I also wanna say that it is definitely not enough. We need a rent cancellation and I would actually request that we agendize um, an actual an analysis of pros and cons of an actual uh, rent uh, cancellation. I know in the city of San Jose, there were some constitutional debates. Uh, and I also know that in the United States uh, government, there's a, what, what is it, uh, 6515, HR 6515. So they have a bill that's in place right now. So uh, thank you, appreciate it. Our next speaker is Anil Babar. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, board president and county supervisors. This is Anil Babar with the California Apartment Association. Uh, we wanted to just update you on um, some amendments we think would make the county ordinance a little bit more feasible. One would be uh, categorically exempting cities with existing ordinances. What we have been finding with our owners is confusion on how to operate with two overlapping ordinances. And so by exempting cities like San Jose and Mountain View who already have an existing ordinance, it'll allow greater compliance with the existing ordinances and ensure that people are following the letter of the law easily because they know which law to follow. Secondly, extending the extension in 30 day intervals to stay nimble. I also like to really quickly point out uh, rent cancellation is illegal under the constitution and, law, and federal and state law. And Landlords aren't getting uh, forgiveness and rent, they're getting forbearance, which means they still owe that mortgage. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. I am un unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm an organizer at Debug as well, but I am a renter. Uh, everyone in my family is renters uh, and tenants. Um, I just want to uh, thank you guys for extending the the moratorium, and, and I think that that is a huge part, but just like a lot of other people said already, um, it's not enough. Um, folks spend more than half of their income in Silicon Valley on rent, uh, let alone they're going to have to pay months of back rent when this is all over, and it's just, it's just not feasible. Um, I also want to just like entertain the idea of, I know that like this said, there's issues of constitutionality. I think the constitution is to be interpreted. Um, and I also think that these landlords are businesses, large businesses or small businesses. And I don't see why they can't seek uh, some type of relief or we can't as a community create a relief package for them. So that burden is not on tenants, but on them as businesses, just like every other business has had to do during this time. Our next speaker is Crystal Olivas. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thanks for having me. This is Crystal. Um, I am a tenant. I'm a community organizer. I also work at YWCA um, in the rental assistance program. The eviction moratorium does need to be extended. Um, however, what we have been seeing is that this is we're just using the eviction moratorium to buy time. People do not have work. And what really needs to be explored is a rent cancellation. I know that there's con concerns with the constitutionality, but it is being discussed at the federal level. Um, and I also urge you to look at 
the law foundation's uh, further analysis around the legality um, of canceling rent. Um, it's not realistic and it's not helpful for tenants to have a burden of of rent debt that they have to uh, deal with after the pandemic. Um, a lot of people are not working and I really urge you to support um, your most vulnerable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, all right, so I, I want to also talk about um, the rents that our people are having to uh, pay back uh, their past rents if this continues. Well, if you're, if you're barely making enough money to be able to pay the rents when it's normal time, it's going to be almost impossible for you to be able to catch up on your rents uh, for this time during the uh, COVID uh, thing and also pay the current rent once this thing turns, you know, normal. And so we have a situation where people are going to be evicted, even though we're right now temporarily giving them the opportunity to be able to put off paying the rent. It, it puts people in a, an economic um, disadvantage in that they're not able to recover property and uh, quickly enough to be able to do this. So I, I strongly suggest that we do rent cancellation. Um, also, mortgages can be put so that they get added to the end of their term. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Buchanan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. President Chavez and uh, members of the board, on um, behalf of Working Partnerships USA, would like to support uh, the motion from uh, Supervisor Sumidian. Uh, Certainly, the, the county has been a really strong leader on, on implementing uh, one of the most robust uh, moratoria on evictions uh, here in, in the Bay Area. Uh, we appreciate that. Certainly, we would uh, oppose uh, the proposal from the CAA uh, around exempting uh, those cities that have their own moratoria. The county has a, a clearer, uh, uh, more uh, uh, beneficial moratoria for tenants. Uh, and to echo many of the other speakers here, um, you know, as, as the uh, facilitator of the Santa Clara County CAN program, we've heard from hundreds of tenants every day that are having struggles being able to pay rent now that are fearful of what happens with back rent. Certainly would encourage the county uh, to continue its leadership in exploring what options are possible for addressing this issue of back rent so we can avoid mass evictions going forward. And, our next speaker is Emily Ann. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I am a resident of Mountain View. Um, please don't exempt Mountain View from your ordinance, um, please. Um, it's not actually, it's not necessarily that's the issue of the multiple ordinances. We look at the framework of all the eviction moratoriums, a city, state, uh, county, and federal level to um, see how we can protect tenants. Um, and if anyone falls through the cracks of each one, we rely on the other one. Um, so it's very important, especially as, and please extend this moratorium because we are facing a ticking eviction time bomb, which could be devastating for our entire region. Um, so uh, please continue on. Uh, uh, thank you so much for pass taking the leadership to extending this uh, eviction moratorium. Uh, this is obviously not the end of it as we keep on moving forward. Please keep on innovating solutions to keep people safe in their homes. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is LG K40. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker, <clears throat> pardon me, is Rebecca Armendaris. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning, Supervisors. President Chavez, I'm Rebecca Arvendares, and I am speaking on behalf of Caras. We are a nonprofit which serves South County. I'd like to say that we appreciate the moratorium and support the extension. 
and also ask that you not exempt other cities as our community in particular relies on your leadership and setting a higher standard than what we've seen in, in Gilroy. Um, we work with families who call on us every day who are sick with worry about how they will pay the rent when this moratorium is lifted. Many of them are no longer working or have had their hours and pay severely cut. They're also incurring higher household expenses because our children are home. And as we know, food security or food insecurity is growing at a rate that is faster than our uh, resources and agencies can keep up with. So I ask that you please um, explore a, um, a rent and mortgage uh, freeze across the board. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Myra Chavez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Myra? I think you have to accept the unmute. She might be having a technical issue, Madam President. Yeah, that happens to us. Okay. Excuse me, Madam President. It's Mike. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say to the clerk through you, Dave, when the people don't have the correct version of Zoom, are you able to tell them that? We are not able to tell them directly. We make the announcement in the room in the hopes that they can hear it. And they have options to either call in through a landline or try and log in through a different device. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Madam President. So, Myra? Uh, Steve? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, buenos días. Mi nombre es Mayra Chavez. So, lo que yo pienso es de que uh, cuando pusieron toda la moratoria de, de, y las órdenes de que todos nos quedáramos en casa para evitar a contagiarnos y contagiar a otras personas, so, todo estuvo muy bien, pero la verdad es que nadie pensó sobre de dónde íbamos a sacar para pagar nuestra renta y nuestros biles. Pusieron la moratoria de que no nos podían correr, pero nunca pensaron en que nuestra deuda iba a aumentar, así como todos nuestros biles. Si ya teníamos deudas, uh, supongo que ahora tenemos más deudas. Yo, nosotros todavía el mes de, de abril lo pagamos, pero el mes de junio solamente pudimos dar una parte. Para, para, eso, para el mes de mayo, pero para junio no sabemos si vamos a poder pagar toda la renta. Entonces, estaría bien que pensaran también en todo eso, ya que sus moratorias no nos están sirviendo para nada. Uh, muchas gracias. Y I'll just ask, um, is there anybody on our team who can translate that? In the clerk's office, for example. Um, not from the clerk's office. Unfortunately, at this time, we weren't prepared for a um, translation need. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to my colleagues and I'll begin with um, Supervisor Simidian if you wanted to make any comments. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I think we um, covered much of this ground uh, with the initial action a while back, uh, I will just say, I think um, it is clear that um, we need to provide some additional increment of time uh, while things sort themselves out for better or for worse. Uh, I think we know that it takes time for people to find their way to loans if they're available to unemployment insurance, if that's an option rental assistance from community agencies, friends and family, uh, or even that uh, government check, which won't go a long way toward um, rents in the Bay Area and in Santa Clara County in particular. Uh, I do think it's important just to underscore, even though I'm sure all of my colleagues are mindful of it, um, it is uh, simply a moratorium. It is, the burden to pay rent remains, as some of our speakers have uh, reminded us, it does apply not only to uh, residential rents, but to small business commercial rents as well. Uh, so I think the importance of this to the small business community is uh, a point that should be 
uh, noted. I don't have figures locally, but the figures that have been reported nationally suggest that um, you know most folks who are renting, uh, if they can pay their rent, are stepping up to pay their rent. Uh, there was a, a piece in the Mercury News recently quoting, we just pull it up here, quoting the National Multifamily Housing Council saying that there was a drop of just 4.5% in the percentage of tenants who paid some or all of their April rent. I think that tells us that if people can, they do. Uh, but uh, we also know that for some significant number, uh, that's going to get tough. Uh, excuse me, it's already gotten tough and it's going to get tougher uh, in the months ahead. So um, uh, the motion is for option B. That will allow our county council, that will in fact direct our county council to come back with options for our consideration at our May 26th meeting. And Madam Chair, I should say as a general rule, when we have a special meeting like the May 26th meeting, I am adverse to loading it up with other items, uh, but this is an extraordinary circumstance. Would have been happy to take action today if the governor's executive order had been extended, but because it was not, this is the best way to both uh, signal to the community uh, what our intentions are, I hope, and uh, also to comply with um, the limitations of the existing order. Respectfully ask for an aye vote. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. I'm gonna to go to Dave and then to Susan. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm, I'm wondering, um, Supervisor Smitty, and if you would consider something, I think it's a small request, but maybe an important one down the road. If, as the chair of the Federal Affairs Task Force, which uh, I get to serve on with you, if you would consider agendizing um, a conversation on this issue that's we can, I think going to be continued to be kicked around um, and appropriately so regarding um, rent abatement. Um, I, I understand it's a taking issue and I think there were some folks from the real estate industry uh, speaking today and I want to make very clear what I'm suggesting here is that uh, I don't I don't believe based on briefings that I've received in the past that a county or a state um, can just simply abate rent without um, constitutional issues like one of the speakers addressed. But there also has been some federal discussion about whether or not a CARES Act or extensions thereof uh, at some point might want to take into account um, you know, some kind of a reimbursement package to landlords so that they can, could actually um, uh, you know, sort of appropriate uh, rent abatements. You know, that's just one. That's just one thing I know that is is percolating at the federal level. Those kind of things that can be done where we can't do them. So, without getting into that policy discussion now, I'm just thinking that your committee would be um, that committee would be a great place to to have some exploratory conversations um, with our lobbyists and all the people that you convene uh, at that committee. Um, you know, regarding that subject, maybe at some point we're a big enough county to, to lobby for the for the right thing to happen in that regard. So just a thought. I don't know if you thank you. I'm, uh, I think it's I think it's a good idea, and I'm happy to incorporate the suggestion in the motion, uh, Madam Chair. Just uh, for uh, the board's information and the public's, our next scheduled meeting for the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force is, I believe, Wednesday morning, June the third. So happy to agendize the item uh, for for discussion at that point uh, and would ask the county council's office to help us in that discussion by uh, laying out the uh, who's in charge of what uh, possibilities here as we go there. We did have some conversation about forbearance issues as uh, Supervisor Cortese I know recalls from our last meeting. So uh, this is I think uh, a good venue in which to sort through the multi-jurisdictional uh, opportunities and impediments. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm now going to go, um, Dave, you're done. I'm going to go to Susan and then to Mike. I have no comments on this item. Thanks. Thank you. Mike, you're good. I'm good. Right. So may I ask for a roll call vote? Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Supervisor Cortez? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Aye. President Chavez. Yes, thank you very much. That passes unanimously. I'm going to go back to item 12. Um, and this was an item that had a was not to be heard earlier than um, 11 o'clock. And 
16 took quite a bit of time and I should have gone back to it sooner. So for those who are listening, this is the social services report on respite care that I requested a report back on. The item before us is a, um, the action that simply says there's, it's under advisement, there's no fiscal implications for this. What I would like to do is ask my colleagues to support uh, having this come back to the June 2nd board meeting um, with the following um, uh, included items for, for board action for a, for a financial investment that would include um, biological children, increase the wage to the Santa Clara uh, living wage, increase the cap to 300 hours, um, and increase the number of children to a total of six. And that would be a motion. Super, uh, Supervisor Chavez, um, I'd like to, to second that. Can you also add um, streamlining the reimbursement process? That yes. was part of oh our my goodness. List. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for catching that. Sure, very glad to second it. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, we have a few speakers on the item, so I'll take those speakers before I go back to the board. And I'm sorry. Uh, yes, please. Apologies. Um, did you also include increasing the the, um, the reimbursement rate the, to a living wage? Yes, I okay, did. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear that. No okay, problem. thank you very much. No problem at all. So we're gonna go to the public um, speakers on this item, and then I will come back to my colleagues. Thank you, so, Madam President. Our first speaker is Jackie Chapman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Your The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jackie Chapman. I've been a resource parent for 10 years in San Jose. I have three children at home. The two oldest are only three months apart, like twins. We use respite to be able to take each one individually to therapies and appointments, about one to two appointments each week. Having only one at a time at the appointment allowed me to get them and me to get the most out of the therapies. It also allowed for some one-on-one -on -one time for each child. Now we have a third child. I'd like to do the same for his appointments, but I can't currently use my respite for my now adopted two older kids. Resource parents, have been very clear on our needs and barriers to the current respite system. There is no need for a four month delay to study other counties who are only paying $3 an hour to care for high needs, trauma impacted children. Please hold the department accountable to the referral passed by the board on February 25th. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heather. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Hi, my name is Heather Wilhelm and I'm a resource parent. Please support the much needed respite improvements for resource families. As a single foster mom, um, respite is a necessity. Um, one scheduled vacation wiped out all of my respite at the start of the fiscal year last um, July, and I've been scrambling since. And the reimbursement rate is way too low. I am happy to hear that you as a board are proposing to move forward with improving um, respite. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maggie Cocaine. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Maggie Cocaine. I'm a resource parent in District 1, one out of 55 other resource families. I am also with the Social Worker Resource Parent Alliance. Many resource parents wanted to speak today, but the needs of the children and lack of respite prevent them from being here. Some have submitted a written comment and I hope you took the time to read it. If not, I encourage you to do so. I wanna point out that 126 resource parents out of 129 surveys support increasing the respite rate. I also wanna point out that only 264 out of 555 resource families currently have placements, which is less than half. I know that if I had more respite, I would take in more placements, including large sibling sets. The respite improvement is a win-win for the children, resource parents, the county, and overall community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Taylor. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, this is Katie Taylor, resource parent. 
in West San Jose for five years. Um, I just want to thank you for continuing to put respite on the agenda and, and um, so, as we've heard um, for the last several months, um, having a appropriate wage and appropriate hours and appropriate um, payment system is very much needed. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Louise Coben. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hi, I'm Louise Coben. And uh, thank you for listening to us resource families and being willing to help us take better care of our foster children. My husband and I uh, took our first foster child in August last year. Since we we're both self-employed, we decided to juggle our schedule so we wouldn't have to leave the baby in childcare. We thought after the rough start he had in life, it will be best to have a stable and calm home environment for his, uh, with consistent caregivers. From time to time, we have enlisted a trusted and very experienced neighbor with respite care. Uh, it was especially helpful during the pandemic as I can't bring the baby with me when we go to the grocery stores or other appointments. We pay our neighbor $18 an hour, which is actually below the going rate, but she's just being very kind. Um, so we end up paying $12 an hour out of our own pocket. It's been worth it to us as we know that our foster child is receiving the care he needs, especially in this time. Um, and she is also Spanish speaking, which we really appreciate. Uh, it would be. Our next speaker is Denise Marchu. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Denise Marshu, and I'm the Executive Director for CAFA. I've also been a resource foster family since, I think, 1989. So I've been here for a long time. Um, on behalf, though, of our almost 500 members through CAFA, I want to thank the Board for their continuing support, not only for the respite program, for, but for everything that we bring forward to the Board. Uh, President Chavez, you're advocacy and support is greatly appreciated. The respite program was established over 18 years ago and has been long neglected and needs to be changed. We appreciate you looking at this and making drastic changes that are long overdue. Not only does the hourly rate need to be looked at, but also the allocated hours. 200 hours can be used in three months, especially if you have special needs children with numerous doctor's appointments, therapy appointments, school IEPs and visits. The respite program is not used for rest and relaxation. It's often used for multiple children. So multiple children do not have to be taken to excessive appointments. Thank you again so much for looking at this program. I appreciate it. Our next speaker is Shannon Araujo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, my name is Shannon Araujo. I've been a foster parent for almost eight years. Respite is a vital resource for RFA homes. It is often what is needed to give resource families <clears throat> the, the encouragement they need to maintain effective and safe places for children to land. Our home, in our home, we use respite as a resource for doctor's appointments, therapy appointments, and occasional evenings with, for the kids to, for us to recharge. We have also provided respite for families in need. One resource parent needed a weekend respite for two young children due to having an older sibling with a particularly difficult behavior uh, issue. The respite allowed the sibling group to remain in the foster home until they were reunified with family, which happened rather quickly. Oftentimes, respite is what allows a resource parent the break they need to prevent giving a seven-day notice in a difficult situ situation. Please continue to support the resource families by making sure the respite program is officially updated through DFCS in a timely manner. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Pam Kenyon. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you for your support. My name is Pam Kenyon. My husband and I have fostered infants in San Jose since 2003. I was surprised to hear at last week's meeting that research on best practices would precede changes in the respite program. I'm also a registered nurse. I am a fan of best practice, but thought respite and fair compensation are already parent understood to be paramount to a respectful, healthy, and cost-effective foster care program. Best practice pragmatically includes fair compensation. I did some research myself and found that indeed there are studies and reports on best practice for respite programs. Respite is the second item on our county's list of support to recruit foster, uh, 
foster parents. It seems if retention of foster families were a priority of our social services agency, the department that oversees the welfare of our children, that this would have been researched long ago and continually updated. Thank you. Our next speaker is LGK40. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. This individual may not have a compatible device. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our final speaker on this item is Michael Jenkins. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much, President Chavez and Board of Supervisors. My name is Michael Jenkins, resource family uh, parent with a capacity of five. My husband and I also work full-time outside of the home, outside of the COVID crisis here, and we use respite or have the need for respite at several different times when we're taking a new placement, sometimes difficult children that may need some additional support as they're adjusting in our home that allows us to give them additional support. We also need respite that is available should we have any type of family emergencies where we're required to travel and we don't have the appropriate time to get the court's approval to travel with our foster children as well. Several different times that we've needed foster respite care. I've had to count on different backup programs through my employer that have been able to support us instead of leveraging respite in the way that it was created. Thank you so much for your support with us. Thank you. I'm going to thank all the public speakers. I'm going to bring this back to the board. Um, just to, um, Susan, you reminded me of something else we didn't include. So we're going to include, this includes biological children and adopted children, an increase in the the living wage to the Santa Clara County living wage of 24.56, an increase to the cap to 300 hours, an increase to the maximum number of children, and five to streamline payment. That's the motion on the floor with a second from Supervisor Elmberg, if you're comfortable with, I, I left out adopted children on accident. Is okay. there any, thank you. Is there any more discussion on the item? Supervisor Wasserman? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think for the record, I, I, I certainly understand what we're doing and, and trying to keep up and, and the dollar amount seems so low. I just think for the record, I need to say these, these dollars, I guess, come out of the general fund. I, I don't know where else they can come. And I know we're already predicting Dr. Smith could correct me around $250 million deficit. So I, I'm not sure, how, I'm not sure Supervisor Chavez, you know, we're, we're gonna approve this. And it's certainly something that I would like to see happen. I just don't know at what cost to something else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are decisions that we're all gonna face as we go into budget hearings but we don't have the money for what we have. And now we're adding on a very large expense and I don't know where the money's coming from. Mm -hmm. And what I would say, I think that's a fair point. And um, what I would just suggest is when this comes back to us and we can look at total cost and what the total utilization will be from the staff that we can have another discussion about it. The second thing I would say is that one of the hidden costs that the, the um, families brought up that's a little hard to quantify is that when there's a lot of tension in a household, um, sometimes it puts a resource family in a position of having to have a child go back and get replaced. And so what, what I would really want to better understand, and I think you probably heard me say that last week the staff um, signed a contract to take a look at the, the financial, um, all the money that we spend in this program, much the way we did under your leadership on housing, so that we could better understand what resources are available and how to categorize those resources. And I think one of the things that we would find is that if in fact, by making sure families have respite care, they're not um, giving up a child 
sooner than they they should, like giving it a, more of a fighting chance, which they would mostly like to do, I think it would help us, one, have less trauma to that child. But overall, the other point that they were raising is that they have a number of families right now that could take more children but aren't because they don't have access to the support they need. And again, in my mind, those are those are trade-offs from a cost perspective that I think are really worth the board understanding. So perhaps, um, so anyway, so I appreciate the point you raise and, you know, and I, I hope that staff can give some, give a little bit of thought to um, how respite may actually be a pro much more protective factor for children. But long-term when we do this study, Mike, I think we're going to understand whether or not it's a cost savings too. My guess is it is. I would also note that there is some state funding, Mike, um, and DFCS is currently re um, currently researching that. So we can uh, maybe add that to the request to, when it comes back, if that would be helpful to you um, and okay with the maker of the motion to note what uh, potential funding sources there are beyond the general fund. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Thank you both. I Again, I, I think the whole concept has merit. I just have to question how we're going to pay for it. And if there's offsetting costs, like we did with the um, providing uh, housing and services for homeless people, as you mentioned, President Chavez, that'll be great. I look forward to hearing some good news because I know this isn't a COVID reimbursable expense. Yeah, thank you. Fair point. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, Supervisor Cortez. I would just thank you for capturing uh, everything from the past discussion um, between you and the permanent amendments from Supervisor Ellenberg. I, I feel comfortable that everything was captured that needed to be uh, from the initial discussion. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we'll take a roll call vote. Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Supervisor Cortez? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Yes. President Chavez? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, what I would like to do is I'm, I wanted to give us a break between um, 1230 and one. And um, we have we could take one um, item now, and that would be item 18. And this would be the county executives report. And then we can go to a break. I'm trying to squeeze our last so I don't keep you here till midnight. Uh, Dr. Smith, would you like to make your report now? Sure, I'll be happy to, Madam President. Um, most of my report, I think I'll save till uh, the time we're talking about COVID, but I do wanna let the board know that um, our projected general um, fund and VMC deficit now has swollen to about $246 million. Um, so, um, we have a enormous problem. I don't think we've ever had that big of deficit in the history of the county. So um, I just wanna make sure that we're all aware of that. And uh, we will be giving the board more update about that plus the one-time uh, deficit, which is another 140 to $150 million. Um, and we'll be updating the board on the 26th. So uh, with that, I'll wait and, and uh, give my other comments during the COVID remarks. Thank you very much. Is there any um, public speakers on this item? I see none. Are there any comments from the board? Supervisor Simidian? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I wonder, if Dr. Smith, you gave us two different numbers. Could you repeat the numbers and I just want to make sure I understand uh, what the difference between the two numbers is in terms of what, what they cover or refer to, please. The first number is 246 million plus or minus a few million, and that's ongoing costs. So that's the cost of um, keeping operations going. And it's based primarily upon uh, the mismatch, the structural mismatch between um, labor costs and contract costs versus projected revenue. The second number is um, also um, about 146 million, and that's one-time costs. Um, that's 
basically the difference between projects and um, other one-time expenses versus uh, one-time revenue that we expect to receive. So total is, you know, significantly close to half a billion dollars. And uh, we try as best we can to utilize uh, one-time funds for one-time expenditures and ongoing for ongoing because uh, of the problem with using ongoing or one-time funds for ongoing, meaning that you're just kicking the can down the road. However, given that reality uh, that there's really no way we could cut 250 to $300 million out of the ongoing budget uh, without a crash landing, uh, our budget strategy this year, which you'll hear more about on the 26th, will by necessity require us to use some significant amount of one-time funds for ongoing expenses in order to prevent a crash landing. But there will be some hard decisions to be made about priority setting for the board because we can't fill the entire 250 to $300 million of ongoing deficit with uh, one-time funds. Thank you, that uh, helps clarify uh, the information. I wanted to make sure I had a clear understanding of the one-time versus ongoing uh, challenges. Thank you. Thank you. With that, if I have no other board comments, I am gonna go back to the public because I was a little bit quick on that and we'll take um, one public speaker and then we'll um, take a break. Thank you, Madam President. The speaker on this item is Roger McCarty. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. You, uh, the timer will start when you begin speaking. Mr. McCarty, are you there? They are not responding to requests for um, unmuting, Madam President. Okay, with that, we're gonna take a break. I will see you back here at one o'clock. Thank you, everybody.
testing, 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 testing. Okay, I'm going to flip back to you. Hi, Dr. Cody, we can hear you. Thank you. Hi, this is Sherry Terrell. We can hear you as well, Sherry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. And just to remind my colleagues um, who are listening, we're going to be starting with items um, 13. This is our time certain for one o'clock regarding COVID-19. So we'll take 1371 and then we'll take 14 and 15 together. We have just a couple more minutes. We'll let people start to, uh, I mean, people to continue to join on. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon again. And I and I forget, do we need to take roll call again? Yes. All right. So I'll ask the clerk to begin um, taking the roll again. Supervisor Allenberg? I'm here. Supervisor Submidian? Submidian here. Supervisor Cortez? Here. Vice President Wasserman? Here. <laughs> and President Chavez? I'm here too. Thank you very much. We're going to begin with item 13, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Smith. And I'm going to ask if Dr. Smith, if you wouldn't mind just outlining the um, uh, outlining the presentation today. Okay, thank you, Madam President. We um, have a number of presenters uh, ready for the board today. We're going to start off with um, Dr. Cody, who's going to give us an update on the uh, COVID uh, epidemic and its effect in our area and uh, some of the numbers and her thinking. Um, we um, then have a presentation from one of our VMC physicians, Dr. Uh, Wong, who uh, I will introduce uh, after Dr. Cody gets done. Um, he will talk mostly about the actual disease of COVID-19. Uh, he treats these patients in the ICU and <clears throat> he'll have a presentation about how the disease progresses and the problems with the disease because we felt it would be important for the board and the public <clears throat> to actually see what we're talking about. This is a very serious disease. We want to see a real doctor and what's involved with real patients. Then uh, we also have uh, Marty Finsterscheib, who is our immediate past uh, public health officer, and he has been tasked with uh, heading up our testing unit. Um, he's going to give a broad overview. Um, <clears throat> he doesn't. Um, he also has a presentation coming up on Thursday to Health and Hospital, which will be a much more uh, complex view, but uh, today we just asked him to give a broad overview. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> hopefully I don't have COVID. <clears throat> um, then for items 14 and 15, we'll have um, Greg Aturia, who will give you the budgetary updates. So with that, I would turn it over to Dr. Cody. Is Jeff Dr. Cody, we're having a Hi. difficult time. Okay, go ahead. Hi, this is uh, this is Dr. Sarah Cody. Can you hear me okay? Now we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I, as, as uh, Dr. Smith mentioned, I'm just going to give a brief overview of um, where we are um, and and what's next. So just to uh, ground us in the data as always. Um, as of today, in our county, we have 2,364 cases of COVID among our residents um, and 130 deaths. Our county now um, makes up just 4% of the cases in the state and 5% of the deaths. So um, uh, we are all watching our indicators very closely um, in, this, in this phase. And I wanted to just comment a little bit about how I think we're doing on our indicators um, and, uh, and also answer some questions that I know that many in our community have. And I just wanted to see if I could um, address them head on. So our indicators fall into a few buckets. One is around our healthcare system capacity. One is around looking at the um, morbidity or how many cases we have. And then the final is looking at our infrastructure for response in a more focused uh, containment strategy. So on the first set of indicators, which are around our healthcare system capacity, um, we are doing extraordinarily well. Um, our hospitals uh, develop capacity. We've been very successful in flattening the curve. Um, and, and we have plenty of capacity in our hospitals, both regular beds and ICU beds. 
and we're making significant headway on ensuring that healthcare providers are protected with um, with uh, personal protective equipment. That's not um, it's not complete, but it's, it's certainly coming along. When we uh, look um, at uh, our case counts, what we also see um, is quite encouraging. We are stabilizing. So we are not seeing an increase in case counts, but we're not really seeing a huge decrease either. Um, we're just in a, in a stable position where we're, not, where we're growing a little bit, but very, very, very slowly. Um, and so again, I think that that demonstrates um, what we have accomplished together through uh, sheltering in place since the middle of March, which has been quite a long time. But the final, uh, the, the final bucket, which is around our infrastructure to ensure that we can have a more fo focused containment, um, we are running as fast as we can. Um, we are building the infrastructure, um, but it's not quite finished. So if you think about us racing along a road, um, we are rapidly beginning uh, to build the guardrails uh, to keep us safe. Um, and they are, we're seeing good progress, but they're not yet built. Um, we're not we're not quite there. Um, so I want to just introduce another way of um, of thinking about this. Many of you listening to um, uh, leaders in other states and doing reading, I'm sure have have heard of a uh, reproduction number, which is essentially a number that indicates for every one case that we have, uh, how many new cases are produced. So a reproduction number of one means that every case produces another case. And that means that our epidemic here locally would be neither growing nor shrinking. The goal, of course, is to get an R naught, it's called, below one uh, to get it shrinking. And where we are right now is we've been holding pretty steady with an R naught of about one. Sometimes it dips a little bit below, but it's pretty much hanging out at one. So the idea here is that through more um, uh, as we ramp up our case and contact investigation and identify and interrupt individual chains of transmission, we should be able to drag that R naught below one and reduce cases. And that will give us a little bit of headroom or a little bit of money in the bank uh, to spend on loosening our uh, very strict uh, social distancing measures that we have in place. So again, we're looking to drag it below one, give us a little headroom and a little money to spend uh, and loosening things up. So the, the question that many are asking is, hey, you know, I look on the website, uh, it looks great. Things look great. Why aren't we reopening? And why is everyone else moving uh, when they don't look as good as we do? Uh, why can't we just go on to phase two uh, like the rest of California, and why can't we do it yesterday? Um, and and what I would say is that the conditions really haven't changed in our county. We don't have, you know, we don't suddenly have herd immunity. We don't suddenly have a vaccine. Uh, we have exactly the same conditions that we had um, in March. So that if we did ease up, we would see a, a brisk return of cases uh, hospitalizations and a brisk return of deaths to be quite blunt. So I want to acknowledge that we all want to reopen um, desperately for many, many, many reasons, um, but we need to do so in a safe manner. So um, our goal again is to uh, go slow to make sure that it's safe. There's another question that I get asked, which is, you know, COVID-19, it's mild. So, you know, what's, what's all the fuss? Why can't we just let people get infected? And the answer to that is that one, um, for many people, it's not mild. And I think we'll be hearing more about that in the next um, presentation. And equally important, um, there is no way to keep everyone who is vulnerable at home because people live in multi-generational households um, and there's really no way to take everyone who we're worried about and separate them from everyone else. Uh, we are really all in this together. Um, I think uh, another question that we're hearing a lot of is, um, 
how, how do we balance the health risks and the economic risks? And are we, uh, are we thinking about this in the right way to, to balance as well as we can? And I think that trying to choose between health and the economy is, is really a false choice because unless we make our community safer and reassure everyone that it really is safe and they and their family members uh, and customers are not at risk, um, I, I don't think that we're gonna see uh, a, um, the results that we'd like. And so the goal is to work as fast as we can again to get the guardrails in place to really make make it safer and to be able to uh, reassure ourselves uh, that we're that we're ready. I um, another uh, great concern is that when we look at our data, um, we see some worrisome trends that are similar to trends that are seen elsewhere in our state and in our country, and that is that this virus is disproportionately harming vulnerable communities, um, communities that are poor, communities that live in crowded conditions, and communities of color. And we see this in our county as well. We're seeing a disproportionate number of um, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in particular among our uh, Latinx community. And the only way, the only tool that we have at this moment to protect vulnerable communities is to bring down community transmission across the board. Um, and so that is absolutely the only way to protect vulnerable communities. And, and that is, uh, that's, what we, that's what we need to do. At the same time, we need to really lean in and get a better understanding of how we ensure that we're increasing um, testing and identifying people who are infected and enabling them to safely isolate um, and not infect uh, other members of their household uh, or community. So I think that I will uh, stop there and um, uh, turn it over to our next speaker for a little bit more in-depth look at COVID-19. So, oh, Madam President, <clears throat> let me <clears throat> introduce uh, Dr. Heng Duong. Um, he's uh, one of our intensivists who works at VMC. He was uh, awarded his doctorate from Case Western Reserve University, did his internal medicine residency at uh, UC San Francisco, and then his fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Chicago. He's received many awards in his professional career, and he's uh, authored scores of academic uh, articles that are in, published in peer review journals. So um, he really knows what he's talking about. And today he's going to give us a presentation to show what COVID's really like for the very sick individuals. Uh, Dr. Wong. Uh, hi, Dr. Smith. Thanks, thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, and I want to thank uh, President Chavez and the uh, members of the supervisors of the board uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about our clinical experience uh, uh, with COVID-19 here, especially in the ICU, which is what I'm going to talk about the most. Uh, and also thanks to Dr. Cody for her uh, nice updates. I think the most critical part of the problem, which is the sort of infection control on a, uh, you know, on a large uh, public health scale. Um, I guess, uh, should I share my screen? I wasn't sure whether I was going to have my slides advanced for me. Yeah, I think uh, we have them. Uh, and I'm happy to just control it from here as well, which whichever is. That is fine. If you would like to share your screen, we've given you permission. Okay, perfect. There it is. Okay, awesome. Come on. Uh, oh, it looks like someone else is controlling it. So, um, one, sorry, just make sure. Okay, uh, so uh, I just, uh, this title of my slide is just COVID-19. Originally, I, it was a little bit more colorful, COVID-19 at the county, but I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, the challenges in the care of patients with COVID-19 in the hospital, particularly in the ICU, because uh, I think that it's, it's one thing to hear about it sort of on the news, but I, I really wanted to give folks a flavor of uh, what patients deal with once they really get into the hospital and they're very sick. 
Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. So I, uh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so the goals for this presentation are uh, to review, well, I'll review the clinical presentation of COVID-19. I hope folks uh, uh, kind of understand at the end of it, at least the sort of basics of the approach to the treatment of COVID-19 patients, uh, especially those with respiratory failure, which is uh, what I'm gonna talk about the most. Um, and that they also understand how we as a hospital uh, here at Valley Med have had to um, coordinate uh, between services, the clinical care of these critically ill patients actually required a lot of people uh, to really kind of uh, step their game up in, in, in multiple aspects. Uh, and then lastly, I'll comment uh, briefly on some of the things that um, folks maybe have heard either on the news or, or other venues, some of the COVID-directed treatment strategies and what we've experienced here in the hospital and the strategies that are available uh, to us to help take care of our patients. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so to to kind of uh, touch upon something that Dr. Cody had talked about, about the severity of illness, I wanted to just sort of put COVID-19 uh, in, in, on a chart and kind of compare it to its, almost its peer uh, pandemic organisms. So uh, as you can see in this chart, what I've included here is uh, just the number of cases, the number of deaths, and then the, the case fatality rate. And for COVID-19 worldwide, there's been uh, just over 4 million cases reported, something around 286,000 deaths. And a, and a case fatality rate based on those numbers of about 6.8%. Now, uh, the real case fatality rate is probably lower uh, just because uh, testing uh, is believed to sort of uh, really lag behind the number of cases and the number of true cases may be uh, up to, you know, close to an order of magnitude, tenfold maybe as high uh, than the number of cases that have been reported. Now in the USA, you know, we have the unfortunate uh, designation of having the most cases uh, and there's been 1.4 million cases reported in the United States, about 81,000, almost 82,000 deaths. Uh, and that puts it at a case fatality rate of about 5.8%. And then just here in Santa Clara County, uh, there's been, uh, I guess my numbers are a little bit behind, uh, 2341 cases, uh, although I guess it's now up to 2360-ish. Uh, and just around 130 deaths. Uh, and that gives us a case fatality rate of about 5.5%. Even if we, you know, the, a lot of experts believe that the true case fatality rate is probably something close to 1%, but even 1% is actually quite high. So if we look at, for example, the H1N1 pandemic, which uh, in our lifetimes has been the pandemic that's uh, been the most severe next to COVID-19, uh, worldwide, there's a huge number of people who had it over the, the year or so that uh, it was um, uh, afflicting humanity, and about one and a half billion people contracted H1N1, 284,000 deaths, but that gives a case fatality rate of extremely low, 0.02%. And seasonal flu, um, you know, we often estimate to be also quite low around the 0.1 or even lower percent range. Uh, compared to uh, now, it seems sort of, uh, if you take a true case fatality rate of about 1%, uh, it, it, it maybe is uh, sort of less uh, uh, severe than SARS, which affected 8,000 people, and 10% uh, of whom died from it. But SARS was much more contained. It, wasn't, it didn't spread across uh, the world like wildfire the way COVID has. Um, and then comparing it to a generation or a couple generations ago, the Spanish flu in 1918, uh, an unbelievable 500 million people uh, were affected and uh, an approximate case fatality rate of 10%. So by any way you cut it compared to contemporary diseases that we know about that we know have really afflicted humankind, as well as comparing it to many severe diseases that we think about uh, from, uh, from history, COVID-19 is really, uh, it's a pretty severe disease. Now, it is true that most people uh, do okay and, and can kind of fight off their symptoms at home, but when the folks get sick, they get really sick. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, those uh, folks uh, you know, that we take care of here at Valley Med. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just um, much of this, probably most people already know, but I just wanted to briefly review how these folks kind of present to the hospital in the first place. So uh, most patients with COVID-19 present very similarly to patients who have influenza. So the three primary symptoms that folks report are fever, which is over 90% of people report that, uh, according to most of the literature, and then respiratory symptoms, whether that's a cough or shortness of breath, uh, and myalgias. And these three symptoms really predominate um, and certainly in the patients who get hospitalized, uh, they're, they're predominant symptoms. 
Uh, there's many other things that uh, patients have been reported to present with as well. Uh, similarly to influenza, it's a disease that has uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of a protein presentation can cause a lot of different problems, with a lot of different organs. So fatigue, anorexia, uh, diarrhea, there have been reported cases of people presenting primarily with diarrhea. And the anosmia, where people lose their sense of smell, that's actually pretty widely reported as, as, a, uh, as a sort of personal anecdote uh, that I've been given grants to share. My brother, who lives in New York City, actually got COVID. And his first symptom was he, he couldn't taste his food anymore. He's doing just fine now. But um, uh, anyways, that, I, I thought that was like, quite interesting. And then, you know, there's case reports of less common symptoms, uh, uh, headache, confusion, uh, uh, and then cold-like symptoms, rhinorrhea, sort of runny nose and sore throat. Uh, and then rare cases of uh, people coughing up blood, uh, and then uh, and vomiting. Now, most patients with the primary symptoms, fever, respiratory symptoms, myalgias, probably around 80% of them in, in somewhere in that neighborhood are able to kind of fight it off like you would if you had the flu, you just kind of stay at home and, and give yourself some symptomatic treatment. And, uh, you kind of are able to fight it off after a week or two. But uh, the patients who we see in the hospital get sicker. So they develop uh, uh, you know, sepsis, similar to like a bacterial or severe viral infection and organ failure. The most common, which by far, not only at our hospital, but you know, just, just about everywhere is they develop respiratory failure, some of which uh, when they get severe enough require intubation uh, and then the mechanical ventilators support them. Uh, many of these patients also develop shock, their blood pressure just plummets and requires medications to support. Uh, and um, as has been reported in the literature, there's, there's compared to other uh, diseases, there's a very high incidence of people developing blood clots in, in one place or another. And that is not unique to COVID-19. Actually, a lot of people during the H1N1 flu pandemic also develop blood clots and blood clots, small blood clots in the lung reported, but just the frequency of this is higher with COVID-19. Um, one of the challenging things, uh, you know, about its control is just that, you know, when pe because people can be asymptomatic. Now, uh, in reported literature, I think this comes out of Taiwan, uh, the time from an exposure to actually developing symptoms can be as long as, as two weeks, although um, the median time is about five days. So about half of folks will have symptoms by five days. And even by day 11, almost all patients, I, I think there's only a few stragglers from days 11 to 14, but 97 and a half percent of patients by day 11 end up having symptoms already. Um, the, the number of asymptomatic carriers, Dr. Cody can probably uh, attest to more, but there's I think it's not clearly known, and I think it's not exactly known how infectious, you know, we believe they can spread infection, but how infectious they are relative to people who are symptomatic is not uh, completely clear. Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, now patients present to the hospital, and really the thing that uh, gets them better for the most part is good supportive care. So as an outpatient where 80% or so of our patients are, they, you know, they get over it at home. But when they come to the hospital, the workflow kind of works as follows. They come to the emergency room. They are suspected or not suspected of having COVID-19. They get tested. While we're waiting for those tests to come back, the patients are under isolation. Now we have a, a rapid test so they can kind of get out of isolation faster. Uh, and most of the patients who come into the hospital come in for respiratory failure. So they're requiring supplemental oxygen therapy. Um, and many of these patients, if there's any doubt whatsoever, empirically, they get treated for regular sort of run-of-the-mill community-acquired pneumonia with, with antibiotics. Um, I would say that in our hospital, most, uh, you know, most of the patients end up not needing the ICU, uh, but uh, I think at any given time, at least over the last month, it's been somewhere between a third to a half of the patients who were in the hospital at any one given time, were in the, closer to a third, I would say. Uh, and, in these, and in the ICU, they have a lot, we have a lot more moves to help patients. So, we have device, a device called a high flow nasal cannula oxygen machine. And that can uh, basically deliver very, very high flows of oxygen that the normal nasal cannula oxygen that, that most folks on the hospital floors get. Um, it can deliver, this can deliver much more oxygen. Um, I'll get to in a moment kind of the challenges of that because we initially weren't using that. We were initially using uh, alternative therapies that we felt had a lower aerosolization risk, but um, since then have been moving more and more to high flow nasal cannula. The most severe respiratory illnesses uh, end up developing and proceeding to uh, intubation mechanical ventilation where they're on the breathing machine. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges is that many, when patients get 
uh, as m many of you have probably seen in either the news or read somewhere, once patients end up on mechanical ventilator, uh, they really linger on there. It can be very, very challenging to get them off of the mechanical ventilator. And I think that's more of an indication uh, of uh, just the severity of their illness. And it's just, uh, even, even despite our best efforts, kind of failing therapy. For many of these patients, we've had to resort to salvage therapies for refractory respiratory failure, where even on a mechanical ventilator, they become extremely difficult to oxygenate. Um, and uh, some of these things have, have been, for example, inhaled vasodilator therapy. Basically, you're trying to dilate the blood vessels of the lungs so you can get more blood flow to oxygenated areas of lung. Uh, and, then, and then a few new things that we've had to do that we haven't actually done before, uh, which, uh, next slide, please. So these patients have gotten uh, really sick and, uh, and because of the, the numbers and the degree of respiratory failure, uh, us in the MICU, as well as many of our colleagues in infectious disease and anesthesia uh, uh, and rheumatology and pharmacy, we've all had to kind of band together and everyone has had to step up their game uh, uh, you know, just from the medicine level, you know, notwithstanding all the ob obviously, which other people can speak more to the operational and logistical things that uh, the hospital system in the county itself has had to implement. But uh, just from a medical level, uh, we, you know, we created a dedicated COVID unit so that we could limit the spread of infections uh, uh, between patients and providers. And in, in general, much of the, um, I'll just mention that much of the challenges caring for COVID patients uh, is due to kind of the tension between, I would say, three things. One is um, a rapidly evolving literature uh, during which there's a lot of uncertainty about things like the transmission rate, the mode of transmission, uh, and, and uh, efficacy of treatments. So that's one. Uh, two is trying to limit the spread of infection amongst providers and patients. Um, uh, and then three is just the really the profound severity of illness of, of these patients. And so it's really I'm trying to manage these three things. These three principles have really got, uh, informed a lot of our decisions. So we create the COVID unit to minimize infectious spread, especially between patients providers. And then as the literature has evolved, we've worked with anesthesia and, and emergency departments and, and other uh, uh, divisions in the hospital to start moving towards high flow nasal cannula oxygen. This was both you know, a, a big effort in terms of reviewing the literature and speaking with our, our own colleagues at other institutions, Stanford, University of Chicago, University of Wisconsin, these are our main connections within the division of pulmonary medicine because this is where you know, we all trained and kind of reaching out to those places and uh, you know, getting their sort of best practices as well has really informed ours. Initially, there was a great fear regarding aerosolization with high flow nasal cannula and uh, patients were getting intubated much earlier. Um, we, we know now looking in retrospect that uh, the high flow nasal cannula actually with the proper precautions, such as a negative pressure room, the, the patient themselves wears a surgical mask, uh, we, we really, really reduce the, the, uh, the risk of, of, of any transmission. And if we can prevent patients from landing on the ventilator, that's a big positive. So we feel like this was evolving in real time. And I think that over time we delivered better care because of this, uh, because of adopting high flow nasal cannula early. Um, something that we've never done in the hospital before, but has become standard of practice in many institutions, is the initiation of proning for patients who really had really low oxygen levels, and even on a ventilator, you can't get them to oxygen at all. Uh, and uh, you know, at, at many academic centers throughout the country, this has already been used. This was used at University of Chicago, where I was before, quite commonly. But we hadn't done we hadn't done this at the county, and because when a patient is on the ventilator, there's actually a big sort of logistical thing. You ha they have to um, get nursing, respiratory therapy, anesthesia, as well as the, the uh, medical ICU staff uh, all together in order to safely turn a patient over onto their belly. Uh, but we actually proned uh, several patients now. Um, and uh, it, it, for me, it was a huge personal victory because I've been trying to get this uh, to, to happen for our uh, acute respiratory distress patients here. We finally started doing that. I think that was a great thing. Uh, and then we also reached back in time uh, to pull out the use of uh, these ventilators called percussive ventilators uh, for the patients with really, really severe disease. Uh, and uh, we haven't really used this with any sort of widespread uh, uh, frequency since the H1N1 pandemic. So it really required us to kind of dig deep into the literature, reach back into our own toolbox and, uh, and, and kind of uh, challenge ourselves to really be smarter uh, and to be flexible uh, in, in the care of our patients. And I think that, um, you know, I think that we rose to that challenge. Um, in additional, 
piece of it is, uh, I, you know, it's, it's one thing for just the attendings to sit down and read, but everyone has to be educated on uh, COVID-19 and so, um, and including attendings from different departments. So I started a lecture COVID series for my own division that we were doing every week during the height of the pandemic. And then in addition to that, we were having weekly grand rounds uh, with Stanford via Zoom on COVID-19 developments. And then uh, within our own uh, hospital, we were having weekly therapeutics uh, meetings, which was usually a joint uh, group meeting between ourselves, infectious disease, rheumatology, and pharmacy, as we were discussing the therapeutics uh, and in both the literature aspect of it, as well as the logistical aspects of what we could implement. And then of course, lastly, there's just a lot of coordination between uh, multiple departments within our own hospital, uh, particularly with us in hospital medicine about the workflow in case there was a surge of, um, uh, of COVID-19, which uh, thankfully we avoided. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, kind of touch on the treatment options, uh, many of which have been uh, widely reported in the news and elsewhere uh, and our experience with them. So the first I'll talk about is hydroxychloroquine. Um, this was uh, made famous by the president, but, uh, but even before that, it was actually uh, used in uh, China during the SARS pandemic or SARS epidemic there. Uh, when, uh, when a lot of patients were uh, really ill with SARS and the quality of data there uh, and the subsequent quality of data of uh, this drug in COVID-19 hasn't been very high. Uh, but early on as we were, you know, we were using this uh, and I, I would say uh, anecdotally, plural of anecdote is not data, but anecdotally, I, you know, I think many of us did not seem to find that it really had a significant effect on halting the progression of respiratory failure. But we did use it initially and we, it kind of fell out of favor, uh, particularly uh, as one, we weren't seeing significant improvement. And then second, some of the societies of cardiology had released statements, essentially sort of cautioning, not banning, but cautioning against uh, its use due to cardiovascular side effects. Um, some other medications that modify the immune system because COVID-19 causes this uh, immune dysregulation that some folks refer to as a cytokine storm uh, are really heavy immunosuppression agents like anakinin and tocilizumab. A handful of patients got these two uh, agents. I would say that the numbers, the, the jury's out on whether these are effective. I think the, the number of patients uh, that I got, it was pretty few here uh, and they all had really severe disease. So it's hard to tease out whether those were really working. I think we don't know. A handful of patients in, in our system also got convalescent plasma. Um, this is part of a national registry. So the plasma is actually distributed by Mayo Clinic, or I think they're the, the Mayo, I take that back, it's distributed by the Red Cross, but Mayo Clinic, I think, manages like a, uh, a national database on it. Uh, and uh, so a few patients have gotten that here with, uh, I would say, mixed, mixed results. Um, and then remdesivir, which is the newest kid on the block, uh, as uh, many folks may have heard of, remdesivir uh, is an antiviral. It was originally developed to treat Ebola uh, and uh, is being trialed in uh, now COVID-19. Um, to my knowledge, no one at Valley Med has actually gotten remdesivir. Uh, I think that from what I've just heard this morning that uh, the federal government controls the supply. California has just received uh, its uh, sort of uh, ration of it and will be distributing it uh, in, in some fashion that I do not, uh, am not privy to uh, among the different uh, areas of California. Uh, so no one here has gotten it. it. It may be promising. There was one study that was published in the Lancet recently in, in uh, severe COVID-19 patients. And unfortunately it was a negative study. It didn't really seem to show benefit, but there are ongoing studies uh, as well. Um, uh, and so the jury is, is out on that, but uh, we, I guess hopefully maybe getting it soon, but we haven't uh, administered it yet. Uh, the one medication that is uh, cheap and may be efficacious in, in selected cases of COVID-19 patients is steroids. And we've been using that a lot in the ICU. Um, and uh, just to kind of like close, uh, the you know we've had some great success stories. Some people who really feel like we um, sort of plucked from the jaws of death, uh, who were really really sick on the ventilator, and eventually were able to get better uh, and either come off or or at least get to a point where um, they could go to rehab and slowly get rehab their lungs. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's also been uh, really tragic seeing the patients who really just get sick and unfortunately pass away on the ventilator. Uh, there's been more than I, than I wish there were, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, we do the best we can. And I think that uh, with the coordination that our hospital and countywide we've shown, I think we've 
you know, done a, actually a really good job in limiting the spread of the disease and then giving the patients who have come here really ill the best care available. Um, I, next slide, please. And I just want to thank everyone again. Uh, that's all I've got today. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, can you stick around for questions after we get done with uh, the next presentation? Of course. So I think uh, Marty is uh, sitting with uh, Dr. Cody. Marty, can you give us a little update about your testing team? Oh, am I just talking? Yeah, Dr. Fensterscheid is right here. I'm here. Let me take down my mask. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Marty Fensterscheid, and this is my third day in the EOC. And I was brought back, uh, invited back to help mobilize some additional testing and to really attain a goal by the end of the month of 4,000 tests. And um, what we are going to present, we're going to have a, a, um, a comprehensive presentation at Health and Hospital on Thursday, but um, we've been very active. We formed a new group of, of people to strategize this, to look and see where we are now. Um, we know where we need to get, and we're and we're now strategizing as far as how we get there. Uh, we're looking at uh, a number of things, uh, which I will talk a lot about on Thursday as far as our testing capacities, where we're testing, um, some new strategies, uh, some additional guidance that will be coming out. And I, I'm very excited about it, and, I, and I'm very optimistic, as well as the people that I'm working with who are, who are great people. Um, we're very optimistic that we can attain this goal. Um, it's going to take a community-wide effort, but um, that seems to be uh, that seems to be where we're going. And I think many, many people are on board with us. But we have a lot of work to do, um, and it's it'll it'll be reported on on Thursday. So um, stay tuned. All right. Thanks, Marty. I guess we're open for questions at this point, Supervisor Chavez. So. Um Jeff, in your earlier comments, you also said you were going to have Greg say a few words, you, but not, not today. Oh no, I thought maybe uh, he would speak after you okay. had your after question. You okay. So what I would like to do is um, I'm going to ask if it's okay with my colleagues that we institute the the 15 minute rule. We'll happy to come back if people have more questions in those 15 minutes. I do want to say a very special thank you. Um, to Dr. Duong, I learned a great deal and I appreciate that presentation very much. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with Supervisor Corteski and go to Supervisor Ellenberg, then Simidian, and then uh, Mike Wasserman. And I'll ask you to keep your own time as you did last last week to keep me honest. Mr. Chavez, on this medical portion, I don't have any questions. It was all very uh, explanatory for me. Um, a good presentation and uh, I have some questions that I think are more pertinent to later presentations. Thank you. For the budget, the budget's the only presentation we have, we haven't had yet. In this, in this, um, under this item. Yes. Okay. Um, my, I, actually, my, my main concern is um, with regard to reporting. So it isn't. Again, it's, it's not pertinent directly to the doctor's presentation or even, I guess it's pertinent to the overview that we got at the beginning, but. That's okay. If you want to go ahead and ask those now. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things I'd asked for um, going back a couple of meetings was um, a bi, uh, bi-weekly dashboard on, uh, from the coroner's examiner's, coroner examiner's office on overall death rate. And I know I guess somewhat pertinent to the doctor's presentation, he was talking about, um, you know, the percentages of death um, attributed to COVID and uh, sort of how that compares to past uh, pandemics and so forth. Um, we, on our dashboard, unless it's just been changed this morning, main public health dashboard, those numbers are still not being reported. Those numbers being um, what the overall um, coroner's um, death rate or morbid morbidity information 
is we did get a dashboard once after my request and we just haven't received one to my knowledge again. Um, it's, I, uh, it's on its way. I just uh, got a note from uh, the coroner that she's finishing up some of the details. So it should be here this week. Yes, and I'd like in future reports for at least, you know, some mention or reference to that. It may not, it may not be conclusive. It may not be, I think it's relevant information regardless of what conclusions we can draw from it right now. Um, it's information that needs to be surfaced and, you know, especially given everything else that we've heard in terms of you know, our inability still um, here and across the nation to to directly tie um, consequences of, of illness uh, or even illness itself um, in any kind of 100% certainty to to the virus uh, given um, you know given the, the relatively anemic levels of testing still uh, relative to what our own goals are here and in the state so you know <laughs> it's been reported a couple times and it's compelling to me it, you know, uh, by, you know, journalists and others and, and national publications that, you know, we, we, may, we may need to keep counting the dead. It's a very grim way to say it um, as, you know, one of our, our best indicators as to, um, you know, the, the consequences and ravages of the, of the virus. I don't know if that's appropriate to, uh, you know, to ask uh, Dr. Young that question as to whether or not he has an opinion on that, given the statistics and numbers and historical perspective that he showed before. I'm more than happy to have a response from him if he wants to provide that. But uh, um, Dr. Smith, that, that's why I'm emphasizing it. And um, I just think we're out of context when we talk about um, deaths that are attributed to COVID with certainty without looking at what our overall death rate is, especially relative to um, historic numbers in this county. So I appreciate uh, you know, your ability to stay on top of that and you know, have the coroner provide that information. And I would appreciate it even more if it could just be folded into the, into the, um, the dashboard numbers. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, just to sum that up, you're asking for Dr. Jordan to be and her reports to be included in the regular updates to the full board, Dave? Yes, I'm asking for the daily dashboard to be on time, which is supposed to be bi-weekly per request and I think prior understanding. Two, that the, the regular reports here, um, yes, as you okay. just said, would automatically include that information. And three, as that information is forthcoming from the coroner examiner, that it be folded into or included in the uh, public health department website dashboard so that people who don't have an opportunity to watch these meetings, but do have an opportunity uh, or are directed to the website for information can, can easily obtain that information and, and you know, get that context. So, Got it. Bi by weekly report, report included, and then on the public health website. Thank you, Dave. Susan? Thank you. I have uh, one question for the doctor and the remainder uh, for Dr. Cody. Uh, Dr. Huang, what, what percentage of people who contract symptomatic COVID wind up in the ICU? Uh, hi, Supervisor Umberg. Sorry about that. I was uh, having technical difficulties. Uh, so the I would say the uh, from our county or from uh, like global data. Global data I can't comment on. Uh, I would say that a, a third of the, so about 80% of patients who get it are able to stay home. A fifth end up seeking care in the hospital. And at Valley, I would say about a third of the folks who end up in the, uh, in the hospital end up in the ICU. So- uh, I'm sorry, so of the, it's about a third of the, it's so about 30% of the 20%? Correct. Yeah. So about 30% of the 20%. Yeah. So about, you know, six ish percent, six, seven percent. Six or seven percent of people who contract COVID will end up in the ICU. Uh, 
I would say that that's of known cases. The true rate is sure. probably quite a bit less, yeah. Yes, the, the, the true percentage is probably lower. And the yeah. majority of those people of that six or, le or smaller percentage um, ha uh, um, come from what, uh, could, let me ask that in a better way. Can you make a generalization about that 6% or fewer of folks who end up in the ICU? Uh, do they tend to be in greater number um, older, uh, have specific pre-existing conditions? Yeah, great question. So they kind of uh, similarly to the national uh, trends, they do tend to be older and many of them have, uh, you know, I think related to being a little bit older, they have chronic conditions, hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would say hypertension, diabetes uh, are, are probably two of the big ones. We've seen that here as well. Uh, that said, we've had a, a pretty big range of you know, patients in terms of an age range uh, that spans even uh, uh, people in their 30s uh, end mm -hmm. up in the ICU. So um, it, it's difficult to know who will get really sick. Uh, the patients who tend to get really sick and who don't get better do tend to be older. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Cody uh, now. Um, I wanna thank and appreciate the staff for the report that, that was submitted, uh, but I'm also gonna note that I'm, I'm a little bit sorry that today's report didn't include a more specific update on the five indicators. Uh, I'm gonna ask about them nonetheless, because this is what the public needs to know, how close we are to closing the gaps to meeting those targets and what resources are needed to get us there so that we can reopen our economy as soon as safely possible. And certainly if we expect people to continue to shelter in place, we need to be transparent in showing that we are working as hard as possible to stand up the capacity to safely reopen. Uh, last week I asked about any need to revise our order to align with the governor's phases of reopening and now criteria for those phases. Uh, Dr. Cody, are there components that uh, you are planning to modify in the current local order, currently based on, on the governor's new uh, reports? Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, what we're doing is looking at the indicators across our counties in the Bay Area, um, uh, looking at those of course, not exclusively. We're trying to get a, of course, a holistic sense of um, of safety and risk across the region. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier in my comments, in addition, um, in addition to the indicators, looking at our hospital capacity, you know, case and hospital counts, as well as our our infrastructure, um, which I, I think of as our guardrails. Um, we're also looking at this are, are not or understanding whether the epidemic is um, increasing or decreasing. And from what we understand, our epidemic is, is neither increasing nor decreasing, it's just staying about steady, which means that if we um, peel back, uh, we're going to see an increase. And even a small increase in the R naught, like if you go up to 1.1 or 1.2, and if you assume that the case, you know, the the median time between when you get exposed and when you get sick is about five days, then you could say, well, one case five days later is going to produce 1.3 cases, and those 1.3 cases five days later, et cetera, and you can see that that your counts will begin to grow. So it's um, really important uh, that we keep our R naught below one with our case in contact. And then that gives us a little room um, to, to ease, which we, of course, badly, badly want to do. So I, I didn't hear in there whether you are currently planning to make any changes based specifically on the governor's new orders. So what, what our plan is, is of course, we can't get out ahead of the governor's order. Um, sure. And so we can we can look at the governor's order. We can look at our own um, epidemiology, and then we can see whether for our own community um, is can we advance um, towards where the state order is, right? So can we take can we uh, can we take those steps um, without 
increasing the risk, particularly the risk to vulnerable communities. Right. So what is the answer to that question? So we're so the answer to that question is um, we're we're as of now we're we're not uh, because Thank you. <laughs> we look at our, we look at our indicators and we're not there yet. Got it. Okay, that's what I was uh, what I was getting at. Um, how are we? Um, and this is a, a question for you, but but really a communication question. How are we helping the public understand the difference in our order? the state order and some local acceleration into what's called late phase two. How are we helping the public understand the difference between our order and the state order? Right. Um, well, we, uh, we are doing everything we can through our communications group to, um, to get the word out. Um, we're, you know, getting, um, relying on our local, you know, you all to help get the word out. And if there's anything that we can do, or if you see that there's um, issues that it's not clear to the public, um, we'll, we'll endeavor to um, be more clear and, and do better on that. Thank you so much. We do get many, many constituent questions um, every day. Um, I am definitely not a communications expert, but wonder if there isn't some sort of chart or graphic that we might uh, that folks who can do this sort of thing can create um, to outline the differences. Um, I'm at least hearing that it, that it is a source of confusion. Uh, I'm going to move on. The indicators on PPE contact tracing and testing uh, we know have not been met yet. I'm going to save my in-depth questions on testing for Thursday, but I will want to hear specific plans and protocols at that meeting for how we are taking testing in specifically into settings and populations that are at a higher risk. Uh, with regard to PPE, how many of our 11 local hospitals have met the criteria for the 30-day supply? Um, Supervisor, I don't have that information right offhand, but we can provide that. I, I just I can, don't have that with me. I can jump in on that. Perfect, thank uh, you. We. Um, asked all of the hospital and health systems to self-certify about PPE. And as of now, they're all saying that they have sufficient PPE, although they haven't specifically committed to 30 days worth, but they've all told us, all 11 hospitals, that they have sufficient PPE. So in that sense, that indicator is we're doing well. That's fantastic. I mean, that, that's a big thing to announce if we now have met three indicators, whereas last week we were at two. Um, what proportion of the um, skilled nursing facilities meet the PPE uh, criteria for, I think their criteria is a 14-day supply? They're not doing so well. They're not doing as well. I don't have the proportion right off the top of my head, but they have not all. <clears throat> certified because, um, how do I say this nicely? Uh, some of them ignored our request. <laughs> so do we they're have not. A plan? Do I'm we have sorry? A plan? sorry, do we have a plan to help them all get to that 14 day supply? Yes, we're, we're communicating individually with them to try to get the information about what they need and <clears throat> supply them through the EOC with what they need. Okay, so that's why I don't have the exact numbers. It'll be a one-to-one -one communication. Okay. If you can send us uh, that off agenda, uh, that's fine. Uh, you'll probably be the, the best one to answer this too, uh, Dr. Smith. Last week, gowns and regular size N95 masks were cited as particular areas of need. Have we taken specific steps um, in the last week locally uh, or anywhere else to obtain those supplies? Yes, we've gotten commitments from the state and we've also um, got purchase orders to purchase them um, from, from vendors. Uh, we currently have enough uh, right, right this second, but uh, we're looking at not only waiting for them, but also the possibility for the gowns of reuse. That's a big issue. And, won't be done quickly because um, they're not designed to be reused. 
-hmm. but there are protocols that have been established by the CDC to allow for them to be sterilized and reused, which is not an easy thing to do, particularly because it involves lots of individual concerns from the uh, employees. So we're looking into that, but I don't think that'll happen anytime soon. But we, we do have promises from the state that they'll send more, um, more uh, yeah, N95s. And 95 masks. Okay, I'm uh, gonna move to contact tracing. Uh, at the last meeting, a staffing plan for contact, contact tracing was submitted that includes managers, data support teams, clinical advisors, and contact tracers. Which of these positions will be new county hires to manage teams or fulfill spe uh, specialized roles? So what I can tell you is that what we're asking the contractor to do is to manage um, all of the hiring and onboarding. And as you know, it, to, to bring a staff up to uh, a thousand, that's the staff that's um, over twice the size right. of the public health department. Um, so this will be done in a stepwise fashion. Uh, some of them will be county employees. Some will be uh, employees from uh, cities, um, community-based organizations and other volunteers and it will be the job of the contractor uh, to help us um, uh, vet um, staff to make sure that their skill sets match uh, what's needed. Mm -hmm. And also so that, that we keep the staffing, you know, a few steps ahead of what we need to successfully investigate cases and trace contacts. Thank you. Um, I'm down to about three and a half minutes. I'm not sure I'm going to uh, get through all, um, but let me ask just a couple other uh, questions about uh, contact tracing. And, and um, if we don't have the answers now, it, it's fine to get them off agenda. Um, would like to know for other contact tracing roles, uh, whether the county has yet identified how many staff of our current staff will be redeployed to support this work. Well, I can tell you that in the public health department, um, pretty much all of the public health nurses have been redeployed um, or at least rotating through uh, to support the work and to ensure that we that we go as fast as we can. Um, I can't give you a good sense about redeployment of staff at this point from other parts of the county, but I know that that is part of the strategy. I, I don't have um, you know precise precise numbers, but of course, um, one of the concerns is that this is something that we, we need a plan that's sustainable um, if we're going to be able to safely reopen um, and keep up with this work. Mm -hmm. This work is going to continue for six, 12 months at the least, uh, probably longer. Yeah, thank you. Um, have, this, have our CBO partners been engaged yet by the EOC to support uh, this deployment of staff for contact tracing? and or uh, to engage in linking cases um, or contacts to supportive services like food, housing, or childcare? I think we're further along in part one um, because we have this general email address and sort of a way to do intake. And I think we've been uh, getting the word out um, uh, so that, that folks can, can present themselves and say that they're interested in participating in case and contact tracing. Mm -hmm. I think the next, um, which is, you know, incredibly important, which is ensuring that people can safely isolate or quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, we're not as far along uh, on that, um, but we are working on it. Terrific. Um, I'm actually going to make it 112. I just want to have a uh, make a concluding uh, comment. Assuming uh, support of my my colleagues on item 71 later today, I look forward to seeing uh, a more complete plan on contact uh, tracing, staffing, the roles of the various partners, and a budget to come to the board as soon as possible and certainly in time to inform our budget process for this year. Thank you so much, Dr. Cody. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Supervisor Samidia? Did you have any comments on this section? Uh, it, 
Uh, um, yes, forgive me. Uh, I'm not sure to whom the question should be directed. Uh, so let me go to Dr. Smith and let him uh, parse it out if he wishes. Uh, I, uh, I have a, an increasing concern about the public's uh, willingness to accept the directives in the public health order. And I want to be clear, it's not because I disagree with the public health order. I, I think uh, the public health department, Dr. Cody in particular, have done a, uh, an admirable job of articulating um, the public health risks and identifying the steps necessary to address those risks. But um, with every passing day, we see a little bit more impatience. We see a little bit more frustration. We see uh, a little stronger push to uh, get back uh, to business as usual. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if either our public health department or Dr. Smith on the operations side, people have sort of thought through how to address that waning support. Uh, I, I want to be clear, I, I, you know, this is not a question of simply listening to the loudest or mo, mo, more, most vociferous voices in the community. You know, certainly state polling continues to indicate that, you know, 70 plus percent of folks support the continuation of the stay in place order uh, to the extent it's deemed necessary as a matter of public health. But this is not a situation where you know, 10, 20, 30 percent non-acceptance uh, is going to work for us. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that I've sort of noted in Dr. Cody's presentations is that, you know, if we have 10, 20, 30 percent of the folks who are out there uh, not in compliance um, by, by virtue of their um, waning confidence in the directives, we're gonna have a problem on our hands. So I understand that this is far more complex than simply a matter of identifying uh, best practices as a public health matter. But Dr. Smith, I would um, like to hear your thoughts and the thoughts of anyone else on the team, including Dr. Cody, if she'd like to weigh in, of course, uh, on sort of how we address that. Because uh, I think it's a, um, it's a matter that's gonna be upon us uh, in very short order. Well, thank you, Supervisor. Um, you're right, this is really an operational question. I don't really see it as a public health um, department uh, issue because they're, they've got their hands full to actually trying to do the work. I think uh, we've been rethinking how we're doing public communication through the EOC and um, trying to find uh, alternate media to explain the issues. Um, you're right, the only tool we have to um, encourage people to comply is the trust of the organization and the trust in the organization. So um, we're trying to have a consistent message and look at other alternative ways of communicating, uh, doing town halls, uh, uh, advertisements in newspapers, uh, billboards, uh, op-ed pieces, and the like. Um, and, you know, I think this is an area where the help of the board would be critically important because obviously the community sees you, elected you, listens to you, respects you, and uh, hearing from the elected officials, uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, about the importance of this issue and how important it is to the community is, is going to be a whole lot more critical than hearing from me or anybody in the PIO's department. Um, but it is gonna be something that just statistically, we expect to have pushback on. Uh, people get tired of, uh, they're, the shelter in place behavior, we know it's gonna weaken a little bit. Um, 
And we also know that there's another spike coming. And we know that the states around us, some of the states around us, some of the regions around us, LA, and uh, on a national basis, they're opening too soon. This morning, Dr. Fauci on uh, his presentation to Congress made it clear that he thought some of the states were moving too fast and that too fast will cause more outbreaks. So um, communication, 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 trust, trust, trust. That's basically our strategy. Yeah, I think the one of the challenges we're facing, and you know, I wish I had a quick and easy answer for it, I don't, is the lack of uh, consistency in uh, the messages people are receiving from different levels of government. And that's not a criticism of anyone, but to Supervisor Ellenberg's points earlier, I don't think we can be surprised that people are confused if they hear one thing at the city level, another thing at the county level, another thing at the state level, and something altogether different at the federal level. And even at the federal level, if there are competing or conflicting voices, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for people to process that set of mixed messages, I think, and walk away feeling like they have both clarity and confidence. So I, I just want to ask that you and your communications team who I think, by the way, have done some great work. Uh, but I think this is an, uh, an added challenge, which is there, there's going to be, I think, I think the communication team needs to be mindful of the fact, all right, people are getting multiple messages uh, and that are sometimes conflicting or at least inconsistent. How do we then speak with clarity and consistency and, and cut through um, that, that set of mixed messages? I'll just... Um, uh, I'll, uh, which takes me to the next question, Dr. Smith, which is, you know, I think, um, I think it's tougher for the public to accept the, the public health orders if they see this as a binary yes, no choice, by which I mean, I think um, as, as challenging as it may be, and I know compliance is always a challenge, uh, we, we need to be thinking about um, communicating. We can take the next step as long as people engage in the following behaviors, uh, if this industry or that industry is going to open. I know that uh, when there was some liberalization of the order uh, most recently, it was contingent on certain behaviors and presumably the public health uh, officer felt you know, at some point people are going to be walking out the door, going back to their lives. Let's figure out how to make that happen in a way that is as safe as possible, understanding that none of it is going to be perfect. Um, so I, I guess the question I have for you and, and knowing the work we're doing with our consultancy, uh, IEM, but is, you know, are we looking at various sectors that, that um, are anxious to re-engage and they're asking ourselves, how might that be permitted in a way that is safe and consistent with public health? And I'll stop there and see if you have some thoughts. Well, um, probably most of this goes back to Sarah. I will just say that uh, during her discussion, she mentioned the concept of the R not and whether that will give us a measure of help in deciding whether we have some headroom to loosen up restrictions if the um, um, if the numbers go down. So I think she'll consider that, but let her speak for herself. Uh, Sarah? Yeah. I'll just share some of my thoughts about this and, and uh, Supervisor Simidian, it, it's, um, it certainly isn't a yes, no. It's, um, you know, myriad, uh, very complicated trade-offs, um, none of them particularly attractive. Uh, and so I just, you know, at the top level, and I, and I did talk about this before, but I really want to emphasize it. For the most vulnerable communities in our county, 
the only way to ensure that we protect them and, and, and prevent death is to bring down the level of community transmission to as low as it can be. That's, that's, that's the one way we have to protect the most vulnerable communities and to try to lessen the disparities that we're seeing. So that's, that's number one. And number two is that as we do everything we can to get our, our not below one, and, um, and we certainly understand that there's incredible, incredible fatigue and frustration by many with sheltering in place. Um, but that in, in a way, th those are sort of like little withdrawals on our bank accounts. And what we're trying to do is, um, is put in, is, is get some more deposits in there so we have a little headroom so that then we can collectively figure out uh, where would we like to make our withdrawal, what would we like to open up, and um, how can we do so in the safest manner possible. And you're absolutely right that as sectors um, open up, there need, there need to be, um, we need to understand how can we do it the most safely? Um, where do we have an evidence base that, um, that this practice or that practice uh, will be protective? And, and also we have to factor in how, um, how likely is it that, that we'll uh, be able to see compliance and sustain compliance? And all of that, you know, a lot of that is just unknown, and and um, and uh, we we you know we have to we have to take our best guess. So it's um, I, I really think that there's just many 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 um, interacting variables, and so on our on our part, we're doing everything that we can um, to scale up testing, case and contact tracing, to create a little bit more um, headroom to complement all of the. Uh, gains that we've made through shelter in place um, and to keep them there uh, so that we can create safety all around um, and um, begin and begin to ease up. Let me just offer a few observations for Dr. Sure. I also just want to be mindful you have a couple minutes because I did put us all in 15 minute time frames. Thank you. Let me use it then. Uh, forgive me, That's but um, the I want to say the same thing three times in three different ways uh, to Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody. Being right won't matter if we aren't persuasive. So uh, it's not, as I say, that I take issue with the underlying arguments here. It's that as we see from the surrounding community and the comments we get, there the, the fact that someone is making it scientifically or um, uh, medically correct assessment, um, you know, won't help us solve the problem if there isn't acceptance of that judgment. And I couldn't agree more that bringing down community transmission is job one, but that again depends on the acceptance of the community. And um, colleagues have heard me say before in other instances, you know, feelings are facts. Uh, the, if folks feel this way, uh, meaning skeptical of the uh, advice that they're getting or the orders that are given, um, the fact that they may be objectively incorrect is, is all well and good, but the fact that people feel a certain way and act on those feelings uh, that's a fact that has consequences that we have to step up to. So I just, I want to continue to encourage Dr. Smith on the operation side and Dr. Cody on the health side to find the intersection between keeping our population uh, healthy and safe, which is job one, no argument, uh, and also finding a way to communicate a path forward, not just identify and develop that path forward, but finding a way to communicate it that builds trust rather than skepticism. Uh, in the remaining 15 seconds I have, Madam Chair, I'll simply indicate that my comments and questions about testing uh, will be reserved for the meeting on uh, Thursday and very much appreciate the chance to have that discussion there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Wasserman. Getting my face up there, start video. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, doctors, for your presentation today. And I'm going to start my clock here.
So I don't already see started it. The big shepherd's hook coming out. Okay, I've got a, a bunch of comments and questions, so I'll make them uh, quick and brief. First and foremost, I want to say, while I appreciate the planning being done at the world level, the national level, the state level, and the county level, we've never experienced a virus like this before. It may never go away. There may not be a cure, or something may come up six months from now. I, I don't wish, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm always eternally optimistic. I like the way that we're planning. Um, some of the concerns, some of the thoughts that I have. Um, for instance, one of my uh, fellow supervisors mentioned 70% people feel this way, okay with the shelter in place, 30 not. I can tell you in the first 30 seconds when I talk to someone, if that person is currently allowed to be out and working and earning their full paycheck, or if that person is at home on unemployment, or if that person is retired and collecting a pension and social security. And the people who are okay with this for the most part, or pro opposed to this for the most part, it hinges on their economic status. If they're receiving their check at home, let's say working at home for a high tech company, working at home, they're pretty much okay. They can go for a run and a bike ride and they're out and about and they're being paid. Somebody else getting unemployment and it might be one fourth, one fifth of what they normally earn and have the same mortgage or rent to pay are not happy. So there, there is no easy answer here. Um, we're in a very, very, very tough situation. Um, I did want to mention to the doctor that opened up the presentation and was talking about the H1N1, H2N2, H3N2, and our COVID now. One of the things I found interesting, doctor, about that comparison is also comparing the populations. The populations back at the Spanish flu time was 1.8 billion. And although 50 million people died, that was 0 0.03 of our population. Currently, our population is 8 billion, and we're at a thousand times less than that. And I know the number is going to get bigger, and I have no desire to make the top 10 list on that at all. But when we compare with prior viral, respiratory, airborne infections, I think we also have to include the population at the time. Um, as far as populations go, I've noted that in the world, the current death to case rate is 6.7%. In the United States, it's 6%. In Santa Clara, 5.5%. And California, 4 So we're on the lower end of that, which is good. But yes, these, these numbers are so big. One thing I'll reiterate each and every time I have the opportunity to do so is the more people we test, the more positives we will get. So if the county or the state has a requirement that says our number of positives must not increase or must in fact decrease over a two week period of time, that is not going to happen for the foreseeable future as we continue to test more and more people. The more people you test, the more positive results you'll get. The only way to have zero positives is to test no one. So it's, it's a situation that I hope is reviewed by the public health officers throughout the state and by our state public health officer, Sonia Angel. We need to get rid of that requirement, in my opinion, of the number of positives decreasing over a two week period because we are increasing the amount of testing we're doing. So we're going to get more positives. I have been asked, um, people have told me, several people have told me, and if we have Dr. Jordan on, she could probably clarify, but they say the average number of deaths in Santa Clara County is between nine and 10,000. Something like 25 to 27 people a day die in Santa Clara County from all kinds of different illnesses. And since COVID has begun, we've had one to two people die in Santa Clara County. I hope that number does not get bigger. I hope that number goes lower, but certainly that numerical comparison brings things into perspective for me. A comment that was made earlier talked about Santa Clara County having 5% of the deaths in California. Ironically, we also have 5% of the population in California. So we're kind of right there. I'm noticing the more urban areas, especially in Los Angeles, 
have a much higher percentage. The more rural areas have far lower percentage. But it is interesting that while we have 5% of the deaths in California, we also have 5% of the population. The, oh, there's a, a rate on the county's dashboard that takes the number of people testing positive out of the number of people being tested. And for the first month or so, it was just right around 10%. We started testing a few more people that dropped into the nines. And in the last week, I've been doing the numbers with the number of people we've tested and the number of people that have turned out positive. They've been ranging between one and 2%, which is really encouraging on the one hand, but as Supervisor Simidian would say, on the other hand, I know why that number is dropping. In fact, our overall number on our dashboard is now down to 5.7%. And that's because the last couple of weeks, our testing positives have been in the 1% to 2% range. Again, the more people we test, the lower that rate will go. Initially, the people we tested were the ones who were referred with symptoms. Then we added in public safety and public health people who didn't have symptoms. So that 10.10% number dropped down to nine or eight. Now we're testing more and more people. We're down to 5.7. But in the reality, it's only one or 2% the last couple of weeks. I want to close, and I know I probably have half my time if I had to guess, Supervisor. Yeah, I've got half my time going. Um, I want to close by saying I really would like us to reopen, as Dr. Cody and Dr. Smith and all my peers have said, as soon as possible. But on the one hand, when we reopen, there's going to be many, many more people catching the virus. There's going to be a percentage of them going to the hospital. There's going to be a percentage of them that die. On the other hand, people, they send me numbers such as the number of people that die compared to unemployed. That's a different kind of economic crisis. And there is no easy answer. We can't shelter in place everyone and wait for this virus for a, a vaccine to come out that cures the virus. That may never happen. We can't all go back to work because then the infection and the surge is going to happen again. So what my suggestion is to throw out there and to go into your suggestion box as I did before is as you reopen other professions and allow other people to go back to work. And again, even though we're receiving the PUA, the pandemic unemployment assistance fund and the cares fund and the PPP fund, those people are getting fractions of what they earned before and their expenses are still the same. So they're not able to buy all that they need to buy if that's utilities, food, rent, whatever, it, mortgage, whatever it may be. And the people dependent on those individuals who are sheltering in place for them to take their income and go spend it as a consumer, they're dependent. It's a huge trickle or ripple or whatever analogy you want to use effect that really concerns me. So I hope, because I do not want us to shelter in place until there's a cure, because there may never be a cure. And I need us to reopen. And when we reopen, I want us to reopen with everyone wearing masks, maintaining the distance whenever possible, limiting the number of people in any space at any one time. But I also want the long-term care facilities that we have operating that currently represent 40% of the deaths in Santa Clara County. I want the quarantine-like effects that we currently have in place to stay in place because that particular population is way more vulnerable to this virus than everybody else who's getting it. 40% of the people that have died have been connected in one way or another to those facilities. We need to protect those facilities with everything we got. And I hope in the meantime, we allow people to get back to work and social pressure, hopefully, will force people to do the right thing. Washing their hands, as Dr. Cody has said from the very beginning. 
If you feel any illness, take your temperature, go to the doctor, stay at home. We need to battle this virus that's all around us, that we can't see, that we don't know is going away. And even if Santa Clara County gets itself down to zero for a, for a week or two, somebody else from another county or flies in on an airplane from another country could have the virus and infect people and it start all over again. There's people that have got it and have survived and have antibodies, which may or may not prevent them from getting it again. And there's people that have never got it yet. And until there's a cure, they can get it. But we cannot hide from the virus. We've got to be out there, do what we do, and be as safe as we can. Thank you, President Chavez. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Um, I, I have um, just a couple of follow-ups, and I'm going to start my time also, so my colleagues don't have to do that for me. I'm going to make some comments and then uh, I'm going to go to our, well, I'm going to make comments. We're going to go to our last presenter. We have one more presenter and then we'll go to the public and then we'll take action on this item. Um, so uh, as it relates to the, the testing, I'm really um, excited that Susan and Joe are going to get to hear this at committee. What I'm very interested in understanding um, and would like to just add, implore my colleagues to make sure that the board gets the answer to this question, which is where are we going to be um, in testing at the end of the month and what should our ultimate goal be in testing and how quickly will we get there? Um, second, as it relates to tracing, I'm interested in um, that being calendared out um, over the next couple of months as well as testing. And what in particular there I'm interested in is uh, funding. And I want to be clear that um, I believe that we are right now looking at organizations to donate people, and that's why we're referring to them as volunteers. Better understanding how we're exploring our partnerships, including our own unions. Third, what isolation and quarantine programming look like, both the warm handoff and the actualization of that uh, body of work. The roles, responsibilities um, of each section, whether it's uh, the general contact tracing, the specialized contact tracing, or the investigative contact tracing, as has been described by staff. I'd like that to be um, in writing as a plan same with testing as a plan so that we can share it with our publics and the partner and our partners. I am very interested in public education. To Supervisor Simidian's point, um, my communities are already open. The communities that I represent have a number of folks that are out, they're working, they're not wearing masks, and we have a number of businesses that are open that are not supposed to be open right now, but they are. And so I'm concerned about public education. I will be bringing forward a referral later today that looks at the promotora model for educating the public and our businesses. Um, I too want to reinforce the point that's been raised about the mechanisms for communication. One recommendation I've gotten is that when we do press conferences, we should leave them open and allowing for lots of questions. I think our public uh, leaders that get on our 30 minute calls um, are concerned that they only get two or three questions. Um, and then um, the other thing, and I'm happy to get this answer today, but it's hard for me to understand the implications of the actions of the surrounding jurisdictions on us maintaining um, or getting to the to less than our um, our one, our not one, and I don't really understand how we're going to do that. Uh, and then I have two questions, and that is, um, is the EOC closing? If so, when? And does that mean that the staff that are currently in the EOC will be returning back to their uh, roles within the county? 
And then second, are we asking employees um, anywhere in our organization to sign NDAs? Those last three I'd be interested in answers to now. Okay, I can talk about the uh, EOC. We're not anticipating closure in any time soon. We'll stay activated until the <clears throat> disaster is uh, resolving. Um, in terms of NDAs, yes, we're asking people in in the EOC to sign NDAs because they're involved in um, collecting uh, confidential public health information. So we wanna make sure that they're not sharing that information. Um, and I lost the last third, what was the other question? It was the implications of surrounding jurisdictions making changes to including the state and uh, how that impacts our ability to uh, be below the R1 or R01 measurement. Okay, well, that's probably best left to Dr. Cody and uh, James can probably give you a comment on the legal implications. Well, let so, me, Sarah. yeah, let me just wait. Let me go back to the NDAs. Um, since we have staff all over the organization that handle public health data now and medical related data via HIPAA, my understanding is that our staff do not sign NDAs now. So I'm still confused about why we would need our staff to sign NDAs given this particular, what's what's remarkable about this data over the other data that we ask people to hold confidential. It's not the data that's remarkable. It's the fact that most of the people working in the um, EOC are not people that normally handle public or private health information. You know, we have people from all over the organization. I can add to this, you know, there's in addition to PHI, there's also attorney client privileged information and other information that due to the physical uh, structure of the EOC is hard to keep fully segregated. So we've asked people to acknowledge that all of that information remains confidential. We've got people coming together from many, many, many different departments who in their day jobs do different roles. Um, and so that's why we are well, having an acknowledgement of confidentiality. So I would like, whether this is in a confidential memo or not, to understand that um, more precisely as a, as a legal matter. And the reason I raise that is that since the beginning of this, um, the COVID-19 um, onslaught, I have asked why we've been unable to have closed session meetings as our colleagues have been able to do in other places. And the, the in my mind, being able to asking people to sign NDAs means that we think there's information that they have that they can't share publicly and the board's received zero information that we think is privileged and or very little of it and we've been unable to meet on it so being able to clarify that I think in writing for the board in a, whatever format you think is appropriate would be helpful for me. We will be happy to provide a memo to the board. Thank you. The last on the implications, I've actually I don't want to exceed my time. I still have a few more minutes. If the question of the implications can be answered, I'd be very interested in it. Dr. Cody. I'm sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so regarding your question about, uh, I think, as I understand, it's about reintroduction of COVID-19 from surrounding jurisdictions, um, either immediately or elsewhere. Um, uh, you know, that that is of course not under our control. And I think we have two, two strategies. One strategy was the regional strategy, at least for our immediate neighbors to get all the um, health officers around the Bay Area um, to move together. Um, but of course, we now know what a challenge that is, for example, with one city in Alameda County um, not going along with the county order. Um, I think that the other strategy is um, uh, really kind of muscling our way forward um, with this massive case, uh, you know, testing case and contact, uh, which is that if you test, test, test and find, 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 
um, and are reasonably successful in isolating people quickly, um, the cases as well as the contacts that we can still keep our um, are not below one. Um, at least that that is our stretch goal. Um, I don't see that we have any other strategies. Um, we live in a region and people uh, live in one place and work in another um, and commute. Um, and so I think that we're, um, we're just left to the strategies over which we have some control. So what that means, um, if I could say this back to you, is the tracing and the ability to, to quickly isolate and quarantine where necessary, particularly given the impacts to the communities that are lower income, where you have higher numbers of people living together and getting that testing number up is gonna be critical, irrespective of whether or not we maintain the shelter in place order or not. And I am really pressing on this because my concern is that as we see the, the country opening up and the state opening up, that having the, um, to you, you use the term guardrails, but having these multiple guardrails um, up and relatively high is the only way that we're going to be able to protect life uh, and freedom here long term. The balance. I think so. Okay. Yeah, and I and I and I just want to emphasize that you know we've uh, obviously gone really hard on sh on shelter in place, um, and we have uh, you know our community has come together, um, and we have really flattened our curve. Um, but the reason why we're not going like lockstep with the state order is we have to absolutely make sure, as you say, that our guardrails are high and strong. Um, so that we're ready, uh, because we know that opening up, easing up, um, are, are not would would drift up were it not for these protections in place. Um, and there, as, as again, there there is not another way uh, to protect the most vulnerable communities in our county. So, having a robust. Um, tracing isolation and quarantine program and a, a much expanded uh, testing program and a much stronger public education program, probably coupled with some mechanism for enforcement, irrespective of the shelter in place order, are going to be critical to get completed and, and frankly, on very far on their way within the next couple of weeks. Yes, and, and I, I know I think that we're making uh, good progress, as I say, we're running so fast, we, we just want to make sure we don't face plant and that we can, you know, keep our pace. Um, but we're, we're accomplishing, you know, quite a lot and I, and I, and I feel optimistic um, about the infrastructure that we're building. I really appreciate the, the visual there, Dr. Cody. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to go back and um, we're going to, we have one more, before we go back to questions from the board, we have one more presentation. Then I'm going to go back to the board for questions and, and I'm sorry, yep, yeah, back to the board. I'm sorry, I'm going to let the next presentation happen. Go to the public, see if there are any board other comments or questions, and then we can take action from the board. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, thank you. All right, Greg. Good afternoon. This is Greg Eturia. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, President Chavez, members of the board. My name is Greg Etria, County Budget Director. And I do have a presentation that was attached to the agenda packet. I can use that if uh, the clerk can help broadcast it, or I can try to broadcast it from my own computer. Maybe I'll, let's see. There we go. Thank you. So if you could advance that slide. The clerk could advance the slide. Thank you. Uh, the request before you, uh, item number 15, is to uh, uh, appropriate an, an initial appropriation of $175.1 million in a new COVID-19 fund. And uh, based on the receipt that the county had in April of uh, $158.1 million, uh, from the CARES Act Coronavirus Relief Fund, 
as well as our current estimate for reimbursable costs from FEMA and uh, Cal OES through their traditional disaster relief funding sources. Next slide, please. You can advance the slide, please. Thank you. The CARES Act, uh, passed by Congress, uh, appropriated $150 billion nationally for a new coronavirus relief fund. The county share of that, the $158.1 billion, has been fully received uh, again last month. The Act uh, uh, appropriated these funds for necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency. I put that here because each of those words and phrases has an inherent limitation. Uh, uses have to be for necessary uh, expenditures and it's for expenditures, not lost revenue. And it's also uh, limited to, to those costs that are incurred to uh, this emergency. Further, the um, uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund also limited uses uh, to expenses that were not accounted for in the county's budget that was approved as of March 27th. And it's also limited to uh, costs that are incurred between March 1st through the end of this calendar year, uh, approximately on December 30th. Next slide, please. Further, um, the county is still eligible to also, in addition to that, claim for reimbursement from traditional national disaster funding sources through FEMA that were established by the Stafford Act uh, a long time ago. And uh, it has its own limitations and in, in many ways more limiting to just uh, certain costs that are associated with measures taken uh, before and, and during and immediately after just to save lives and protect health and safety. And based on our initial tracking of, of COVID-19 response costs, you're currently estimating that the, um, uh, the county will expend uh, about 17 million in eligible uh, uh, expenses for traditional uh, FEMA reimbursement. The state has a, a share of cost, a small share of cost of that as well to get through normal reimbursement process. Next slide, please. So for the fund, based on our initial estimates, we are anticipating that there will be uh, direct charges for uh, personal costs, uh, supplies, uh, and, and other assets, uh, uh, professional service contracts, and improvements uh, to uh, respond to uh, COVID, as well as anticipating transfers to other county funds. To the extent possible, it's going to be a uh, preference to charge uh, direct costs to, uh, to the fund, but we recognize that a lot of the current expenses that's being, that are being incurred uh, in county departments um, are going to um, uh, have you know, some costs directly related to COVID, and maybe some not, for an example, an employee that works, uh, some COVID related uh, activities and, and some not. So we do anticipate that there'll be a need for, for transfers as well. Next slide, please. And at this point, we um, we don't know whether uh, to what uh, how quickly that 175 million will be used because uh, uh, there is a, a good pace of expenditures uh, occurring in order to to respond. But at this point, we do anticipate that there will be some unused funding at the end of this fiscal year, and we will be asking the board to re appropriate any unused funding next fiscal year. At the June 23rd board meeting, we will bring uh, an estimate for what that will be and ask the board to make a final reconciliation after the books are closed uh, at the, after summer. Next slide, please. And this is just the first of what will be several reports and requests for appropriation as new information is learned as there is success in legislative advocacy efforts to get more federal and state uh, funding. There's certainly more needed. 
for uh, uh, to, to recover the county's costs uh, that we are spending, as well as uh, federal funding needed to help offset revenue losses so we can continue to sustain our current level of services in response uh, to this uh, pandemic and its uh, uh, humanitarian impacts. The initial budget um, uh, again provides uh, estimates for service supplies and, uh, and assets. However, we suspect that we'll come to the board in June for an adjustment because there will be certainly additional uh, costs recognized in May and we want to keep the board as up to date and knowledgeable as, as, as we learn new information. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, this action uh, that's before you on, on an item number 15, we are aware of other uh, COVID related uh, funding sources that are, um, that are received in specific departments, including those described on item 14 uh, on this uh, board's agenda related to BMC, as well as we're aware of um, some additional allocation from the State Department of Public Health uh, that we're anticipating at the County Public Health Department for emergency preparedness related to this. The CARES Act also increased the amount of uh, the federal share of, of Medi-Cal, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, and we do anticipate that will be some additional reimbursement uh, called the FMAP uh, amount, a 6.2% increase. We don't have a dollar amount yet uh, uh, for that. We are still waiting to learn how that's going to be allocated and the time frames. And then lastly, um, we are also um, uh, eligible to receive some uh, emergency homeless funding and assistance grants that uh, the Office of Supportive Housing is uh, administering and, and uh, will be or has been uh, seeking board authority for those uses as well. Next slide, please. The county has been tracking the uh, COVID-19 related cost using specific coding in the county's financial and timekeeping systems. These are uh, systems that we have used in past disasters, whether they were for wildfire or uh, significant weather events. And uh, so we've got those in place, recognizing that there is some additional flexibility, uh, particularly with the Corona Rock Relief Fund, we do anticipate going uh, back as well uh, with those uh, uh, expenses um, and uh, uh, tagging, so to speak, even more that we believe uh, can be recoverable. So these uh, estimates are going to continue to um, uh, grow as far as what we uh, believe we'll be able to get cost recovery for. And the administration is going to be using what we call a funding waterfall approach as we identify uh, expenses. We are going to want to use the most restrictive funds first and then the um, and then the more moderately restrictive such as the coronavirus relief funds and use local funds as the last resort and this is necessary as the board's uh, well aware of the, the county's budgetary situation and the gap we have between our regular ongoing costs and our regular ongoing revenues is widening because of the economic impacts and uh, it's going to be important that we cover as many of our costs and recover uh, and, and lost revenues as possible. And we're going to want to be as wise and strategic as possible when we do this matching. Next slide, please. And then uh, again, just uh, for a, a sampling, these are the recorded uh, actual expenses uh, using that uh, accounting coding that I mentioned earlier as well as encumbrances. Encumbrances are commitments uh, that have not yet uh, been paid, such as purchase orders uh, for equipment, for um, uh, supplies, as well as uh, contracts uh, that have, uh, where the services haven't been fully delivered. But just for the coding that we've tracked so far, we are 
uh, at uh, approximately $74 million in, in uh, expenses attracted so far. And I do believe that when we go back uh, and take a, a, a deeper look at recent costs, that we'll be able to recognize even more that we think could be eligible for the coronavirus relief fund. Um, so we're certainly on pace to use these uh, funds. And I think if nothing else, this illustrates that the funding we have received so far from uh, the federal government is inadequate to cover our costs. And, and so we'll need to continue to keep up our legislative advocacy to get additional funding and additional flexibility that's gonna be important for us to be able to continue to respond at the, at the current levels that we've been able to so far with this crisis. And then the next slide I think is the prompt for questions. You know, um, before Greg, before we go to your questions, um, uh, what I wanted to do was I'd also asked um, if Larry um, Stone wanted to give a very brief update on some issues that are that may impact the value of our property taxes. And because I'm assuming, Greg, that some of your assessment has also to do with what we think the impact will be to sales tax and property tax. Is that accurate? Oh, yes, certainly uh, for our, our forecast and um, uh, for the budget situation, as well as our uh, economic impacts from COVID the lost revenues from sales tax, as well as um, uh, property taxes, a significant component. So, Absolutely. thank you. So if I could ask the assessor if he just wants to weigh in on, some, on what the most urgent um, matters are that are impacting us. And I, I'm gonna ask the clerk to unmute you because I can't really find you. Um, is the assessor on the line? We are checking that now, Madam President. Thank you. I'm just looking at it. They, uh, they I, am, I am texting with David Ginsburg. He is on his way in. Oh, they had another meeting. And so I, if they, if they can't make it, I mean, if he's still a, a bit of ways and what we can do is go um, to board questions. I, actually, I'm going to go to public comment and then we can go to board questions and then see if uh, Larry is able to weigh in on this topic. So um, to the public first and then to the board. Thank you, Madam President. We currently have three speakers for this item. Our first speaker is Roger McCarty. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Yes, I would like to thank the county supervisors for addressing all of this. I'm a pastor of a church in Santa Clara County. And I desperately would like to plead with you as supervisors to declare churches and religious organizations as essential. You know, there is an uptick in suicides, abuse, both drugs, alcohol, child, spousal, the destruction of families, the loss of hope. And one part of our community that meets that need are our religious organizations and our churches. If the big box stores can be open for hundreds of people, surely you can find a way to give us the opportunity to meet in our church buildings with social distancing, just as County Supervisor Wasserman talked about. We need to be able to be able to implement those things. I plead with you, let us meet on some level, outdoor services or indoor services. Thank you for listening and I plead with you to do it. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Am I muted? Scott, are you there? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here. It just looked a little different this time. Well, I think you guys can hear me. I can hear the echo down the hallway. I've uh, you know, kind of lost track a little bit here. I've uh, been appreciating the desks that have been brought out into the lobby now uh you know that that's actually a plus right now so we can kind of rebuild our lives as members of the public out here in the hallway um let's not forget uh the amount of people that are no longer able to see their children right now um visitation providers that people have to pay hundreds of dollars an hour to see their own children have been shut down same with the ones outside of the courthouse 
these are people that are becoming more desperate to see their children. Um, I'm one of them. Uh, it's been two months now since I've heard from my little girl. Can't do Skype, can't do phone conversations over the phone, none of that. Um, when people don't cooperate, um, our county does not go after that other side in a way. So uh, just keep my fingers crossed that maybe sometime this year I'll be able to hear from my kid. So. Our final speaker on this item is Alana Powell. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Alana Powell, and I'm with a nonprofit called Boldly Me. Um, I wanted to talk about item number 23 um, that talks about um, reducing the budget that supervisors have to align with nonprofit organizations. Um, just as um, the first speaker said, we're seeing an increase in stress, anxiety, maladaptive coping mechanisms, aggression, depression, grief within the community. And right now, the greatest need is right now for nonprofits like us to be able to serve the community. Um, uh, there's an old term, a stitch in time saves nine. And we just put through a proposal that would serve over 365,000 children and their families. And we're desperately pleading with the county to make sure that funding is available for nonprofits like us to take care of families. Um, thank you very much. Madam President, we have two more members of the public. Pardon me. Uh, yes, two more members of the public who have raised their hands. Would you like to take those speakers or would you like to cut public comment off? Um, please do, and then we'll not take any more public comment just on this item. Okay. Um, we have two remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Walter Wilson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Walter. We'll mute him and come back. Um, our next speaker is Alan Kissick. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Alan Kistik. I'm the executive director of the American Diabetes Association, which is based in San Jose. Um, the Board of Supervisors has provided some very critical funding to the ADA over the last three years. And I'm calling in regards to line item 23 as well. Um, the funding that the, the Board of Supervisors have provided is to slow the trajectory of um, childhood obesity and diabetes by funding uh, programs that actually meets children where they're at in schools, in aftercare programs, uh, in summer school programs and whatnot. I'd like uh, to request the, you know, the review and careful consideration of uh, reducing that funding. Um, this funding obviously provides uh, a lot of great uh, experiences with sports and nutrition at an early age and saves millions of dollars of, of healthcare dollars in the future as well. Thank you. We appreciate your support. We're going to try Mr. Wilson one more time. Mr. Wilson, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Sorry about that. I, Walter, we'll have to have you try back again. Um, I want to remind folks, I know it's been a long time, but we're on item 13 and 17. So I'm going to go back to um, uh, Assessor Larry Stone, and then we'll go to the board for any final comments on this area. Larry, you're on mute. There you go. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, thanks for allowing me to apprise you of an emerging and urgent issue that could significantly increase the state's $50 billion budget. I know you have serious pressing and health and welfare issues, and I really appreciate the attention. On April 21st, following a four hour meeting, the State Board of Equalization Chair and Vice Chair created a working group, a subcommittee to discuss and make recommendations that the BOE can implement immediately to lessen the financial impact of COVID-19 on commercial property owners. Two days later, this subcommittee convened an all day meeting of tax agents and tax attorneys along with assessors and clerks of the Assessment Appeals Board. 
representing the California Assessors Association, I played one of the lead roles in the working groups. We uniformly expressed our serious and profound disapproval of the proposals. The following evening, the chair and vice chair issued a 25, excuse me, 45 page memo with over 20 recommendations. Most of the proposals mirrored often verbatim requests from the Association of Property Tax Agents. Advice and legal counsel from assessors, county councils, and clerks of the board were largely ignored. Neither the professional staff or the legal staff of the BOA participated or were they provided input to their transmittal, developed solely by the political staff members of the chair and the vice chair. The action proposed by the BOE will have direct, immediate, and dramatic adverse financial impact on property tax revenue in California. At risk is billions of dollars of property tax revenue that could occur as early as this fall. Moreover, proposals under active and serious consideration by the BOE will trigger unnecessary downstream chaos throughout the California property tax system. The recommendations made by the subcommittee fall into two categories. Those they believe can they, that they can implement immediately and those that will require legislative intervention. In several instances, assessors and legal counsel have argued that the proposed immediate action would unlawfully usurp powers reserved for the legislature, the governor, or would require outright changes to the constitution. In several instances, they plan to seek a legislative remedy as a backup should they fail administratively. The single most significant recommendation is a proposal that would have assessors issue property tax refunds immediately based upon the market value of commercial properties shortly following the tax, the shelter in place order. That would be April 4th, 2020. Following 9-11, the BOE attempted to take similar action on behalf of the airline industry. Working with the California Assessors Association our, and our county, our county, county council, Dep Deputy County Council, Marcy Berkman litigated the in appellate court and overturned the BOE action. Many of the proposals would create chaos in the property tax system, jeopardize and significantly delay property tax revenue, create confusion, I think, for property owners, and likely trigger a crisis in the public confidence in the integrity and fairness of the property tax system. So I'm asking the Board of Supervisors for assistance today, urging the three members, the three BOE, BOE members who were excluded from the working groups to reject these proposals outright. Two BOE members in their rush to demonstrate their sympathy for the legitimate plight of business owners have gone rogue. It is critical they do not get a third member of the board to follow them over that cliff. As an income property owner myself, I'm sympathetic to the plight of business owners, but assessors are independently elected and understand the economic crisis caused by COVID-19. However, the federal government's 2.3 trillion stimulus package aiding businesses and local governments is the proper vehicle to provide relief to property taxpayers. The federal government is assuming its traditional role as the sole entity that can literally print money. A statewide property tax system is designed to provide long-term relief as it did extensively during the Great Recession. You may recall that at the height of the Great Recession, 2009 to 2011, we proactively reduced the assessed value on 136,000 properties, nearly one quarter of all the properties in Santa Clara County, totaling a reduction of $27 billion. The impact on FY21-22 will not be pretty and could very well be worse. So again, I wanna thank you for your help. We need the BOE to focus on the legal and the doable by partnering with assessors in managing through the greatest crisis facing the property tax administration in this state in 40 years. Thank you very much, Larry, or Assessor Stone. Thank you. President Davis, if I could just add a quick word. Please. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I concur with the, the comments from the assessor. Um, my office and county council offices around the state have been looking at some of these proposals. They are extremely concerning from an administration administrability perspective as well as from a legal perspective 
And uh, we do agree with the assessment of the assessor that they would create significant chaos and disruption to the property tax system, which already has clearly established mechanisms to in an orderly fashion account for uh, declines in property value. Um, and uh, we also share concerns about the effort to do so in a way that would basically front load um, the reductions that, that in a manner that could cause really serious disruption to those entities, especially school districts and others, including the county, that depend very heavily on property taxes. Thank you. I'm going to go to my colleagues and see if there are any questions or comments on either Greg's or um, Larry and James's proposals. I'll start with Supervisor Cortezzi and then go back down the line. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Chavez. I know uh, during the prior presentation, there was um, a lot of um, comment, or it's quite a bit of comment about shelter in place fatigue. Um, and, and to me, I'm not going to characterize anyone else's comments or recharacterize, but um, I take that phrase when I hear it oftentimes, um, even, even earlier today, as um, people are tired of being in their homes. You know, people are tired of not being able to go out. Um, people are tired of these basic restrictions that they can't, um, you know, go to a salon um, and deal with some of the routine lifestyle choices that we've um, of course, ha had the, the ordinary luxury of, of taking advantage of um, as people living here in America and California and, and Silicon Valley. Um, but I don't hear that many complaints about that. What I hear a lot of complaints about and concern about are these fiscal issues. And what I'm hearing from people uh, also, like other supervisors have said, by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, certainly tens of, of thousands, I think we're, we're up to collectively as a board of supervisors in terms of constituent inquiries. What we're starting to hear is um, in effect that it, this is, not, this is, this is uh, an economic disaster for them personally. Uh, if they're in business, it is. Obviously they're unemployed, it is. And it's much, much bigger in terms of the collective cost you know, what we would call safety net costs than anything the county could, could possibly afford, uh, even as big as our budget is. Um, you know, we saw in, in unfortunately, what happens, what, what happens, um, and I'm going to relate back to Dr. Cody's earlier presentation uh, in terms of saving lives. We've seen, we saw it in, in Italy, we've seen it in other parts of the country where ultimately there's a sort of triage that takes place that is a de facto euthanasia. It's, you know, yes, this, this impacts, you know, people who are over 65, um, they're overrepresented in the numbers, especially the morbidity numbers, but we can't, we can't help it. You know, we can't, afford the cost anymore. So, so let us get back to what we're doing. Um, at, at some point, um, and I'd like to, to hear from Dr. Smith on this, I, and I appreciate the background information on the taxes. I have two questions. At what point does the county budget reach the tipping point where we can actually no longer fund the very services that we're trying to extend to flatten the curve. At what point do we run out of money to pay doctors and nurses in emergency rooms and clinics? Um, where, where is the graph on that? I'd like to see where the intersection takes place um, on overlapping graphs or, or a, Zen, uh, a Venn diagram that indicates um, where we reach that intersection and when we reach that intersection based on projections. So I hope you can bring that forward um, to us um, as part of the budget process and maybe you're already planning to do that. Um, because it, it seems to me that the public outcry in terms of household pocketbooks, the, the point that fundamentally the assessor is making that we're not going to be able to afford you know, property tax diversion 
um, really is, in, in my opinion, you know, part of this large, larger conversation um, as to you know, how long can we keep going. Um, we lose the public, in my opinion, not when people get tired of being at home. If you pay people UBI to stay home, I think most people would stay home and they'd be happy staying home for quite a long sabbatical. Um, I think what happens that we have to be concerned about is telling people to stay home when they can no longer afford to eat. And, and at that point, we have a, a serious public policy conflict. Um, the, the question, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that the answer is yes, Dr. Smith, before I ask my second question, I have to do with, with the tax system. Um, but yeah, the, we get that information back, uh, for you or Greg, can we get that information back in, in as clear a manner as you can present it or predict it during the budget process? Sure, we'll present it. Um, the short answer is we've already reached the point where we can't afford to do everything that we have been doing. But of course, you know, the board's gonna have to prioritize those expenditures. And there are some things that we've been doing that probably are lower priority than other things. But I think you're asking the question of when do we get to the bone, um, so to speak, or the muscle. And uh, we'll definitely try to give a presentation to the best we can about that. The thing that um, to augment what you're saying, and you and I have talked about this individually, is the fact that even if we hadn't had COVID, uh, because of the normal downturn cycles in, in the economy, we were definitely going to have a recession. Uh, COVID has you know, brought on really what is a depression uh, economically across the nation and accentuated that. So the underlying problem with the economy is now being accentuated dramatically, both nationally and locally. So you're right, uh, exactly correct. We can't go on doing the things that we have been doing and we're gonna have to ask the board to set new priorities. So this will come back, Dr. Smith, as part of the budget process. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, Dave, thanks. what was your second question? You know, that was specifically directed at that delta between what we get, what we're anticipating getting from the, from the feds, from the federal treasury, um, and what we're actually spending, which obviously was not. Um, the second question is just regarding the tax system. B besides what the assessor and county council were sort of warning us about. Um, and, and Greg, this question is for you. Remind me again the flow, how the flow of sales tax and property tax money from this county, how it goes from a, a, a collection um, and a redistribution standpoint, and what mechanisms, if any, are there to stop the state, which already has a $58 billion projected deficit and growing from essentially intercepting the property taxes, even under the current system um, and or sales taxes. Um, and, and fundamentally saying we're going to take care of our deficit first. And of course, that relates to the prior question I just asked as to at what point do we, do we, um, you know, I, <laughs> Dr. Smith characterized it as a crash. At what point does the car hit the bottom of the cliff here? Um, and, and how, what, what I'm really asking is, is there anything we can do to stop that from happening? In years past, including the deep recession and the dot-com bus as an elected official, I was, I was here when the state basically just came in and, and said, hand over your reserves for all intents and purposes. Um, we went from, um, you know, um, tens of millions of dollars in reserves that were publicly um, available to see by, by any person, any member of the public could have seen the, 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 the reserves that we have. And in a couple of, uh, of weeks here, the public will see that again when you roll out the budget. The state of California sees that as well. Um, what we have, what Los Angeles has, and what everybody else has. So, so tell, me, tell me how that works when they come in. Remind me, because it's been a few years since the last recession, how they come in and, and essentially uh, grab the reserves that we were intending to use to, to deal with our own hardship here. 
yeah, yeah, members of the board. Um, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. There, there are a number of um, uh, methods and allocations from from statewide sales tax, and and you're exactly right. There, there are some uh, parts that we more directly tied to, like uh, our local 2012 Measure A sales tax, and um, and what we call the Bradley Burns. That's just the extra one percent of sales that goes directly to local government. Typically, those are more directly just collected by the uh, Board of Equalization and then returned over uh, to the county. Uh, where we're more susceptible of, of intervention are the um, uh, what we call the public safety sales tax. Again, a share of the sales tax that gets collected, gets distributed by, by the state. That was a little more delayed from a time, time frame so the state can come up with their allocation. And then even more so is uh, what we call the 2011 realignment and the 1991 realignment. These are sales tax uh, from the statewide sales tax that are collected by the state to reimburse uh, the county for social and public safety systems. And, and they're the ones that they tend to hold on to for about a year, typically. And so they come up with their allocations to the legislative process and allocate the, 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 our, our county our share of that. And that's where they intervened before for the 1991 realignment. And they ran into their ca cash problems in 2008, 2009. They held that up. And then that, that in turn created cash problems for counties, uh, uh, including Santa Clara County. What's, hey, hey. Uh, what's on top of that is this year, we've also now got what we call the 2011 realignment, which is even more of that same mechanism. There's even more money involved. And we didn't have that in the last recession, but for this recession, there's even more that, that they could choose to hold up or longer for their own cash flow purposes and delay to us. So there's even more at risk compared to the 2009 downfall. So th those are the, the biggest ones. And then uh, uh, property tax as well, as Larry mentioned too, the legislature is also capable of making changes uh, uh, to, to law. So obviously we wanna watch those very carefully, you know, regarding the allocation and, and, uh, for uh, property tax between schools and the counties and, and everything else, uh, we'll have to be mindful there as well. When you say when you say watch, I just want to ask, or sort of re-ask the fundamental question. A very gr excellent answer, although I obviously don't like the implications of it. But thank you. <laughs> what? What can we do to stop it? I think I know the answer, which is nothing, because it takes a parliamentary vote of the legislature to approve a budget that would invoke those mechanisms that delay distributions to us. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, our legislative advocacy and our relationship with uh, the representatives, uh, you know, from this area that serve in that legislature, uh, keeping them informed and and so that way they are aware of the fallout and, and the ramifications if there was that kind of diversion or, or holding up uh, of our funds and so that way if they make those type of decisions they're informed decisions and you know we, we try to do our part of that I'd, I'd like to jump in and answer in a more uh, philosophical way um, and of course you know this uh, Supervisor and Supervisor Simidian is quite acutely aware as well as the other supervisors. But legally, uh, the counties are an arm of the uh, state government. And typically in California, the standard approach has been to push the responsibility for services that are in other, in other states, state obligations down to the counties in order for them to actually accomplish it, which is probably a good idea, but the funding typically doesn't come along with it. And that's the problem is it's always easier for the legislature to push responsibilities down on the um, local county government without the funding. And that's essentially what happened with both, well, all three realignments is the promise was uh, we'll give you more control over the services and we'll give you the money but they didn't ever give us the money to do the services that needed to happen so there's lots of lots of tools they can use to keep the state budget floating well and put major downturn on us and um, 
getting a little political. You can see how a legislature might be interested in doing this because the political hurt is absorbed by the Board of Supervisors rather than the legislature in Sacramento, uh, because obviously you have to take the heat from your constituents. So being in a very, um, seeing it from a very uh, wizened perspective, being a little too old, um, I think we're in, in a position right now with a $50 billion deficit at Sacramento for them to pass a lot of hurt down to us. I, I would just ask uh, again, uh, as per the prior question about the intersection, um, when, when would we arrive at the intersection between, um, you know, being able essentially to support the safety net versus shutdown, which to me, you know, fundamentally the shelter in place, in place um, you can no longer carry out the fundamental service delivery. With that said, that said, I would just ask that when you bring all this back to us, that you give us scenarios um, rather than, you know, the, this could be a range of X millions of hit to the county versus X plus something. I would actually like you just to not sugarcoat anything and give us worst case scenario in as, as stark a terms as, as, as it may be, because um, I, I don't think predicting or projecting when we run out of money um, is, is something that we should be sugarcoating right now. We talk about communication to the public and good public relations. Um, that's a message that needs to get out to people. Um, right. People ask us. And I, I'm gonna intervene just for a moment because I didn't put that 15 minute block on, but I meant to. And so Dave, do you have any last questions? That was it, that was, uh, right. that was, that was. Um, Susan? Thank you, I'm, we'll just set my timer. Thank you. Uh, got it, okay. Um, thanks, Greg, uh, for that report. Oops, just lost my notes, here we go. Um, in the prior presentation, we discussed the need to build guardrails to safely reopen through testing and tracing capacity and in enhancing our communication to the public to clarify our order and guidance. I see our ability to meet these targets largely as a function of our investment in those systems. Um, and as much as we are talking about um, deficits and where we may be spending too much, I don't think we're spending unnecessarily, but I worry that we are asking a relatively small team in the EOC and the public health department to bear an enormous burden. And I don't know if we have provided resources aligned to these demands. I asked at the April 21st and May 5th meetings for a report on our emergency procurements to date. This ledge file notes that 17 million is expected to be spent through June out of the EOC. And the presentation shows 74 million in expenditures, but none of those items are detailed. Seeing the details of where we are spending including in alignment to the indicators that we need to achieve on PPE testing and tracing is really critical to our oversight and to the public trust in our response. So Greg, um, for today, can you tell me what are the major categories of expenses to date? Yeah, the major categories uh, to date include um, personnel time uh, tracking uh, staff that's been diverted from their regular work to work on COVID related uh, response work, as well as uh, overtime and, and extra help. Um, also uh, for, for supplies and equipment such as uh, 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 purchase orders for ventilators, uh, supplies of personal protective uh, equipment and um, uh, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, there, there could very well be other more specific departmental costs. I don't know off the top of my head that a department is marked as COVID related that we're going to want to go back and, 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 you know, check through our NLO process to see if it, it could be charged to one of these funding sources. One of our goals for doing all this is to maximize as much cost recovery as we possibly can 
so that way we don't uh, have to spend any more local funds than, than necessary. Sure, presumably that's the, that's the goal. I agree that that's the right goal, but I don't feel that I have enough information yet um, to feel confident that we are doing all of the right things and investing in all of the right places. I'm gonna ask for an off agenda report uh, with a few components. And the first one uh, that I would like is a breakdown of the 74 million or if the number grows uh, by the time this report is done, uh, that larger number, how does that break out in terms of EOC staff time, testing supplies, PPE, uh, contracts for specific services and housing supports? And I also like to know how are we balancing being fiscally responsible with investing enough resources in the response to scale our testing and tracing capacity. Um, we know that investing in the response is effectively an investment in our economy so that we can meet the indicators to end that shelter in place. Do you have some guiding principle or theory that you're using to, to balance that uh, fiscal responsibility with the need to make really significant investments to get us that will be necessary to get us out of, of the shelter in place? Yeah, well, well, certainly we'll work with others to get that report back. Um, but as far as the overall process, um, uh, I can probably in the jump Jeff in. Can mention that. Yeah, a lot of that discussion happens in the EOC. Right. Um, I can jump in and answer that. I think our highest priority is to spend on the um, issues that will have the most direct effect on lives. Um, so those have been um, issues like PPE, testing material. Um, spending resources, staff resources at skilled nursing facilities and, um, you know, running the EOC. Um, we um, then look at other issues like preparing for the um, re recapture or upturn of uh, the uh, disaster. And so we've been preparing for that and spending on that. Um, but it's really been a matter of just focusing on saving lives at this point. Um, we don't um, have a specific formula. I think we need to, to get there um, and develop that. I asked on um, April 21st as part of the, the COVID planning referral, um, for a more detailed budget. Can you, uh, Dr. Smith, commit today to a date on which you can share with us a, a detailed broken out budget for the $175 million planned spending, including department allocations? Sure, we'll give you one by the 26th. That's part of the budget. Top day. Yeah. But wait, Susan, may I just ask, so that Dr. Smith, that's going to be part of the budget materials. Right. Thank you. Sorry, Susan. Uh, not a problem. And the um, off agenda report, though, on the breakout in terms of staff time, testing supplies, PPE contracts, specific services, uh, and housing supports, I would like to be separate um, and ideally prior to that, uh, that budget workshop. Um, I want, uh, since I have um, some time left, I want to just circle back to two of the previous uh, presentations um, with a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that I wholly echo Supervisor Chavez's concern regarding the non-disclosure agreements. Uh, I understand that that is not a standard practice for public health workers, uh, and it does concern me and I think will concern um, the public. So I support uh, getting more information there and seeing if this, this truly is something that is required or, or necessary to ask of our employees. Uh, and I suspect, do we still have Dr. Cody with us? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask this question then perhaps into the ether and if there's nobody on here now that can answer it, then I would like to get that off agenda. I, I heard a lot of talk today about the R not uh, one um, as an indicator. And we have gone from initially talking about four benchmarks to five indicators. And this now feels like something new. 
So I'd like to know if uh, the board needs to be looking at metrics and measurements around getting to N not one um, as another formal indicator for our ability to open it. It alarms me that we keep adding, if this is the case and my interpretation is correct, that we keep adding additional, um, whatever we wanna call them, hoops, benchmarks, indicators to being able to move out of here. And that piece was not clear to me today. Yeah, that it hasn't changed the five indicators. R not is one of the numbers that relates to one of the indicators, which is a decrease in the presence of the spread of the uh, virus. But the five indicators are still the five indicators that are being looked at. Um, but you know, all the information that be, can be collected uh, about those five indicators is relevant. So this declining case numbers is very different from um, transmission of less than one. Um, if that is part of the indicator, does it mean that we need to reach a level that is that low? I think Supervisor Wasserman asked about this as well. I just wanna make sure it's spelled out. r not is a measure of whether or not the virus is spreading. Right. So right. if it's below one, that's decreasing the spread of the virus in the community. And you can also measure that just by looking at the um, tests. I mean, R1 is just a derivation of a number based on the number of positive tests and number of negative tests. Mm -hmm. So it's just a manipulation of the data. It's just another way of quantifying the data. It's not a different factor per se. So I don't think there's any need to change the indicators. We keep the indicators the same. It's just a matter of whether we have a, you know, we manipulate them so that we can see them in a better light, compare us ourselves to others. Sure, well, that's a, that I wanna make sure that we are being consistent in the way that we're measuring so we don't think that we're getting somewhere and then find out that we're not uh, quite far enough. I appreciate that uh, further explanation. Thank, Thank you. you, Susan. Um, Supervisor Simidian. In the light of the time, Madam Chair, I'll pass. Thank you. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, I'll pass as well. Thank you. I wanted to thank um, Larry um, for getting us caught up and uh, Greg for the same. And what I, um, two things, we all got material from um, the assessor that we can act on. So I'm just gonna encourage my colleagues to do that. Um, and then I just wanna remind staff that you received a number of requests. And one addition that I wanna make is that of the information that you're pulling together um, based on a, a series of off agenda requests you got today, if those off agenda requests could be um, attached to the board, um, the board meeting, particularly as it relates to the budget. And, um, and I think even for our next board meeting, just based on the discussion around um, uh, the, the medical um, and public health responses would be helpful because I think one point that actually um, Supervisor Ellenberg raised a couple of, maybe it was the last meeting is that we have, uh, we're requesting a lot of information, we're getting a lot of information, but being able to knit that information together is gonna be really critical. So I'm gonna encourage you to, to bunch it together and to uh, ascribe it to the direction that you're getting. Is that all right with everyone or are there any concerns about that from the staff? Uh, seeing none, um, I'm going to then take us, so we, the action here is to receive the report on item 13 with the requested um, information that was requested from the Board of Supervisors individually and collectively, and then item 771, the contact tracing referral by Supervisor Ellenberg. May I get a motion for, for both items? Madam Chair, may I, may I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, you just said 13 and 71 and 14? No, only 13 and 71. Okay, so moved. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. May I get did a roll? Did we also just hear 15 though? Yes, we did. No. Well, we heard. Yeah, we received the report. 
Right. The thing is, I, I wasn't bunching them together because the, the board action had us taking action on 13 and 71 and then 14 and 15. So I was just breaking those votes up. If James right. thinks we can take 13, 71, 14 and 15, I'm happy to do that as well. But that's that's not what we had in our board and we have some public speakers. So what I'd like to do is take 13 and 71 and oh. then I'll come back. To, can we have a motion? We have a second from Ms. Ellenberg. Yes. We're going to do the roll call vote on 13 and 71. And you don't have speakers for these members? We already took them in the middle of that cacophony of my not being super whip with the whip on, on everybody. So 13 and 71, can we get a roll call, please? Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Forgive me, Supervisor Simidian, I. Supervisor Cortezi. Aye. Vice President Wasserman. Aye. And President Chavez. Yes, thank you very much. That passes unanimously. We're now gonna go to 14 and 15, which we've already had um, a presentation on. What I'd like to do, if it's okay with my colleagues, is I'm gonna presume there are no questions. If there are, um, please raise your hands or say so now. If not, what I'm gonna do is go to the public comment for items 14 and 15. And this is the approval of $55 million for revenue and expenditures and an approval of 175. Okay. Oh, wait a minute, did I do that right? Yes, approval of two action, two financial actions, 14 and 15. I'm gonna leave it there. Do we have any comments from the public on this? If so, this would be the time to speak. We have one speaker. Yes, we do, Madam President. Our speaker on this item is Adam Rocha. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, four fifths. Okay. Adam? Doesn't seem to be there, Madam President. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second on 14 and 15. We have a motion from Supervisor Wasserman. You, you didn't, but I'm happy to. And we have a second from Supervisor Ellenberg. Sure. Okay. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, may I get a roll call vote? Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian, aye. Supervisor Cortez. Aye. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. President Chavez. Yes, and that passes unanimously. Thank you everyone and thanks to our staff for all of that information. We're now gonna to move to item 19 and this is to transition age youth basic income pilot. And I don't know if staff can make a presentation. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you have somebody you would like to present on this item? Yes, Miguel's here with me. He's going to talk about it. I just I'll make a quick introduction, but Sandhya Herman from SSA, the Deputy Director of Program Support for Research and Evaluation, as well as Melanie Jimenez Perez from the Office of the County Executive will make the presentation and then myself oh. and Bob Minicochi are present to answer any questions after the brief presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, and hold on one second. Let me just ask Supervisor Cortezzi, um, do you, would you like a presentation on this item or are you prepared to act on this today? I'm prepared to move on it. I don't know if the board, I mean, the staff is uh, great job of introducing this in the past and I don't know if you wanna let them do that or not. I'm comfortable not doing that if you're comfortable with the direction, unless my colleagues have questions. I would, I, would, I would move approval uh, to get things going. Super Great. Well. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second on this item? We do not. I will second the item for discussion. Um, what I would ask is, are there questions of the staff from any of my colleagues? We have no questions. We have one public speaker. Let's see if that public speaker would like to make comments. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we have two speakers on this item. Our first speaker is Adam Rocha. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Mr. Rocha, are you there? 
Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Fahad Qureshi. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, uh, dear Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. I'd just like to thank you for your innovation um, and opportunity for the basic income pilot project. Uh, my name is Fahad Karashi and I serve as a director of strategy for an organization called MyPath. MyPath is a national nonprofit that builds strong foundations for upward economic mobility for youth and young adults from low income communities by connecting them with opportunities to bank and build savings, credit and financial confidence while they earn their first paychecks. For the past five years, MyPath has partnered with Excite Credit Union, an incredible partner, to provide youth-friendly accounts alongside our My, My, MyPath Money platform and curriculum for youth in both summer and year-round employment programs offered by Work to Future Foundation. We've delivered financial coaching and credit building opportunities to young adults in partnership with Europe and Self-Help. And we just like to say that we're so excited about the opportunity when it comes to um, building a universal basic income model for foster care youth, because we know that that will seed them out of poverty and provide opportunities they would not get elsewhere. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Um, Dave, I just wanted to say thank you to you. And if this passes, I hope it comes back um, for quarterly updates. And then lastly, I want to just ask staff if this is something that could be considered as CARES Act or FEMA reimbursable since in many respects, we put these kids in much worse peril based on the economy than before. And if that could be included as part of the motion from the maker, I'd appreciate it. I'm happy to include uh, the direction uh, to try to backfill with um, you know, federal reimbursement funds as part of the motion. I, I don't know what the answer to the question is. Yeah, I don't either. I'm just curious if they could look at it. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to do a roll call vote. Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, I. Supervisor Cortezi? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Aye. And President Chavez? Yes. I want to say thank you very much to the staff. That passes unanimously. Item 20 is our Lehigh Quarry Notice Violation Report. And um, I believe that um, Supervisor Sumedian, I think this is when you took off consent. I, I don't know if I'm right about that. That's correct, Madam Chair. And if you'd like, I do have just a couple of quick questions uh, that I think will allow us to move on the item. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know who's teed up uh, from staff or if they were aware that the moment had arrived. Good afternoon, Supervisor, uh, President Chavez, Supervisors, Jacqueline Anshamo, Director of Planning and Development. And uh, available to answer questions is um, our Senior Planner, Rob Salisbury, on the line. Thank you. Um, um, thank you for uh, your work on this effort. Um, I just, I wanted to, make sure I understood the implications of a couple of sentences in the staff report. And I believe my office has been in touch uh, with the department about uh, this. Uh, packet page 748, for those who have packet pages, or the bottom of page two of the staff report, um, it notes that uh, after ha having inspected the uh, Lehigh facility to follow up on the notice of violation, uh, it says during, I'm quoting now, during this inspection, county staff confirmed that Lehigh had followed the majority of the recommendations listed in the MBI inspection report and had implemented the corrective actions specified in the SOTC. As a result, the department has determined that the NOV, the notice of violation, has been abated. And that's the end of the quote. Um, so I, I read clearly that it's the department's determination that the NOV has been abated. I was curious to understand a little bit better what I should make of the phrase, Lehigh had followed the majority of the recommendations listed in the MBI inspection report, uh, because that suggests pretty clearly that there were some number of recommendations which had not been implemented 
And um, I'm curious both on my own uh, to make sure that the abatement has been um, made real, but also because we're likely to get questions from the community about what issues, if any, remain unresolved. Thank you, Supervisor. Rob Salisbury will respond. If he doesn't come on, um, I will go ahead and speak to this item. Um, just, and he might be, oh, he's there. Okay, he might have been having technical difficulties. Go ahead, Rob Salisbury. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Samadhi and um, President Chavez. So the recommendations that I referenced there um, were not required for um, per the county's notice of violation that was issued to Lehigh. They're primarily related to uploading current and accurate data to um, the Water Board's GeoTracker website. So I just want to be clear about this and forgive me, Madam Chair, as I um, come at this from a couple of different uh, angles. So staff is, is clear and comfortable in saying that the issues that were addressed in the notice of violation have been satisfactorily resolved, yes? Yes. Thank you, that's helpful and important. And I gather then that in the process of inspecting uh, MBI came up with some other recommendations which might be well advised and or best practices, but which were not necessary to actually address the notice of violation. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, and um, Madam Chair, I'm good to go. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask then that we take an action and the action is, um, it's really to receive- Madam President, we have one speaker. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to um, go back to the action for a moment that we are receiving a report from the Department of Planning and Development relating to the status of notice of violation of the Lehigh um, permanent quarry. So it's the action is only to receive the report. I just wanted to verify that for my colleagues. And then um, we will go to our public speakers. Thank you, Madam President. We have one speaker on this item. The speaker is E. Guerra. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. This is uh, Erica Guerra, and I'm the environmental and I'm manager director for Lehigh Hansen. I only want to express uh, Lehigh's gratitude for your leadership in requesting a report regarding this matter, and also to commend the planning department staff for their diligence and assistance in this very complex matter. I want to reassure you all that Lehigh, uh, at Lehigh, we take seriously the protection of the environment and the well being of our employees and the communities where we operate. We did not hesitate to allocate all the resources needed to resolve this matter. This should be apparent from all the reports and studies that we submitted to staff and to you. As you know, the NOV was based on a sediment discharge that was triggered by above average precipitation during the 2018 2019 season. Even before the NOV was issued, Lehigh had a team of experts investigating and monitoring the conditions and advising us on the best course of action. In the end, the final, we're pretty pleased about our final outcome and extremely thankful for the contributions by staff and county's experts. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, hearing no other comments or questions, I'm gonna go back to the board for a roll call vote on receiving the report. Madam Chair, it might be helpful if I moved receipt of the report, which is the recommended action contained in our packet. I'll be happy to second. Thank you both very much. All right, roll call, please. Supervisor Allenberg? Yes. Supervisor Sabidian? Sabidian, aye. Supervisor Cortez? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Yes. President Chavez? Yes, thank you. Thank you to my colleagues for your help. We're now moving to item 23. This is our inventory cap board policy resolution. And if I could, I don't, um, let me just look and see what the action is on this item. 
Supervisor, the action is to uh, approve the resolution to amend the board policy on the vote that was taken at the last meeting. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to see if there are any, um, if there's a, a, I don't think we need a report. So I just want to go to my colleagues and see if there are any questions. And I'm seeing, I'm just going to go to the end back. Dave, do you have any comments or questions on this one? No. Susan? Uh, yeah, I want to make uh, a couple of comments because we, we have gotten uh, a number of emails about this issue that, of course, we'll address individually, but I want it on the record to, to explain some of the thinking here. Uh, our budget needs are, are not fully understood yet. Uh, every week that goes by shows a greater deficit that we're going to have to make up. Uh, the county executive told us today that it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars um, and, and we're not finished. Uh, we're asking every department across the county to make hard choices. And I believe that we need to lead by example. We should be limiting ourselves out of a sense of duty and respect to everyone else who's going to be asked to limit funding for projects and services that are otherwise extremely worthwhile and important to county work. True equity might actually be the elimination of inventory items altogether. Every choice we make to fund something outside of the regular county contracting mechanism represents a favoring of one organization over another. The organizations that have built relationships with each of us have a higher likelihood of getting funded, even if the need is greater elsewhere. For me, the cap is a compromise position. Let's try to personally mitigate some of the deep need in our communities, but focus primarily on a system-wide approach that balances numerous critical priorities and some shared responsibility for how we allocate the public's limited dollars. And finally, I want to address the concerns I've heard about the inequity of a uniform cap across the county. First, uh, the comments suggest that our previous system of no cap has led to equitable outcomes, and there's simply no evidence of that. First of all, while we may know the physical location of an organization that is receiving funding, we have no knowledge of where that money goes to meet the needs on the ground uh, in terms of which, of which district. Last year, which was my first experience with this system, uh, Supervisor Cortesi funded a number of items in my district, explaining to me that he views the county as a whole and doesn't feel limited by his district. So I, uh, I was inspired by that explanation and allocated funds last year to organizations that were based in District 2, uh, Child Advocates, and District 3, uh, the Far West Wheelchair Association, both of which serve individuals across the entire county. Uh, this year, one of the items I'm going to recommend is funding to an organization that does work that is, that is extremely important to me, uh, work to improve health outcomes for Black infants and their mother. This organization is in Supervisor Chavez's district, though of course the moms live throughout the county. Our existing process for budget inventory requests does not require metrics to share with the board or proof that these populations are being served and to what level. Clearly, the cap does not limit dollars that may be allocated to each district. It instead ensures consistency across the board for the amount of money over which each of us essentially has sole discretion with, with approval from our colleagues, of course, and it provides certainty to the budgeting team who doesn't have to wait to see how much we are going to direct off the top of the budget even before funding of our most essential services has been approved. And since we have heard again and again that this virus disproportionately impacts people of color and people in denser, lower income neighborhoods, I think it's incumbent on us to address those needs through our, through our full budgeting process, rather than by funding some select projects in the communities. Our responsibility as a government entity is to our people, each and every resident of this county, regardless of where they live. Each person is deserving of the safety net services that our county provides. We must balance the current needs with those that are unknown in our post-COVID reality to ensure that we are equipped to continue to be that safety net when our residents return to their new normal. And I uh, will emphasize again, I understand that this was voted on at the last board meeting and approved 
I didn't feel the need to speak on it then, but since um, as it comes back today for the resolution and there had been um, a number of comments uh, directed towards it, I wanted to address it uh, publicly. So thank you for that opportunity. So why, Susan, since you have the mic, what you want to make the motion and then- um, sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, move approval of the, of the item. Supervisor Simidian, since you were the co-author, would you like to make the second? Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion on the motion? Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the public and then I'll make my comments after the public speaks. So if I could ask the clerk. Thank you, Madam President. We currently have four speakers on this item. And Our first speaker, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I wanted to just let Alana know that since she spoke on this item already, even though she spoke to it earlier, I'm gonna ask uh, that we not have her re-speak, but the other people who haven't spoken on this item may speak now. Understood, so we have three speakers on this item. Our first speaker is Robert Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. <coughs> Robert. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Almaz Nagash. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Almaz Nagash. I am the executive director of the African Diaspora Network. I just want to thank the Board of Supervisors for your leadership in this very difficult and challenging time for our community. And my heart goes out for those who have lost their lives. Uh, the African Diaspora Network is an organization that supports African immigrants in Silicon Valley and throughout the Bay Area. We have received a wonderful funding support from uh, the Board of Supervisors last year that is propelling us to do more uh, support and mentoring to the Africans from the diaspora in Silicon Valley. I want to give a special thanks to Supervisor Cortese for his leadership and support. I do hope you support us as well because I think this is a very difficult time and I'm glad to hear that uh, uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg, you mentioned about Africans uh, and people of color being impacted uh, disproportionately this time. We feel the same way and I, I look forward to working with all of you to make this possible. We'll go back to Mr. Aguirre. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Robert Aguirre, thank you for uh, letting me speak again. Um, so I, I know that uh, Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Cortese have talked about using their funds to fund things in other districts besides their own. I don't know if that is a general practice, but I, I think by limiting each district to a certain amount of money uh, then relies on other supervisors to fund in things that they may want to fund at a later date and they may have run out of their money. So I, I don't know, maybe you might think about pooling the money and then just having all the supervisors decide how the money's being spent so that if there's something that's much more worthy of funding, uh, you don't have to go to each individual um, uh, supervisor to try to get them to donate their portion of the money to fund something. I think it would be better, again, to have all the supervisors agree on how the money is being spent and, and then be done that way rather than put a cap on each individual one. It's just my idea. I don't know if you're going to consider that, but please do. Thank you. Our next speaker is James McCaskill. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, James McCaskill, Executive Director of Sunday Threads. Uh, Madam President, Board of Supervisors, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for your leadership during this very challenging time. I would ask that you not pass this resolution during such an anxious time for organizations. Uh, Sunday Friends has been supportive with uh, inventory item in the past, and we were looking forward to the opportunity this year. Our costs have gone up as we serve over 230 families right now with distribution of basic necessities and food donations. And not getting an inventory item this year would be a great detriment on our revenue and our ability to function, given that a number of granting bodies are pausing their grants until life returns to normal. 
I would ask that you would uh, revisit this uh, when society stabilizes a bit more. Thank you. Our last speaker on this item is Walter Wilson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. Um, I tried to speak with you earlier today um, about the COVID um, situation, but this is very important. Right now, with what's happening with community of color, particularly the black community, and that we have, have the largest disparity of all groups here, particularly among deaths, I don't understand the motivation behind this whatsoever, particularly right now, when this is the one of the most difficult times in the history of the county and certainly in this country. So I don't understand the motivation behind it. I'd like for someone to please explain to me right here, right now, why during the COVID will we try to limit any type of resources that can go out to people in this community? Because as I said in my letter, even if you took all these districts and put them together, they could, and with the 500,000 each, it wouldn't even touch those five uh, zip codes in, in East San Jose where most of those deaths are located, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I would really, really uh, suggest that you guys really think about this before you pass something like this, because it doesn't make any sense. Thank you. That, that um, ends our public speakers. I'll go back uh, to the board. And um, I will start at the end. I, I know that um, Supervisor Cortezzi, I don't know if you wanted to make any more comments. I know Susan did, but I, I couldn't remember. Did I call on you already? I'm so sorry. Did I call on you, Dave? I did call on you already. Uh, you called at the outset. You asked me if I want to make okay. some I just want to speak on the motion to explain my no vote okay. very quickly or briefly. And that is, um, I'm certainly, um, uh, I certainly have expressed in the past that I was willing to um, entertain some kind of changes on this, um, pro, you know, the program of inventory items at some point. It never occurred to me that, that ultimately a majority of the board would propose what is in effect a 70% cut. There was $8.4 million distributed by the Board of Supervisors last year. Um, you know, to organizations throughout the county that weren't picked up um, by the county executive's base budget as uh, in need of, of support for one reason or another. Um, now that's that would be as a result of, uh, of this item, two and a half million dollars. So it's about a 70% cut. Um, we're gonna have to cut this budget this year um, and we're gonna have very difficult times but we're not gonna cut the county budget 70%. So to say that this is somehow a corollary to the cuts that are gonna to have to be made in the county budget or other sacrifices that have to be made, I think is uh, an illusion. Um, secondly, I think it would have made a lot more sense in this particular environment where county supervisors have their ears to the ground, we're in touch with our constituencies, we know which agencies are struggling most, uh, which constituencies are struggling most in our districts, um, as we usually do, but we're um, extraordinarily responsible for that um, in this health crisis. Um, I would have thought it would have made more sense to um, increase um, the, the average appropriation per, per district or as, as, as a whole, as a bucket of money, um, and then cap it if you're gonna cap it. But to reduce it 70% and cap it, um, I, I, there's just no way I could even conceive of supporting that. And I think when we submit um, proposals at a 70% cutback this year, I think um, I think people are going to be very hurt, like some of the speakers said to me. Thank you. That, that's just to explain my no vote. Thank you. Um, Susan, since you spoke already, may I go to the next person, or did you want to add another comment? I just want to add a, a, a brief comment about context. Um, the, 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 the mention of, you know, 70% and a corollary to, you know, to some extent, um, this was a number that, that could be agreed on. And just for some context, uh, this two and a half million dollars that we're talking about today is four times the money we were just presented today that was spent on overtime for the EOC uh, the COVID response and about 16 times the amount that we spent on, on extra help. So I, I just want to emphasize again that I know this is hard. Um, 
and and for sure organizations will be hurting and I believe that we should be helping them at a county level and doing absolutely everything we can um, as far as our dollars will stretch. Okay, um, Joe, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe and then Mike. Um, I'll pass for the moment, but reserve the right to raise my hand in a moment or two if need be, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. It's a, a tough decision. It's the first of many tough decisions we have coming. We just heard from our budget director, Greg Ituria, and from Dr. Smith, we're looking at a $250 million shortfall. So I don't know what percentages are gonna come from what departments. Um, I know we've got public health and public safety and I don't know where the cuts are gonna come from, but I, I know that the county has certain core mission things to do. And as much as we all would like to help everybody we can, last nine years, 10 years, we've been able to do that because things have been so good, but they're not now. And this, this is where we are. So I also think as was explained in the, um, the item, there is still an opportunity for funding from other sources through the actual budget plan to take place as we get into budget season, we'll see that. But we need to come up with right now, $250 million from a whole variety of places. I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. So um, just took a few observations I wanna make. Um, one is that I don't know where we are in funding the, um, or doing the hiring for the GEAR program. But part of the reason I'm concerned about this, and I really have always been concerned about the, um, the way we divide up resources based on programming. Now, sometimes when we're doing something special and I, I'll use the, um, the Magical Bridge program that Supervisor Samidian brought to us, what was important about that program is it created opportunities across the county to invest in all-inclusive playgrounds. What is challenging is that um, some of the areas that we represent are, are more underserved than others, even with special um, investments like that, that make it, you know, that make it a, a tougher, um, a tougher challenge, both for, for opportunities to expend money, but even for the, the cities or communities that we're working with to try to contribute that, you know, matching money is just a, as an example similar when we did the historic resources and i will be just say thank you to my colleagues so many of you for investing in the area that i represent because there wasn't enough money um even to partially cover the the need and um and even now you know we we have some programs that may have to give money back because they can't find the matching resources so i i think what is inherently problematic about the approach is that it starts the approach out um, equally and not equitably. And as we look at our budget, we're gonna be challenged in a number of different ways. But one of the ways that I, that I hope we start to think about um, our investments, particularly when there are less of them, is how do we address equity? And that's why I can't support this. I, I think particularly as we go into such a hard time that starting with this approach um, is is troubling to me in terms of the message it sends. On the one hand, I appreciate um, Supervisor Ellenberg's point that you know that the process is not perfect, and it certainly isn't. But an, feeling an obligation to you know to to um, take a stand and then to create some more predictability with our colleagues. I mean, with the with the staff. And to be frank with you, the um, amount of resources is this is shouldn't cause even when we were spending more shouldn't cause consternation among our staff i think they're sharp enough to deal with what is essentially for them a, a relatively small amount of money given the overall amounts of money that we talk about for our budget um, budget wide and um in any case i i appreciate that everybody's trying to do what they think is right i want to make sure that we're starting as much as we can to use the GARE framework in more of a, 
a justice framework and less of a charity framework as it relates to how we approach the budget, which is why I won't be supporting it today. So with that, I'm gonna go ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Supervisor Cortez. No. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. President Chavez. No, thank you very much. And that passes on a three to two vote. Um, I'm now gonna go to item that were removed from the consent calendar. That's items, and I'm just, and actually, Mike, you always write these down. I have items 29, 35, 41, and 48. Does that sound right? Okay. So I'll begin with 29. This is the IHSS BHP um, issue. And I just wanted to ask staff, do we know the answer to the question as to whether or not, or how we're addressing um, our, our independent IHSS independent providers relative to Valley Health Plan? John uh, Mills is on the phone, I think, and will respond. Thank you. John? I hear a creaky door, but no John Mills. Do you want me to come back to this when John's available? We have a yeah, couple. Why don't you come back in a okay. minute? And you can text him. All right, thank you. I'm going to move um, to next item 35. Um, and this is a contract with Alibaba. Here he is, John's here. Okay, so I'll go back to 29. John? Yes, you... super. Oh, okay. yes, Supervisor Chavez, thank you and apologies. I was just connecting um, as you were asking the question. Um, but yes, relative to the um, benefits for IHSN independent providers, um, our intention all along during the shelter in place was that no providers would lose benefits as a result of lack of hours due to COVID. And so in the um, MOU with SEIU 2015 for our independent providers, it provides that um, benefits are not terminated until there have been three consecutive months um, where the provider does not have sufficient hours um, which is 35 hours a month to qualify for benefits. And so what we're looking at right now, given that the shelter in place was instituted um, March 16th, is that anyone um, who may have a lack of hours due to COVID would show up um, at the end of this month, this month of May. And so what, what we're um, discussing right now with the public authority is to the extent that individuals show up um, in the round of termination notices that are supposed to go out at the end of the month, we want to be able to offer them um, essentially an exception process to that termination so that they can um, basically self-certify that their lack of hours is um, related to the COVID shelter in place. And then we would not terminate benefits for those individuals. So um, we have. So we do. We have a. We, we don't have a process right now. We're going to create a process before the end of the month. Yes, we're creating it right now. Um, my understanding. Oh, go ahead, but John. When would the first group of people be cut off potentially? So my understanding is that the first group of people would potentially be cut off by the end of May if we didn't do anything because that would be the third month um, for, in terms of March, April, and May. So I'm gonna um, request two things. Um, one is, since it's May 12th, and I just wanna make an observation about March 16th. March 16th is when we began the shelter in place, but about, I, I think that um, maybe as early as a week earlier to two weeks earlier, we already had people that were starting to take actions of sheltering in place, actually even before that, toward the end of February. I wanna make sure that we don't have anybody that's gonna be kicked off um, even sooner that may actually have been impacted by COVID also. So how can you address that? Because, because frankly, people, some people started to shelter in place at the end of February. 
Um, my understanding is that we can look back at the terminations that would have gone out at the very end of April um, and offer those individuals the same exception process where they would be able to um, self-certify that their lack of hours were due to COVID and then their benefits would be restored for this month. So, so I guess what I would say is I, I want to, I want to say, um, I want to make sure that we know that the, um, that the process actually occurs. And, and I understand your point about self-certification means that you're, you're creating a bar that is easy but not low meaning that it will be easy for people to respond but we want people to be honest about the impacts absolutely okay and when will that start to go out and and the information to those workers be available to them um well we can look at the the prior month um and that and that um notification can start to go out imminently um, the end of May cycle will show up at the end of May, so we can look at those then. Well, I guess what, I, what I'm asking is, is it possible, I imagine we have contact information for all of our workers, is it possible for us to proactively just send out the, the self-certification so that you are getting results before we're at risk of someone losing their health insurance and then having to get back on it? Because that's I, a possible. Yeah, yes. No, I don't I don't see why not, um, but I would have to confirm that with um SourceWise with the public authority. Okay. And um and will it be possible for you to just keep the board up to date so we know how that process is going so that we don't have a flood of people telling us they got kicked off their insurance? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'd be happy to provide um, you know, an off agenda report just to let you know the status. If we're going to scoop people up from um, April, starting with the April time frame, because it's possible that people started to get less hours end of February, beginning of March. Correct. Okay, great. I really appreciate that. Those are all my questions. Do any of my colleagues have questions? I have no speakers on this item. So I'm going to move up, um, the agreement with um, the between Santa Clara County Valley Health Plan related to providing medical insurance benefits that would include us going back to the end of March to make sure that we are not, um, it, that no one will lose their benefits because of lack of hours due to COVID-19 in addition to the recommended action that's in our packet. And that would be my motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may I ask for a roll call vote? Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Supervisor Simidian? Supervisor Cortez? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Aye. President Chavez? Yes. And one more time for Supervisor Simidian. Um, he's having a technical problem, and um, and I don't know, I, I don't know if we let uh, if someone could could help him and reach out to him on his cell phone would be great because I am the least technically competent person on this call for sure. So I don't want to leave him out. But if we could say four with one away and then come back when he's um, available. But I would ask if um, if if our staff could reach out to him somebody who's technologically savvy. A virtualized from here. So I'm, I'm assuming this is someone from the clerk's office is reaching out to him. And my staff is gonna talk to his staff as well. Item 35, this is Alibaba. If we can move to this item. Um, this is a, uh, um, a couple just questions I wanted to ask staff on this item. So no presentation is necessary. And I asked this item to be held um, to two questions. Um, one is I'm interested in understanding whether or not we can make this um, a six month contract with a, a, another six month extension. And I'm not sure who Dr. Smith is best to answer that. Sherry's on the phone. Oh, great. Sherry. Yes, 
Um, hi, uh, Supervisor President Chavez and members of the board. Um, Sherry Terrell, Acting Director with Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, so in response to your question, um, uh, yes, I believe we could do a six month contract with a six month extension. That would be preferable. And then my second question is, um, could we get in the first quarter an update on the, um, the current uh, patients that are there and, and if they are still there and if they're not, where are they now? Where are they, have they been placed? Uh, yes, we can provide that report. That would be great. Um, with that, are there any other questions from my colleagues? If those two things could be included in the motion, I am happy to make it. May I get a second? Oh, Joe, um, good, you're back. Good. I'm, I'm happy to second, and, and I appreciate that. I think that a shorter term uh, is well advised, as well as um, moving people as, as speedily as possible. I'd also like the report, if you're amenable, Supervisor Chavez, uh, to include um, updates on the payments uh, that are being made. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. I really I appreciate that. I missed that. Thank you. Thank you. And that that would be. I'll make that as part of the motion. And the seconder is amenable to that. And if there are no other questions from my colleagues, may I get a roll call vote? Supervisor Allenberg. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. He's he's still. I he, Wait, he's on mute. Just hold on one sec. Let's see if we can. Joe, go ahead. You're unmuted now. Your vote. Thank you. I'm going to pass for the moment. Uh, apologies okay. for the tech problem. If you could come back to me at the end of the roll call vote, please. Great. Supervisor Cortese. Aye. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. President Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. One moment, please. Samidian, I. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. Supervisor Samidian, would you like us to go back to 29? That was the IHS S VHP um, and the significant change to that was we were looking at protecting health insurance for the IHSS workers. Yes, and I, uh, if there's no objection, Madam Chair, I'd like to be recorded as an I vote on that item. Thank you. No objection. Any concerns from my colleagues? Seeing none, that will be uh, so ordered to quote Joe. So ordered. Um, item 41 is Anderson Dam. And Supervisor uh, Samidian, I believe this is an item you pulled from consent. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, I know we had asked uh, staff to have someone from Valley Water available to answer questions. I'm not sure if uh, that individual is present or, or not. Let's take a moment to find out. I think there. Oh, yes. There's Rachel. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. Um, colleagues, I have a couple of concerns about this, acknowledging the importance of addressing the uh, seismic issues that are clearly significant. Um, the first is that here we are again with an issue that has been um, publicly noted of which the water district has been aware, not just for years, but literally for decades, going back to um, you know post-1989 uh, earthquake and uh, following the Loma Prieta quake in 89, uh, I know that there was a, uh, a study that was done uh, in 91. Uh, there were subsequent studies in 92. Uh, the, um, Valley Water did their own study maybe a decade ago, I want to say 2011. And yet here we are being asked to hurry up and provide shortcuts for a matter that is literally 30 years pending because apparently it wasn't addressed by the district over the last 30 years. So before I get to the subject of the legislation, I just like to understand how did we find ourselves in this position uh, because it's disconcerting to say the least. Through the chair, Supervisor Smitty, and that is one of the most commonly asked questions I would say that we get on this project, especially now that we're you know attempting this bill. Um, you're right. We actually found that Anderson had some seismic issues in, back in 2008. We have a pretty robust 
seismic uh, program that we undertake at all of our dams. We own and operate 10 different dams and reservoirs. Anderson, of course, is the largest. You can fit the other nine into Anderson with room to spare. So we take, our, we take those, those standards very seriously and we actually are required under the Division of Safety of Dams at the state level to conduct periodic inspections on all of our dams. 2008 is really, that was really the big red flag that where we discovered that we had some serious seismic issues in inside uh, what we thought was just one wall of Anderson. Anderson, like any other dam, is, is you know, an inverted V shape, basically, uh, with a clay core down, down at the very bottom. And initially, after those, after that first round of studies was done, we thought that we would be able to remedy the seismic issues that we discovered in 2008 and that we discovered more of in 2011 by just buttressing the outside of one of the sides. So we were going to be buttressing the outboard side, basically the one that doesn't have water resting against it. So in the, in the midst of developing the plans and specs and everything else that goes along with a, a pretty monumental infrastructure uh, project, we discovered even more problems with Anderson. Anderson can be likened somewhat to like an onion. I, it seems like whenever we did another study, we'd peel back another layer and find something else that needed to be fixed. In fact, uh, gosh, in we had just four, we, it was triggered redesigns on four different separate occasions and ultimately what the sum of that was, was that we, instead of just doing a buttress, we had to take the entire dam down. And that was, and looking to my colleague, Bart Broom, who's uh, joining me out of my Sacramento office too, that occurred just a, just a few years ago when we realized that we were gonna have to completely redesign the dam. And as I, I think you can, you know, being the county, you guys have to take some pretty significant infrastructure projects as well. Taking an entire, taking a 220 foot tall dam down, stone by stone, and then having to rebuild it is a pretty substantial endeavor. Um, so really the, the course the uh, source, I should say, of all the delays, I think was just that we didn't fully understand the magnitude of the problem. And, you know, Anderson was built back in 1950, um, in a relatively short period of time to the standards of the day back then. And those standards are definitely not the same today, obviously much more stringent, justifiably so. And now here, that brings us to today when we realize, okay, we've got to take the entire thing down. And of course we need to rebuild it in a, an expeditious yet safe fashion so that we have a way to keep back the rains that do stack up in that watershed is what's evidence back in 2017. So I hope that I hope that answers at least part of your question, Supervisor. I'll just say again for the record, uh, Madam Chair, uh, the the seismic issues with this particular facility, and I'm familiar with it because of my work in the legislature in 2009 on the state water package. I see Ms. Gibson remembers that well. Um, the, the seismic concerns uh, go back not just a decade, but three decades. And my frustration today, uh, and it's the reason I cannot be an I vote on the measure, is because um, what I see is, um, a very unfortunate uh, behavior, which is uh, put it off until absolutely uh, uh, called upon to do the work and then say, now we want to hurry up uh, legislation that uh, means the regular rules don't apply to us. And I, I just think that's not uh, the kind of um, behavior we would like to see from a public agency, uh, nor should we uh, countenance it. Uh, this is one of those times when I just think uh, applause only makes a bad actor worse, and I, I just I can't can't provide reinforcement for it. The second issue, uh, Madam Chair, uh, if I may, is that we have a staff report, um, and the staff report, as I understand it, was based on uh, the original version of the bill. That version of the bill, which was the basis for the staff report was then amended on May the 4th. So we got a staff report for a bill that is no longer the, uh, the actual language. Then my understanding is in response to questions that my office and I raised, we have a, uh, a revised staff report, if you will, from last night. Um, and there appears to be a, uh, some significant change in the direction of the legislation but my real, my real concern is it's rather clear from the amendments that have just been made and uh, the conversations uh, that we've had with the folks at the state uh, level that additional amendments are forthcoming and that if our board goes on record 
for a bill that is represented to us as not shortcutting environmental protections, then we have no guarantee that our support position won't be used for a bill that is subsequently amended. So maybe either Ms. Gibson or Mr. Broom can tell us through the chair whether or not additional amendments are expected and how we can know that those amendments won't shortcut uh, the environmental protections that uh, we look to the process to provide. Through the chair, supervisor, somebody, I'll start, and then I'll ask Bart to to um, pick up anything I might have missed. Um, first and foremost, yes, th there was just one piece actually of the bill that was amended out, and it was amended out at the request of the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. So the bill, in a nutshell, does three things. It would authorize us to use best value, the best value uh, method of uh, project delivery, rather than lowest bid, and that was basically, you know, off, that was recommended by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's. Um, independent board of consultants. See, they took a look at the scale, uh, scale and magnitude of this project, realized how complex it was, and said you don't want to go low bid on a project of this nature. You definitely want to go best value so that you're getting the best contractors on the job and they're doing the best work that they can and you don't have potentially you know, change order after change order and then additional delays if you don't have somebody who's not as qualified. So that's that's the one piece. And, and you know, our authorization in our district act requires us to go low bid, so that's just the first piece. And it would only be for this project. It wouldn't be for the agency as a whole. The second piece, of course, is uh, what you uh, talked about, Supervisor Smitty, and in terms of expediting a couple of different state permits that we need to get. We need to get a lake and stream bed alteration agreement from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as a result of this project. And then another uh, section, it's called a Section 401 certification through the State Water Resources Control Board. We've been, and we've been, an important point about this is we're not looking to shortcut those permits. We're just looking to establish some reasonable deadlines that, the, that actually the agencies requested that we put in. We, we came out and we were negotiating with them over a year ago, actually talking to them about, hey, what can we do to help speed this project along? It's our board's highest priority. It's our agency's highest priority. And they said, well, yeah, we, we think we can get you, get you guys your permits in about 105 days. Well, not unlike many other infrastructure agencies, uh, our experience was that they would take 12 months, sometimes up to, as long as three years to issue those types of permits and you know deadlines exist for a reason it helps to really set staff's focus on things and we said we'll, we'll even you know pay to help you guys hire extra staff if that's what you need so that we don't take you know away from the other important projects around the state of California so really and for those permits you know we're just looking to set now 180 day uh, time frame for the two permits which both which and we got that time frame from both regulatory agencies so we've been in constant communication with them about this we're definitely not trying to do any end run of any kind around anything. Uh, the third, the third piece, of course, is what you were talking about, Supervisor, which is the exped, it's called expedited judicial review. In the event that we were to get a CEQA challenge, and you know, of course, we hope that we don't, but in the event that we do, we want to take advantage of existing statutes that already apply to the state legislative office building in Sacramento, for example. That if you get a CEQA challenge, the courts have 270 days, about nine months, to adjudicate the matter, and that that is basically intended to, you know. Keep, again, keep things moving forward expeditiously. CEQA challenges, as I, I'm sure the board is well aware, can take at least a year, if not a couple of years sometimes, to adjudicate. Meanwhile, the, the risk to public health and safety, in addition to environmental resources, while we're delayed doing that, it remain. So that was that was why we were trying to do that. However, um, the assembly, as I mentioned, Assembly Parks and Water Parks and Wildlife Committee did say, look, you know, we want you to take that piece out for now, continue talking about your concerns that would have been addressed by that as you move forward, because they understood the, the need to try to expedite things and reduce delays, essentially. But for now, we want you to take it out. So we did. And that's, that was a very late breaking amendment. And that's why it came in kind of at the last minute uh, last week. And that's why uh, staff put together the yellow tag that they did. If I might, I would just. I'm not hold. sure why that's happening. Bart, now we can't hear you. Yeah, you're on mute, Bart. Let me unmute you. Go ahead. How about now? You're a little echoey, but we can hear you. Bart, if you're on your phone and your computer, that's you're going to get that echo. You need to mute one of the devices. How about now? A little bit. Okay, better. I'm just going to say it very quickly. The amendments, uh, you know, as you go through the legislative process, bills do get amended. Um, most of the time, those amendments are to address the issues of stakeholders. Um, so, you know, I can't tell you that the bill will not be amended as it moves through the process. But what I can tell you is that, you know, the intent behind the bill is not to circumvent any 
environmental requirements. In fact, the, the dam project itself is in fact an environmental project um, and includes not just the fact that without the dam on the creek, um, threatened steelhead salmon wouldn't have cold water pool, the temperatures in the creek wouldn't really support them that well. And so there are benefits. Excuse me, Mr. Having, Broom, I apologize uh, for the interruption, but do you really want to make the case that your practices over the last decade have helped the trout population? Because that is really a bridge too far. No, 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 no. But the point is that without the dam, the Coyote Creek would be a seasonal creek and wouldn't provide the, the quality of, of habitat that would be there with the dam in place. And so what the project includes is environmental enhancements downstream, as well as a cold water zone that actually fosters uh, the uh, enhancement of the habitat for the fishery. Well, Madam Chair, if I may respond uh, to both uh, Ms. Gibson's comments and Mr. Broom's comments, please. Um, we'll only know whether or not those are enhancements uh, if and when there is rigorous review, uh, which is uh, likely to be short-circuited by what has been described as uh, expedited review or expedited agreement. Um, I, you know, I'll just point out that uh, a moment ago, the representative of the Water District was talking about what a vast project this was and why it took so long. And I'll just say that the project that has been, by my count, 30 years in the making, by the water district's count, apparently 10 years in the making, is now supposed to be reviewed within 180 days and good luck uh, and God help you if you can't get a project of this size reviewed in 180 days, time is up, time to move along. Uh, I, I just, I, I think that uh, suggesting that amendments that are forthcoming will be designed to address the needs of stakeholders is the kindest word I can put it, is optimistic, Mr. Broom. You know that I spent 12 years in Sacramento. You know that I spent seven years as the chair of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee with responsibility for CEQA. I saw these bills then, I didn't like them then, and I don't like them now, because they are what they are, which is an end around the process. If we don't like the process, we ought to fix the process, but saying the rules don't apply to us, and by the way, we've We've put ourselves in a position where we can make the case that the rules shouldn't apply to us by virtue of dragging our heels. I, I don't find that acceptable. I think there's every possibility that amendments will be forthcoming that undercut the environmental integrity of the process. So my question to Ms. Gibson and Mr. Broom, if I may through the chair is, how can you assure this board and the public that there won't be a 12th hour gotten amend, Mr. Broom, and you know what that process is, and I think you do too, Ms. Gibson, that, um, that we will be aware as a county and as a board if there are meaningful amendments, and that we'll be aware more than a, a day before a board meeting uh, on a timely basis when our board might weigh in. Being asked to, to support the bill that's before us today when we know full well that it's gonna be a very different bill by the time it gets done, I, I think that's a hard case to make. I can't support it, as I said. But I, I do think that at a minimum, Mr. Broom and Ms. Gibson ought to be able to provide some assurances to the board and the public that we're not gonna see any fancy footwork, any end around uh, in terms of the amendments on the bill. Do you want them to respond to the fancy footwork get around? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna let Rachel and um, Bart uh, respond to that. And then thank you, um, Supervisor Samedi, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. I didn't know if that was a rhetorical question. All right. No, no. This, uh, through the chair, Supervisor Samedi, and absolutely, I can assure you that, again, this is our board's highest priority and they prioritize environmental stewardship very highly too. The, in fact, part of the reason the Anderson project is as complex as it is now is because of the environmental enhancements that we have incorporated into the project. Uh, we are participants in something called the FACE uh, Collaborative Effort. It's a Fisheries and Aquatic Habitat Collaborative Effort. Um, I understand you, the Supervisor, are also quite familiar with it as well. Um, it's something that's been going on, again, you know, unfortunately, for quite some time. However, we chose to incorporate the measures that were going on a parallel track, basically, along with that FACE effort into the Anderson Dam project because it made sense to do it. There were measures that were already we, we have already been working on with the stakeholders and with regulators to protect and to enhance and, and hopefully restore fish species along the several reaches of Coyote Creek that made good sense to do them at the same time that we were gonna be taking the dam down because it's you know, kind of like if you're gonna rip up a stream, 
you know, to put in a sewer pipe, you may as well put in, you know, a cable and everything else that goes underneath the street so that you can fold it back up and have done with it, three projects in one. Um, also, uh, you should know that we have been working very diligently with a number of different regulatory agencies and fisheries agencies, wildlife agencies, all the different um, environmental regulators. Since 2013, actually, we've been in a state of consultation with them for a number of years. Um, I know I, I am very sympathetic to the fights that you saw when you were in the state legislature, particularly those that wanted to try to do an end run around CEQA. And I can assure you that we have no intention of doing anything of the sort. We, we do not intend to even, even attempt an end run around CEQA. That, that our board, I think, would stand behind me every single, every one of the seven of them and say, absolutely not. We hold sequin high regard. We would never do anything to try to get around it. And Bart, I think you can back me up on the, on the any amendments that we take going forward. Of course, the legislative process being what it is, sometimes you do have to tweak things, especially when you're, as we are doing, talking openly with the regulatory agencies about, you know, does this work for you? If, if not, how can we make it better? Um, you know, does it, things like word determination versus certification, you know, which one would you prefer to have in there? They tell us determination. So we take out certification and put in determination. We're definitely having that, I would say an open and collaborative dialogue with those folks. If I might just add uh, a couple of things, um, you know, the 180 day process is really just uh, a deadline to get folks to make sure both Valley Water and the regulators to um, basically move forward expeditiously. The, the pre-consultation process that Rachel had mentioned started in 2013. It has been intensified since 2018. And you know, over the past year, we've been meeting with our state regulators and federal regulators several times a month. So by the time that a project application is submitted and the 180 day time clock begins to tick, by that time, there will have been years of review, evaluation, discussion of the impacts of the project and the, the possible avoidance measures, minimization, mitigation that would be required in order to ensure that uh, habitat and species are protected. I'm just going to close with this observation, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I did want to mention that I was put off, frankly, by the reference to the risk to public safety invoking the risk to public safety when someone has been failing to address the issue for 30 years um, is, in my view, not a particularly compelling argument. I'll just, that's the kindest way I can put it. The other thing I'll, I'll do is I'm, I'm going to ask to see uh, nodding heads, thumbs up, that we've got a commitment from both of these representatives that any amendments that affect the environmental integrity of the process will be fully sunshine with our board if our board is going to take a vote on this. Um, before they advance in the state legislature, not after the fact. Is that possible, Rachel? I, I'm, I'm looking at Bart. Actually, I'm, uh, Supervisor, just so I'm clear on what you're asking. So before we would before we would accept or take or attempt any amendments, you would like those amendments to be first brought back to the County Board of Supervisors for a review? Well, I, I'm saying that at a minimum, they should be shared with all five members of the board, as well as with our government affairs people. If you want the Board of Supervisors to put its name on this piece of legislation and support it. And then you plan to move forward with what is essentially a different bill, then I think that is the minimum in the way of common courtesy that the district should accommodate to someone it's asking to support the bill. I, yeah, I understand what you're asking now. Yes, we would, yes, if, if, if we're anticipating amendments, we can absolutely share them with all five offices. Thank and you. Our, and our interview. legislative affairs yeah. person. Okay, thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thank you. And just since we're talking transparency, I'll just be transparent with both Mr. Broom and Ms. Gibson and uh, my colleagues. Um, I will be in touch with the relevant committees and staff and their members as an individual member of the board communicating on my individual office letterhead, making plain that my concerns are my own. Um, but I will try and make sure that these issues are highlighted so that um, they are mindful of them as well in Sacramento and don't simply think that no one in Santa Clara County has a concern about the issues. Great. Thank so, you. thank you. Um, do I have any other comments from my colleagues? I, I just want to make a, few, a couple and then I um, and then I would like to request a motion. Um, so, Anderson Dam is pretty critical to the folks that I represent. And I know Supervisor Wasserman um, has heard concerns or I'm assuming from 
his constituents because a failure of this uh, dam would essentially flood South County and there would be significant loss of life. I also just wanna say that with the 2017 Coyote Creek flood, um, I'm all too familiar with the real impacts of, of flooding and the damage to neighborhoods and really the fear that that can cause. I also just want to acknowledge for my colleagues that Congresswoman Lofgren has taken a real leadership role in trying to untangle the knot of federal regulators to get this project going. I think she has is expressed at least to me and I think to some on our board that um, she's very worried about the public health and safety for folks who live uh, near, on, or around the dam. I also think just as I think about climate change, our ability to um, capture, collect, uh, collect, collect safely um, uh, water and be able to share it throughout the valley is very important as well. I believe this bill is intended to get the projects through the state's role. And, and the state's role in this instance is actually relatively small compared to the federal role and other, other participants. Um, so I'm, I'm very supportive of this going forward. And I will just say to, um, to and I'm, I'm really very, I think one very important thing is the issue around best value is really critical to me so that we get something that's built, um, that's a quality, uh, quality build. That all being said, um, what I'd like to do is make a motion that includes Supervisor Simidian's exhortations around making sure that the board is fully informed, particularly as it relates to environmental issues. But I think that that's also going to be inclusive of anything that uh, any kind of issue that you deem may be something the board would want to understand relative to public safety in terms of even the process of the construction of the dam. Um, so with that, um, I will move approval with um, Supervisor Simidian's uh, comments and um, ask for my colleague's support. May I have a second to get to that I'll motion? Second, I'll second that. Um, a second from Supervisor Wasserman. And yep. are, are there any other comments on the motion? And I'll start from Dave on back. Supervisor Cortezzi? No, thank you. No. Supervisor Ellenberg? Supervisor Simidian, I, I think we, if there's anything else you wanna add? No, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And uh, Supervisor Wasserman? Nope. All right, so then I would like to, um, I have a motion and who does, who, did I have a second? Was that you, Mike? Okay, great. We have a motion and a second. I have no public speakers on the motion. I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Ellenberg. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Abstain. Supervisor Cortezzi. Aye. Vice President Wasserman. Aye. President Chavez. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Bart and Rachel for joining us. Yeah. We're gonna move on to item 48 and that is the NetSmart contract um, that Supervisor uh, Simidian pulled from consent. Joe, do you want a presentation or do you just wanna ask a question? Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, if I could blend the two, if that's possible, a brief presentation on this seems like a never ending saga and the increase is a dramatic one in terms of percentage. Um, and I just, I, I'd like someone to explain um, why we're going down this path. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. This is Miguel Marquez. I've been involved with this project for a little bit of time now. So maybe I'll um, kick it off, but also on the line, we have Todd Landrino from the Behavioral Health Services Department and Richard Ong from TSS, but in essence, uh, you know, the, the expense comes from uh, an initial effort to put the behavioral health services department, the mental health side on HealthLink, and then moving back to NetSmart. When we approach NetSmart because of the specialized short doyle Medi-Cal reimbursement uh, scheme that requires the specialized product that NetSmart provides, they initially um, gave us an estimate that included about $9 million of uh, consultant work to do the work that Todd will talk about that will ensure that we have a successful implementation of NetSmart. We thought that $9 million figure was too high and was uh, not specific enough in outcomes and had other problems. So we wrote that out of the contract. 
And then we worked uh, a collaborative process between patient billing services, PSS, behavioral health, um, compliance, and county council's office in really trying to sharpen our pencils, try to get to a scope of work that made a lot more sense um, and try to work with them to find the right people who could provide the services that we needed. In the end, uh, they came back with a, another proposal around $7 million and then we went into negotiations and uh, did our best to reduce the amount. And now it came out to, I think it's, I don't have it in front of me, but I remember it's about 5.6 million or so. But with that, if I could ask Todd Landrino or Richard Ong, if you could say exactly what those services are for, uh, I think that would be very helpful. And we're certainly here to answer any questions. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Supervisor Smidian, for your question. My name is Todd Landrino, and I'm the Deputy Director for Managed Care Services and Behavioral Health. So um, as Miguel outlined for you, uh, this project has uh, uh, been undergoing uh, quite a few changes, uh, particularly in the last couple of months. Uh, much of the project work has uh, originally started around some of the patient billing services and billing remediation. With billing remediation, we've been able to successfully make a lot of progress uh, in terms of some of the short doyle um, uh, challenges that we've had with uh, health link implementation. This particular uh, scope uh, that's uh, requesting and necessitating the increase in funding kind of hits on four uh, particular areas. Uh, those areas, um, uh, besides the billing remediation, uh, speak to clinical support services. And clinical support services, or as our department, we have roughly about 350 clinicians uh, that provide services to our clients. And for them to be able to successfully utilize the system to have the workflows that are customized uh, to their unique practices or areas of practice, the forms, the screening tools, et cetera, uh, is necessary. Also, um, the particular scope that we've asked for the increase in funding for will support process optimization. So many of the, um, since we originally signed the contract, many of the features for the software have changed and we're hoping to take advantage of some of those new features and functions and operationalize those. Excuse me, through the chair. Yes, Mike. Thank you. Our speaker, if you could move a little from the microphone. I'm getting, I don't know if anybody else is hearing it, Madam Chair, but I, a ton of feedback. Uh, it's not clear at all. Yeah, thank you. Um, Todd, yeah, I, I don't know what the best advice is, but maybe try what Mike just suggested. Yes, is this any better? Not really. I actually, it, whenever you speak, it just has a reverb that comes on. So yeah, I'll ask if everybody could go on mute. That might help Todd you and I'll go on mute also. Maybe you can try again. So I was uh, mentioning that there's uh, four uh, areas for scope that we So Todd, maybe I could ask you to hold on. And Richard, is it possible for you to respond to the question? I'd be happy to. Hopefully I'm coming through clear. Yeah, you are. Thank you. Sorry, Todd. Thank you. Thank you, President Chavez, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Simidian. Um, yes, um, my role is by introduction is I'm the Chief Healthcare IT Officer for the County of Santa Clara, uh, working through TSS and HHS. Um, and my role is to really help and partner and support our folks with the solutions that they need. Uh, beginning with the end uh, in mind, our overall goals are obviously to make sure that the product is successfully installed and adopted as best possible. Uh, with that type of implementation that will result in uh, a high degree of optimization uh, for increased clinical outcomes for the psychiatric patients that we serve, uh, certainly improving the operational efficiencies and throughput to see more patients, as well as to accelerate the revenue. Uh, one of the things that uh, Todd was touching upon was our ability recently to accelerate a lot of at-risk uh, revenue for the county. Um, and we've been very successful in um, being able to capture those uh, millions of dollars. Uh, a lot of the um, added uh, investment and expense that we're looking for will really give us access to the needed resources as well as to the support we need 
Um, we do have over 750 people that work in that department and it is comprised of about a $550 million operation. We also partner with 35 other providers within the county and those providers will be also going live and making use of our services. In many ways, these providers are really looking to the county for the advanced leadership that we need. And then those types of terms, uh, we will help them with um, more advanced abilities. In a very simplified kind of way, many of us can uh, maybe relate to the fact that we use Excel, but we might not be able to use all of the, the great tools that are available when it comes to the pivot tools, the, the added data analytics, the 300 different types of commands that you can actually use. And that's really what we're trying to do is to gain access and those resources to better do those things. We've also been able to um, hopefully propose that we can get uh, additional trainers and source them uh, through this proposal. And uh, me, what had happened uh, originally has been a very direct result of COVID is that while we would hope to get train the trainer models where we're using internal people, uh, we'll be, uh, those people have been frontline people helping to uh, address COVID requirements uh, of recent. Some of those other advanced kinds of things when it comes to revenue cycle will include uh, better adjudication. So uh, when it comes to the patient's uh, payments, as well as whatever the other financial responsibilities are, those things will be uh, much cleaner. Uh, this is, does represent a greater than 12 month type of engagement um, where we'll be able to openly engage with those uh, folks and our partners with whom we propose. Um, I'll go ahead and pause at that point to see if there's any questions. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Uh, Supervisor, through the chair. Supervisor Chavez, uh, through the chair, if I may. You're muted, I'm sorry, Madam yes, President. Yes, please, thank you. Um, well, first I, I heard uh, Mr. Marquez indicate he'd been working on this for a while. So let me pass not just thanks, but condolences along to him because uh, this it seems to me to be a, a, a challenging project. Um, we, we have already, as I recall, Mr. Uh, Marquez sort of sw switched uh, midstream on this one, yes? That's correct. Well, I don't and, know about midstream, but we implemented HealthLink from, for uh, mental health and we're unable to ever bill with it. So if, you, if that, yeah, midstream, we said we got to fix that. And part of the cost was um, taking, you know, what was generated by HealthLink, then put through NetSmart and then trying to massage it so that, that it could be sent to the state. And we've actually done about, I don't remember the exact number, but it's about 25 million uh, that we've successfully billed now. So there's a, a $5.6 million add-on to a contract of $13,893,000 and change. That's a 40% increase. Is that 40% increase just so we can use it for this billing purpose or are all these other uh, bells and whistles uh, the basis for that cost? I should let someone who's more familiar with the contract answer that. And, and I don't know if it's Todd or Rich, but uh, Rich, you come through yeah, more let me, clearly. Let me, let me be even a little more direct about my concern, Madam Chair, and that is, so we agreed to spend 13.9 on a, a, on a project, then it wouldn't allow us to bill. Then we said, gee, we need to be able to bill. And now we're looking at a 40% increase. None of that sounds like it's good news. What's, what's it all sounds like something we should pause and say, how do we, at a minimum, how do we make sure that doesn't ever happen again? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Miguel, and uh, thank you, Supervisor Submitian. Um, Richard, you're very gracious to say thanks to Miguel for tossing that set of questions. <laughs> so, good for you. I try to be courteous. Thank you, Supervisor, for the uh, comic relief. Um, yeah, the um, obviously, whenever we're working with any types of billing and uh, mediation types of work that way, there's always prone to be errors, um, you know, even much related to kind of collection agencies whenever they're trying to work with different folks. You know, we're obviously in, in a very good place and doing a lot of wonderful work uh, for our community in the psychiatric world, uh, behavioral health space, uh, but it also is a business. Uh, many times that type of activity um, includes uh, possibilities where people get medical record numbers, and that was possible. One of the re reasons that we were getting out of it and really needed to switch to the, to the new system that's more consolidated with smart platform. Um, in addition to that, there was uh, possibilities of ineligibility of different types of services. And then for, the, for that reason, we're really trying to strengthen the system with better design. Uh, and again, this proposal is helping us to do that on a more accelerated basis so that we don't fall into this trap again. I'll never be able to promise that there's going to be 100% collection on anything because things do change and 
sometimes we don't get the most accurate types of information, uh, but we're going to always do our best. Um, there are definitely also some uh, performance measures within the actual contract to help us make sure that we're trying to get as clean a claim as possible. Uh, again, trying to accelerate those payments as clean and as fast as possible for so the account. Richard, can I just stop you for a minute? We're having such a difficult time hearing you. Okay. Um, oh, now I can hear you. Okay. okay. Just the last couple sentences again. Uh, yes, so obviously um, I was just mentioning that, um, and hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. Um, I think uh, the long day has made my voice a little weaker. <laughs> so um, yes, obviously our goal is to make sure that the performance measures within the contract will allow us to do cleaner claim billing. And uh, that type of reinforcement over the next 12 plus months will help us to achieve that. Um, I was just mentioning that we can never really promise that anything will be 100% because we have imperfect information sometimes dealing with these people, but we are trying to do our best. Um, part of the um, implementation of the next several months will also include a telehealth component. Uh, we're already doing a lot of things and helping to serve that uh, and getting more access to people that way. And if I, Supervisor Sumidian and Miguel, I want to ask this of you too. I mean, I do think, I, I think the point that you're raising, Supervisor Sumidian, is just right. Like, we, how do we learn from these? these kinds of purchases. I think particularly when it comes to software, I always feel like we're at a, such a disadvantage when we negotiate price and services from software that we then become super reliant on. And I think um, with HealthLink, I believe that there was a belief that working with HealthLink, we'd be able to work out the billing problem that we had because billing for behavioral health is so, um, it's so frustrating and so impossible. And frankly, as we go to whole person care, the, the billing is oddly enough that the thing that won't be whole ever is what it feels like as it relates to behavioral health. Um, but I think the, the point you raise is a really good one, which is once we realized that we had that challenge, how quickly were we able to change? And once we changed, how much on the hook were we with the company that had kind of the golden key? And, and um, I do think, that it would be helpful at some point when TSS has a little more of an opportunity to get um, an evaluation so that we can better understand how, how to pivot in the future on issues like that. Because I think I think you raise a lot of really good points. It, um, I, Joe, does that make sense in terms of a, is that what you were asking for? It, it does, it, it obviously, um, doesn't undo the 40% increase, doesn't undo the 5.6 million, uh, doesn't undo the realization in the, middle, in the middle of the exercise that, that the product wasn't going to provide what we had anticipated it would provide. But I, I couldn't just let this one go by without taking some time to highlight it, uh, which is why I pulled it off uh, consent as painful as it is at the end of the day, Madam Chair. And one thing I, I could offer, and you, I mean, I'm going to offer this on Dave's behalf because I can't see him. He's not looking at me, so I guess I can do this, which is this might be a value to have um, a review of in FGOC or in health and hospital, because I do think this bigger learning around um, the purchase and negotiation around software is really pretty critical. Um, but I'll leave that to you and to Supervisor Cortez to determine who wins Rochambeau on that one. And Supervisor Chavez, if I could just, um, uh, you know, say that one, I agree with your comments, you know, state medical short oil billing for mental health services is complicated. It's the kind of thing we do it only in California. So there's not a whole lot of vendors uh. out there. And when we switched over to NetSmart, um, you know, they did propose, again, a, a cost to do this work that was $9 million higher. Uh, and we took that out. So that's what then required us to find an alternative and a better way to do that $9 million worth, which has turned out now to be 5.661 million. So, you know, there's always going to be lessons to be learned for sure. And, you know, we'll take a close look at that. But I wanted to give that context of why now we're adding 5.6 million, but we did previously reduce 9 million from their proposal. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I want to just say how much I appreciate the work of everybody on this. It's so complicated and so painful. Supervisor Smidian, did you have any other comments? No, I, well, I just, uh, I'm not quite sure I can be persuaded to feel like I saved $3 million as opposed to spent $6 million, but I understand the argument. Um, I will vote for the item, assuming there's a motion in a moment. I will not be making that motion, however, and I would ask the 
uh, maker of the motion, whoever she or he may be, uh, to refer the larger issue of software contracts uh, to FGOC if the chair is willing to take it, uh, because I, I think this goes beyond um, uh, any individual uh, department or agency in our organization. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I will make that motion. Can I get a second? Awesome. We have a motion and a second. We have no public speakers. Um, if there's any other public comment, I mean, any comment from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Ellenberg? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Samidian and I. Supervisor Cortezi? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? Aye. President Chavez? Yes, thank you very much. That was the last item on our agenda. I, I'm impressed that we, I was trying to get it under five o'clock, but we're at 5.04. I do wanna thank all the staff who worked with us today on such a, a thoughtful, comprehensive um, body of work. And just to share my appreciation, I'm gonna remind my colleagues that we are going to close session. You have um, a contact information to get into that closed session. We are going to uh, put this meeting on pause. I, I, James, we have to come back to this meeting after closed session. We do, and uh, I do have an announcement before we. Okay, discuss. why don't you make the announcement and no one run away because we have to come back after closed session. The board will meet in closed session to discuss items one through three as listed on the agenda for the May 12, 2020 closed session meeting. Item two is a discussion with the county's real property negotiator, Don Rocha, director of the Parks and Recreation Department, to discuss the price in terms of payment for the lease of real property known as Spring Valley Golf Course at Ed Levin County Park, located at 3441 Calaveras Road, Lapidus, California, 95035, APNs 029-37-001 and 029-37-002. The other negotiating party is Silicon Valley Golf Course Incorporated. Does any board member of the county executive have a conflict of interest with any item listed on today's closed session agenda before, for which you need to recuse yourself? Please, if so, please indicate at this time before we move into closed session. Any recusals? Saying none, we're gonna to go to closed session. I'm gonna ask my colleagues, I'm just gonna put myself and turn off my phone. I mean, my audio, if you wanna sign back in, you're, you're willing, able to do that. Thank you. Madam Chair? Sir. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. We're going to, we're going to phone now. Correct. And then back to Zoom to adjourn. Correct. Got it, thank you.
right, everyone. So we are going to, uh, before we adjourn, James, do you have an announcement to make? Yeah, I just want to make sure the clerk of the board staff is back. They look uh, good. David? Yes, we're here. Okay, yeah, great. At the May 12, 2020 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to join or file amicus briefs in federal lawsuits to challenge the presidential executive order enhancing state and local involvement in refugee resettlement or the federal government's implementation of that order. The order prohibits resettlement of refugees in any location unless the state and local government have consented to the resettlement. And that concludes my report. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Bye bye, you too. This is the ordinance list, re list report for the Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, May 12, 2020. Item number 42, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.118, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20 relating to compensation of employees adding one program manager, one position, and two program manager, two positions in the office of the county executive. This concludes the ordinance record list report for the Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, May 12, 2020.